Chapter One of the Jungle Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Jungle Girl by Gordon Casserly. Chapter One youth's daring courage manhood's fire firm seat and eagle eye must he acquire who doth aspire to see the gray boar die indian pig stickling song mrs norton looked contently at her image in the long mirror which reflected a graceful figure in a well-cut gray habit and smart long brown boots a pretty face and wavy auburn hair under the sun helmet then turning away and picking up her whip she left the dressing-room and passing the door of her husband's bedroom where he lay still sleeping descended the broad marble staircase of the residency to the lofty hall where an indian servant in a long red coat hurried to open the door of the dining-room for her almost at that moment a mile away raymond the adjunct of the one hundred and eightieth punjab infantry looked at his watch and called out loudly hurry up wargrave it's four o'clock and the ponies will be round in ten minutes and it's a long ride to the palace he was seated at a table on the veranda of the bungalow which he shared with his brother subaltern in the small military cantonment near rohar the capital of the native state of mandha in the west of india dawn had not yet come and by the light of an oil lamp raymond was eating a frugal breakfast of tea toast and fruit the chota harzi or light meal with which europeans in the east begin the day he was dressed in an old shooting jacket breeches and boots and as he ate his eyes turned frequently to a bundle of steel-headed bamboo spears leaning against the wall near him for he and his companion were going as the guests of the marha of manda for a day's pig stickling as hunting the wild boar is termed in india he had finished his meal and lit a cheroot before wargave came yawning on to the veranda sorry for being so lazy old chap said the newcomer but a year's leave in england gets one out of the habit of early rising he pulled up a chair to the table on which his white-clad mussulman servant who had come up the front steps of the veranda laid a tray with his tea and toast and while he ate raymond lay back smoking in a long chair and looked almost affectionately at him they had been friends since their sandhurst days and during the past twelve months of his comrade's absence on furlong in europe the adjunct had sorely missed his cheery companionship nor was he the only one in their regiment who had frank wargrave was almost universally liked by both men and women and while unspoilt by popularity thoroughly deserved it he was about twenty-six years of age above medium height with a lithe and graceful figure which the riding costume that he was wearing well set off fair-haired and blue-eyed with good though irregular features he was pleasant-faced and attractive rather than handsome the cheerful good-tempered manner that he displayed even at that trying early hour was a true indication of a happy and light-hearted disposition that made him as liked by his brother officers as by other men who did not know him so well in his regiment all the native ranks adored the young sahib 
who was always kind and considerate though just to them and looked more closely after their interests than he did his own for like most young officers in the indian army he was seldom out of debt but soldierly hospitality and a hand ever ready to help a friend in want were the causes rather than deliberate extravagance on his own account taking life easily and never worrying over his own troubles he was always generous and sympathetic to others and prompter to take up cudgels on their behalf than on his own his being a good sportsman and a smart soldier added to his popularity among men while all women were partial to the pleasant courteous subaltern whom they felt to have a chivalrous regard and respect for them and who was as polite and attentive to an old lady as he was to the prettiest girl while admiring and liking the other sex wargrave had hitherto been too absorbed in sport and his profession to have ever found time to lose his heart to any particular member of it while his innate respect for and high ideal of womankind had preserved him from unworthy intrigues with those ready to meet him more than halfway even in the idleness of the years furlong in england from which he had returned the previous day he had remained heart whole although several charming girls had been ready to share his lot and more than one pretty pirate had sought to make him her prize but he had been blind to them all for he was too free from conceit to believe that any woman would concern herself with him unasked he had dined and danced with maid and young matron in london ridden with them in the row in richmond park punted them down backwaters by goring pangbourne and the clevedon woods and flirted harmlessly with them in country houses after days with the corn and the pitchley and yet come back to india true to his one love his regiment as raymond watched him the fear of the feminine dangers in england for his friends suddenly pricked and he blurted out anxiously i say old chap you haven't got tangled up with any women at home have you not got engaged or any silly thing like that i hope wargrave laughed no fear old boy he replied pouring out another cup of tea far too hard to think of such an expensive luxury as a wife been too busy too to see much of a particular girl you had some decent sport hadn't you asked his friend with a feeling of relief in his heart rather i told you i'd learnt to fly and got my pilot's certificate for one thing good fun flying i wish i could afford a bus of my own then i had some yachting on the solent and a lot of boating on the thames i put in a month in switzerland skiing and skating did you get any hunting yes at my uncle's near desford in lakeshire he gave me some shooting too it was all very well but i was very envious when the regiment came here and you wrote and told me of the pig sticking you were getting i've always longed for it it's great sport isn't it the best i know cried raymond enthusiastically beats hunting hollow you're not following a wretched little animal that runs for its life but a game brute that will turn on you as like not and make you fight for yours it must be ripping i do hope we'll have the luck to find plenty of pig to-day oh we're sure to the maharajah 
told me yesterday they have marked down a sounder that is a herd of wild pig in a maw about seven miles the other side of the city which is two miles away so we have a ride of nine to the meet that will make it a very hard day for our ponies won't it asked wargrave anxiously eighteen miles there and back and the runs as well oh that's all right the marha mounts us at the meet we'll find his horses waiting there for us raw-boned beasts with mouths like iron as a rule but good goers and staunch to pig by jove the maraja must be a real good chap one of the best replied raymond he is a man for whom i've the greatest admiration he rules his state admirably he commanded his own imperial service regiment in the war and did splendidly he is very good to us here so it seems from what i gathered at mess last night he appears to provide all our sport for us yes he arranges his shoots and the pig sticking meats for days on which the officers of the regiment are free to go out with him when we can travel by road he sends for carriages for us lends us horses and his camels to follow us with lunch ice and drinks wherever we go what a good fellow he must be exclaimed wargrave i am glad we get pig sticking here i've always longed for it but never have been anywhere before where there was any as you know it's lucky for us that the sport here is good for with out it life in rohar would be too awful to contemplate it's the last place the lord made it's the hardest place to reach i've ever known said wargrave it was a shock to learn that after forty-eight hours in the train i had two more days to travel after leaving the railway how did you like that forty miles in a camel train over the salt desert that made you sit up a bit eh it was awful the heat and glare off the sand nearly killed me you say there is no society here society the only europeans here or in the whole state besides those of us in the regiment are the resident and his wife what is a resident exactly a political officer appointed by the government of india to be a sort of adviser to a rajah and to keep a check on him if he rules his state badly i shouldn't imagine that our fellow here major norton would be much good as an adviser to anybody the only thing he seems to know anything about is insects he's quite a famous entomologist personally he is not a bad sort but a bit of a bore what's his wife like oh very different much younger and fond of gaiety i think not that she can get any here she's a decidedly pretty woman i haven't seen much of her for she has been away most of the time that the regiment has been here she has relatives in calcutta and stays a lot with them i don't blame her said wargrave laughing rohir must be a very deadly place for a young woman no amusements no dances no shops and the only female society the wives of the colonel and the doctor luckily for mrs norton she is rather keen on sport and a good rider you'll probably meet her to-day for she generally comes out pig-sticking with us though she doesn't carry a spear i've promised to take her shooting with us the next time we go hello here are the ponies at last are you ready frank the two officers rose as their seeks 
or native grooms came up before the bungalow leading two ponies a whaler and an arab raymond walked over to the bundle of spears and selected one with a leaf-shaped steel head try this frank he said see if it suits you you don't want too long a spear his companion balanced it on his hand yes it seems all right i say old chap how does one go for the pig do you thrust at him no just ride hard at him with the spear pointed and held with stiffened arm your impetus will drive the steel well home into him mounting their ponies they started the seats carrying the spears and following them at a steady run as they trotted down the sandy road leading to the city where at the palace they were to meet the maraja and other sportsmen the sky was paling fast at the coming of the dawn and they could discern the dozen bungalows and the regimental lines or barracks comprising the little cantonment above which towered the dark mass of a rocky hill crowned by the ruined walls of an old native fort on either side of their route the country was flat and at first barren but as they neared the capital they passed through cultivation and rode by green fields irrigated from deep wells by hamlets of palm-thatched mud huts where no one yet stirred and on to where the high embrasured walls of the city rode above the plain under the vaulted arch of the old gateway the ponies clattered along through the narrow silent streets of gaily painted wooden balcony houses at that hour closely shuttered until the palace was reached as the rising sun began to flush the sky with rose pink the guard of sepoys at the great gate saluted as the two officers rode into the wide paved courtyard lined by the high many windowed buildings in the centre of it a group of horsemen nobles of the state or officials of the palace in gay dresses and bright-colored pudres or turbans with gold or silver hilted swords hanging from their belts sat on their restless animals behind the maharaja a pleasant-faced athletic man in a white flannel coat riding breeches and long soft leather boots mounted on a tall whaler gelding he was chatting with four or five other officers of the punjabis and raised his hand to his forehead as the newcomers rode up and lifted their hats to him good morning your highness said raymond i hope we're not too late let me present mr wargrave of our regiment who has just returned from england with a genial smile the maharaja leant forward and held out his hand i'm glad to make your acquaintance mr wargrave he said and very pleased to see you out with us to-day are you fond of pig stickling i've never had the chance of doing any before your highness replied frank shaking his hand i'm awfully anxious to try it but being a novice i'm afraid i'll only be in the way i'm sure you won't said the maharaja courteously his command of english was perfect pig stickling is not at all difficult and i hear that you are a good rider he looked at his watch and then turning in the saddle addressed another officer of the regiment who was chafing raymond for being late are we all here now captain ross yes sir these two lazy fellows are the last replied ross laughingly very well gentlemen we'll start he waved his hand and at the signal two black-bearded sowars or soldiers of his cavalry re regiment dashed by him and out through the palace gates at a hard gallop 
leading the way past the guard who turned out and presented arms as the marja and the british officers together with the crowd of nobles officials and mounted attendants followed at a smart pace the city was now waking to life from their windows the sleepy inhabitants stared at the party mostly too stupefied at that hour to recognize and salute their ruler pot-bellied naked brown babies waddled on to the verandas to gaze thumb in mouth at the riders pariah dogs nosing at the gutters and rubbish heaps that scented the air bolted out of the way of the horses hoofs as the sportsmen passed out of the city gates the sun was rising above the horizon the terrible hot weather sun of india whose advent ushers in the long hours of gasping breathless heat for a mile or so the route lay through fertile gardens and fields then suddenly the cultivation ended abruptly on the edge of a sandy desert that seemed with mullahs or deep steep-sided ravines and dotted with tall clumps of thorny cactus stretched away to the horizon the road became a barely discernible track but the two sores cantered on confidently heading for the spot where the fresh horses awaited the party over the sand the riders swept past a slow plodding elephant lumbering back to the city with a low of fodder by groups of tethered camels hares started up in alarm and bounded away gray partridges whirred up and yellow beet minas flew off chattering indignantly the slight morning coolness soon vanished and wargrave soft and somewhat out of condition after his weeks of shipboard life wiped his streaming face often before the guiding sowers threw up their hands in warning and vanished slowly from sight as their sure-footed horses picked their way down a steep mola this was the ravine in which the quarry hid one after another of the riders followed the leaders down the narrow track trotted up across the sandy rock-strewn river bed and climbed up the far side to where the fresh horses and a picturesque mob of wild-looking beaters stood awaiting them among the animals wargrave noticed a smart gray arab pony with a side saddle i see mrs norton intends coming out with us observed the maharaja looking at the pony we must wait for her it won't be long sir said raymond pointing to a rising trail of dust on the track by which they had come i'll bet that is she all turned to watch the approaching rider draw near until they could see that it was a lady galloping furiously over the sand by jove she can ride exclaimed wargrave admiringly i hope she'll see the mullah she's heading straight for it a shouted warning caused her to pull up almost on the brink and in a few minutes she joined the waiting group wargrave looked with an interest at her as she sat on her panting horse talking to the marja and other officers who had dismounted mrs norton was a decidedly graceful and pretty woman the rounded curves of her shapely figure were set off to advantage by her riding costume her eyes were especially attractive greenish-gray eyes fringed by long black lashes under curved dark brows contrasting with the warm auburn tint of her hair that showed under her sun hat her complexion was dazzling fair her mouth was rather large and voluptuous with full red lips and even white teeth bewitching dimples played in the pink cheeks even from a man like wargrave fresh from england and consequently more inclined to be critical of female beauty than were his comrades 
for many months had seen so few white women mrs norton's good looks could justly claim full meed of admiration and approval accepting captain ross's aid she slipped lightly from her saddle to the ground and on foot looked as graceful as she did when mounted raymond brought his friend to her and introduced him holding out a small and shapely hand in a dainty leather gauntlet she said in a frank and pleasant manner how do you do mr wargrave you are a fortunate person to have been in england so lately i haven't seen it for nearly three years were you sorry to leave it not in the least mrs norton i'd far sooner be doing this he waved his hand towards the horses and the open desert then fooling about piccadilly and the park oh but don't you miss the gaieties of town the theatres the dances and then the shops and the new fashions but you're a man and they mean nothing to you the maraja broke in mrs norton i think we'd better mount the beaters are going in and the shirkas hunters tell me that the nulla swarms with pig there are at least half dozen rideable boar in it in pig sticking only well-grown boars are pursued sows and immature boars being unmolested ross started forward to help mrs norton on to her fresh pony but wargrave refused to surrender the advantage of his proximity to her so it was into his hand she put her small foot in its well-made riding boot and was swung up by him the saddles of the rest of the party had been changed on the horses that the marja had provided the beaters streamed down the steep bank into the ravine which some distance away was filled with dense scrub affording good cover for the quarry forming line they moved through it with shrill yells the blare of horns the beating of tom-toms and a spluttering fire of blank cartridges from old muskets the riders mounted and spear in hand eagerly watched their progress through the jungle wargrave found himself beside mrs norton but after exchanging a few words he forgot her presence as his heart beating fast with a true sportsman's excitement he strained his eyes for the first sight of a wild boar suddenly several hundred yards away he saw a squat dark animal emerge from the tangled scrub and climbing up the nulla on their side stride away over the sand with a peculiar bounding motion that reminded morgrave of a rocking horse all eyes were turned towards the maraja who would decide whether the animal was worthy of pursuit or not he gazed after it for a few moments then raised his hand at the welcome signal all dashed off after the boar at a furious gallop opening out as they went to give play for their spears wild with excitement wargrave struck spurs to his horse which needed no urging being as filled with the lust of the chase as was the man on its back like a cavalry charge the riders thundered in a mad rush behind his highness whose faster mount carried him at once ahead of the rest he soon overtook the boar lowering his spear point the maraja bent forward in the saddle but at the last moment the pig jinked that is turned sharply at right angles to his former course and bounded away untouched while the baffled sportsman was carried on helplessly by his excited horse wargrave following at some distance to the maraja's right rear saw to his mingled joy and trepidation the boar only a short way in front of him 
ride ride hard cried mrs norton almost alongside him frank drove his spurs in and the gaunt raw-boned country bred under him sprang forward but just as it had all but reached the quarry the latter jinked again and wargrave was borne on tugging vainly at the horse's iron jaws but the boar had short shrift with a rush ross closed in on it and before it could swerve off sent his spear deep into its side and galloping on turned his hand over drawing out the lance the pig was staggered by the shock but started to run on before it could get up speed one of the indian nobles dashed at it with wild yells and speared it again the thrust this time was mortal the boar staggered on a few steps then stumbled and fell heavily to the ground the hunters reined in their sweating horses and gathered round it not a big animal commented the marja scrutinizing it with the eye of an expert about thirty-four inches high i think but the tusks are good they're yours captain ross aren't they yes your highness i think so replied ross pig sticking law awards the trophy to the rider whose spear first inflicts a wound on the boar better luck next time mr wargrave said mr N said mrs norton riding up to him i thought you were sure of him when he jinked away from marja to be quite candid i was rather relieved i didn't get the chance mrs norton replied the sub barn i've never been out after pig before i didn't quite know what to do however i see now that it isn't very difficult so i hope i'll get an opportunity later you are sure to mr wargrave remarked the marja there are several boars left in cover and the men are going in again the tattered demolion mob of beaters was descending into the nulla and soon the wild din broke out once more a gaunt gray boar with long and gleaming tusks was seen to emerge from the scrub and climb the far bank of the ravine where he stood safely out of reach but in full view of the tantalized hunters but a string of laden camels passed over the desert scared him back again and while the riders watched in eager excitement he slowly descended into the mullah crossed it and came up the near side some hundreds of yards away the maraja raised his spear ride he cried go like the devil frank cried shouted raymond as the scurrying horseman swept in a body over the sand and he found himself for a moment beside his friend he's a beauty forty inches i'll swear splendid tusks wargrave crouched like a jockey in the saddle as the riders raced madly after the boar the indians among them wildly excited brandished their lances and uttered fierce cries as they galloped along their marriages speedier amount again took the lead but even in india sport is democratic and his nobles attendants and soldiers all tried to overtake and pass him the white men as is their wont rode in silence but none the less keenly excited over sand and stones past tall prickly cactus plants in hot pursuit all flew at racing speed it was a long chase for the old gray boar was speedy cunning and a master of wiles first one pursuer then another then a third and a fourth found him almost upon the quarry and bent down with outstretched eager spear only to be baffled by a swift jink and carried on helplessly pulling vainly at the reins at length a sudden turn threw out 
all the field except the marajah who had foreseen it and ridden off to intercept the now tiring boar overtaking it he bent forward and wounded it slightly the brute instantly swung in upon his horse and with a fierce grunt dashed under it and leapt up at it with a toss of the head that gave an upward thrust to the long curved tusk in an instant the horse was ripped open and brought crashing to the ground pinning its rider's leg to the earth beneath it the boar turned again marked the prostrate man and with a savage gleam in his eyes charged the maraja its gleaming ivory tusks six inches long as sharp and deadly as an aphrodite's knife End of chapter one recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter two of the jungle girl by gordon casserly this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c youth calls to youth but at that moment a shout made the boar hesitate and raymond dashed in on it at racing speed driving his spear so deeply into its side that as he swept on the tough bamboo broke like match wood the stricken beast tottered forward a yard or two then turned and stood undauntedly at bay as a sower rode at it but before his steel could touch its hide it shuddered and sank to the ground dead the dying horse was lifted off the maharaja who with the courage of his race had remained calm in the face of the onrushing death he was assisted to rise but was so severely shaken and bruised that at first he was unable to stand without support leaning on the arm of one of his nobles he held out his hand to raymond when the latter rode up and thanked him gratefully for his timidly act then the exhausted but gallant prince sat down on the sand to recover himself but he assured everyone that he was not hurt and insisting that the sport should go on gave orders for the beat to continue wargrave had chanced to dismount to tighten the girth of mrs norton's horse when a fresh boar broke from cover and was instantly pursued by all the others of the hunt the subaltern ruefully accepted the lady's apologies and hurriedly swung himself up into the saddle again to follow when his companion cried look look mr wargrave there's another come we'll have him all to ourselves and striking her pony with her gold-mounted whip she dashed off at a gallop after a gray old boar that had craftily kept close in cover and crept out quietly after the beaters had passed wargrave filled with excitement struck spurs to his mount and raced after her soon catching up and passing her over the sand pitted with holes and strewn with loose stones as they raced the boar bounded before them with rocking motion and leading them in a long stern chase again and again the beast swerved but at last with a fierce thrill wargrave felt the steel head of the spear strike home in the quarry as he was carried on past it he withdrew the weapon then pulled his panting horse round the boar was checked but the wound only infuriated him and aroused his fighting ardor he dashed at mrs norton but as frank turned the game brute recognized the more dangerous adversary and with a fierce grunt charged savagely at him 
wargrave plunged his spurs into his horse which sprang forward just clearing the boar's snout as the rider leant well out and speared the pig through the heart then with a wild exultant whoop the subaltern swung round in the saddle and saw the animal totter forward and collapse on the sand only a sportsman could realize his feeling of triumph at the fall of his first boar mrs norton was almost as excited as he her sparkling eyes and face flushed a becoming pink making her even prettier in his eyes as she rode up and congratulated him well done mr wargrave she cried trotting up to where he sat on his panting horse over the dead boar you did that splendidly and the first time you've been out pig-sticking too it was just luck replied the subaltern modestly not ill-pleased at her praise what a glorious run he gave us she continued and we had it all to ourselves which made it better i'm always afraid of the mahara's followers for in a run they ride so recklessly and carry their spears so carelessly that it's a wonder they don't kill someone every time will you help me down please i must give martian a rest after that gallop with wargrave's aid she dropped lightly to the ground and he remarked again with admiration the graceful lines and rounded curves of her figure as she walked to the dead boar and touched the tusks what a splendid pair you are lucky she exclaimed the biggest anyone has got yet this season i hope you allow me to offer them to you said wargrave generously although it cost him a pang to surrender the precious trophy you deserve them for you rode so well after the boar and i believe you had gotten if you'd carried a spear no indeed mr wargrave i wouldn't dream of taking them she replied laughing but i appreciate the nobility of your self-denial this is your first pig and i know what that means to a man now we must find a sower to get the coolies to bring the boar in but i wonder where we are where is everyone wargrave looked about him and for the first time realized that they were far out in the desert without a landmark to guide them on every side the sand stretched away to the horizon its flat expanse broken only by clumps of bristling cactus or very rarely the tall stem of a palm tree of the others of the party there was no sign his companion and he seemed to be alone in the world and he began to wonder apprehensively if they were destined to undergo the unpleasant experience of being lost in the desert the sun high overhead afforded no help and wargrave remembered neither the direction of the city nor where lay the ravine in which the beat had taken place you don't happen to know where we are i suppose mrs norton he asked his companion i haven't the least idea it looks as if we're lost she replied calmly we had better wait quietly where we are instead of wandering about trying to find our way when we are missed the maraja will probably send somebody to look for us i dare say you're right said wargrave you know more about the desert than i do by jove i'd give anything to come across the camel that raymond tells me brings out drinks and ice my throat is parched aren't you very thirsty terribly so 
isn't the heat awful she exclaimed trying to fan herself with the few inches of cambric and lace that represented a handkerchief awful the blood seems to be boiling in my head gasped the subaltern i've never felt heat like this anywhere else in india but thank goodness it seems to be clouding over that will make it cooler mrs norton looked around a dun veil was being swiftly drawn up over sun and sky and blotting out the landscape good gracious there's worse trouble coming that's a sandstorm she cried for the first time exhibiting a sign of nervousness good heavens how pleasant are we going to be buried under a mound of sand like the pictures we used to have in our school books of caravans overwhelmed in the sahara mrs norton smiled not quite as bad as that she answered but unpleasant enough i assure you if only we had any shelter wargrave looked around desperately he had hitherto no experience of desert country and the sudden darkness and the grim menace of the approaching black wall of the sandstorm seemed to threaten disaster he saw a thick clump of cactus half a mile away we'd better make for that he said pointing to it it will serve to break the force of the wind if we get to leeward of it let's mount he put her on her horse and then swung himself up into the saddle together they raced for the scant shelter before the dark menace overspreading earth and sky the sun was now hidden but that brought no relief for the heat was even more stifling and oppressive than before the wind seemed like a blast of hot air from an opened furnace door pulling up where they reached the dense thicket of cactus with its broad green leaves studded with cruel thorns wargrave jumped down and lifted mrs norton from the saddle the horses followed them instinctively as they pressed as closely as they could to the shelter of the inhospitable plant the animals turned their tails towards the approaching storm and instinctively huddled against their human companions in distress wargrave took off his jacket and spread it around mrs norton's head holding her to him with a shrill wail the dark storm swept down upon them and a million sharp particles of sand beat on them stinging smothering choking them the horses crowded nearer to the man and the woman clung tighter to him as he wrapped her more closely in the protecting cloth he felt suffocated stifled his lungs bursting his throat burning while every breath he drew was laden with the irritating sand it penetrated through all the openings of his clothing down his collar inside his shirt into his boots the heat was terrific unbearable the darkness intense wargrave began to wonder if his first apprehensions were not justified if they could hope to escape alive or were destined to be buried under the stifling pall that enveloped them he felt against him the soft body of the woman clinging desperately to him and the warm contact thrilled him a feeling of pity of tenderness for her awoke in him at the thought that this young and attractive being was fated perhaps to perish by so awful a death and instinctively unconsciously he held her closer to him for minutes that seemed hours the storm continued to shriek and 
roar over and around them but at length the choking waves began to diminish in density and slowly gradually the deadly smothering pall was lifted from them the black wall passed on and wargrave watched it moving away over the desert the storm had lasted half an hour but the subaltern believed its duration to have been hours the fine grit had penetrated into the case of his wristwatch and stopped it a cool refreshing breeze sprang up pulling his jacket off mrs norton's head wargrave said it's over at last oh thank god she exclaimed fervently standing erect and drawing a deep breath of cool air into her laboring lungs i thought i was going to be smothered it was a decidedly unpleasant experience and one i don't want to try again my throat is parched i must have swallowed tons of sand and look at the state i'm in he was powdered thick with it clothes hair eyebrows gray with it it had caked on his face damp with perspiration thanks to your jacket i've escaped pretty well although i was almost suffocated she said well now that it is over surely someone will come to look for us then we had better get up on our horses and move out into the open will be more visible said wargrave yet he felt a strange reluctance to quit the spot for the thought came to him that their unpleasant experience in it would henceforth be a link between them a few hours before he had not known of this woman's existence and now he had held her to his breast and tried to protect her against the forces of nature the same idea seemed born in her mind at the same time for when he had brushed the dust off her saddle and lifted her on to it she turned to look with interest at the spot as they rode away from it they had not long to wait out in the open before they saw three or four riders spread over the desert apparently looking for them so they cantered towards them as soon as they were seen by the search party a sour galloped to meet them and saluting told them that the maharajah and the rest had taken refuge from the storm in a village a couple of miles away then from the kamar band or broadcloth encircling his waist like a sash he produced two bottles of soda water which he opened and gave to them the liquid was warm but nevertheless was acceptable to their parched throats they followed their guide at a gallop and soon were being welcomed by the rest of the party in a small village of low mud huts a couple of kneeling camels bobbling squealing and fiercely trying to bite everything within reach were being unloaded by some of the maharajah's servants other attendants were spreading a white cloth on the ground by a well under a couple of tall palm trees and laying on it an excellent cold lunch for the europeans with bottles of champagne standing in silver pails filled with ice as soon as his anxiety on mrs norton's account was relieved by her arrival his highness who as an orthodox hindu could not eat with his guests begged them to excuse him and being helped with difficulty on his horse rode slowly off still shaken and sorely bruised by his fall his nobles and officials accompanied him after lunch all went to inspect 
the heap of slain boars laid on the ground in the shade of a hut wargrave's kill had been added to it much to the subaltern's delight its tusk proved to be the longest and finest of all and he was warmly congratulated by the more experienced pig sticklers on his success shortly afterwards the beaters went into the mullah again and a few more runs added another couple of boars to the bag then after ice drinks while their saddles were being changed back on to their own horses the britishers mounted and started on their homeward journey without quite knowing how it happened wargrave found himself riding beside mrs norton behind the rest of the party on the way back they chatted freely and without restraint like old friends for the incidents of the day had served to sweep away formality between them and to give them a sense of long acquaintanceship and mutual liking and when the time came for mrs norton to separate from the others as she reached the spot where the road to the residency branched off the subaltern volunteered to accompany her it had not taken them long to discover that they had several tastes in common so you like good music she said after a chance remark of his it is pleasant to find a kindred spirit in this desolate place the ladies and the other officers of your regiment are philistines ragtime is more in their line than grieg or brahms and the other day captain ross asked me if tchaikovsky wasn't the russian dancer at the coliseum in town wargrave laughed i know i became very unpopular when i was band president and made our band play wagner all one night during mess i gave up trying to elevate their musical taste when the colonel told me to order the bandmaster to stop that awful rubbish and play something good like the selection from the last london review are you a musician yourself she asked i play the violin oh how ripping you must come often and practice with me i've an excellent piano but i rarely touch it now my husband takes no interest in music or indeed in anything else i like but then i am not thrilled by his one absorbing passion in life insects so we're quits i suppose their horses were walking silently over the soft sand and wargrave heard her give a little sigh was it possible he wondered that the husband of this charming woman did not appreciate her and her attractions as he ought she went on with a change of manner when are you coming to call on me i am a duty call you know all officers are supposed to leave cards on the palace and the residency the call on you will be a pleasure i assure you not a mere duty mrs norton said the subaltern with a touch of earnestness may i come to-morrow yes please do come early for tea and bring your violin it will be delightful to have some music again i have not opened my piano for months but i'll begin to practice tonight i have one or two pieces with violin obligato so chatting and at every step finding something fresh to like in each other they rode along down sandy lanes hemmed in by prickly aloe hedges 
by deep wells and creaking water wheels where patient bullocks toiled in the sun to draw up the gushing water to irrigate the green fields so reproachful to the eye after the glaring desert they passed by thatched mud huts outside which naked brown babies sprawled in the dust and dear-eyed women turned the hand querns that ground the flour for their household's evening meal stiff and sore though wargrave was after these many hours of his first day in the saddle for so long he thoroughly enjoyed his ride back with so attractive a companion when they reached the residency a fine airy building of white stone standing in large well-kept grounds he felt quite reluctant to part with her but declining her invitation to enter he renewed his promise to call on the following day and rode on to his bungalow when he was alone he realized for the first time the effects of fatigue thirst and the boiling heat of the afternoon sun but mrs norton was more in his thoughts than the exciting events of the day as he trotted painfully on towards his bungalow the house was closely shut and shuttered against the outside heat and raymond was asleep enjoying a welcome siesta after the early start and hard exercise wargrave entered his own bare and comfortless bedroom and with the help of his boy as indian body servants are termed proceeded to undress then attired in a big towel and slippers he passed into the small stone paved apartment dignified with the title of bathroom which opened off his bedroom after his ablutions wargrave lay down on his bed and slept for an hour or two until awakened by raymond's voice bidding him join him at tea strolling in pajamas and slippers into the sitting-room which they shared the subaltern found his comrade lying lazily in a long chair and attired in the same cool costume the outer doors and windows of the bungalow were still closed against the brooding heat outside inside the house the temperature was a little cooler despite the punka which droned monotonously overhead over their tea the two young soldiers discussed the day's sport recalling every incident of each run and kill until the servants came in to throw open the doors and windows in hope of a faint breath of evening coolness the punka stopped and the coolie who pulled it shuffled away after tea raymond took his companion to inspect the cantonment which wargrave had not yet seen for he had not reached it until after dusk the previous day it consisted only of the mess the regimental office and about ten bungalows for the officers single-storied brick or rubble-walled buildings thatched or tiled some of them were unoccupied and were tumbling in ruins there was nothing else not even the general shop usual in most small cantonments not a spool of thread not a tin of sardines could be purchased within a three days journey most of the food supplies and almost everything else had to be brought from bombay around the bungalow the compounds were simply patches of the universal sands surrounded by mud walls no flowers no trees not even a blade of grass relieved 
the dull monotony altogether the cantonment of rohar was an unlovely and uninteresting place yet it is but an example of many such stations in india lonely and soul deadening some of which have not even its saving grace of sport to enliven existence in them after a visit to the lines the rows of single-story detached brick buildings one to a company that housed the native ranks of the regiment where the indian officers and sepoys and as native infantry soldiers are called rushed out to crowd round and welcome back their popular officer wardgrave and raymond strolled to the mess here in the ante-room other british officers of the corps tired out after the day's sport were lying in easy chairs reading the three days old bombay newspaper just arrived and the three weeks old english journals until it was time to return to their bungalows and dress for dinner early on the following afternoon wargrave borrowed raymond's bamboo cart and pony for he had sold his own trap and horses before going on leave to england and had not yet time to buy new ones and drove to the residency when he pulled up before the hall door and in anglo-indian fashion shouted boy from his seat in the vehicle a tall stately indian servant came in a long gold lace red coat reaching below the knees and embroidered on the breast with the imperial monogram in gold came out and held a small silver tray to him wargrave placed a couple of his visiting cards on it and the gorgeous apparition known as a chuprasi retired into the building with them while he was gone wargrave looked with pleasure at the brilliant flower beds green lawn and tall plants and bushes glowing with color of the carefully tended and well watered residency garden which contrasted strikingly with the dry bare compounds of the cantonment in a minute or two the chuprasi returned and said salam wargrave hooking up the reins climbed down from the trap leaving raymond syce in charge of the pony and entered the grateful coolness of the lofty hall here another chaprassi took his hat and holding out a pen for him indicated the red bound visitor's book in which he was to inscribe his name then one of the servants led the way up the broad staircase into a large and well-furnished drawing-room extending along the whole front of the building here wargrave found mrs norton awaiting him she looked very lovely in a cool white dress of muslin but muslin shaped by a master hand of paris she welcomed him gaily and made him feel at once on the footing of an old friend she was genuinely glad to see him again to this young and attractive woman full of joy of living hardly more than a girl yet married to a much older man sober-minded stolid and uncongenial to her and buried in this dull and lonely station wargrave had appealed instantly youth calls to youth and she hailed his advent into her monotonous life as a child greets the coming of a playfellow with the other two ladies in rohar she had nothing in common both were middle-aged serious and spiteful to them her youth and beauty were an offence 
and from the first day of their acquaintance with her they had disliked her as for the other officers of the regiment none of them attracted her for good fellows as they were none shared any of her tastes except her love of sport but in wargrave she had already recognized a companion a playmate one to whom music art and poetry appealed as they did to her on his side frank heart whole but fond of the society of the opposite sex was at once attracted by this charming member of it who had tastes akin to his own her beauty pleased his beauty-loving eye and he would not have been man if her readiness to meet him on a footing of friendship had not flattered him he had thought that a great drawback to life in rohar would be the lack of feminine companionship for the ladies of his regiment were not all congenial although he did not dislike them but it was delightful to find in this desert spot this pretty and cultured woman who would have been deemed attractive in london and who appeared trebly so in a dull and lonely indian station he had thought much of her since their meeting on the previous day and although it never occurred to him to lose his heart to her or even attempt to flirt with her yet he felt that her friendship would brighten existence for him in rohar nor did the thought strike him that possibly he might come to mean more to mrs nelson than she to him for while he had his work his duties the good fellowship of the mess and the friendship of his comrades to fill his life she had nothing she was utterly without interest occupation or real companionship in rohar her husband and she had nothing in common no child had come during the five years of their marriage to link them together and in this solitary place where there was no gaieties no distractions such as a young woman would naturally long for she was lonely very lonely indeed it was little wonder that she snatched eagerly at the promise of an interesting friendship wardgrave stood out and apart from the other officers of the regiment and his companionship during the uncomfortable incident of the sandstorm bulked unaccountably larged in her mind it seemed to denote that he was destined to introduce a new element into her life as they talked it was with increasing pleasure that she learned they had so many tastes in common she found that he played the violin well and was moreover the possessor of a voice tuneful and sympathetic even if not perfectly trained this made instant appeal to her and would have disposed her to regard him with favor even if she had not been already prepared to like him the afternoon passed all too quickly for both of them violet norton had never enjoyed any hours in rohar so much as these and when as she sat at the piano while frank played an obligato a servant came to inquire if she wished her horse or a carriage got ready for her usual evening ride or drive she impatiently ordered him out of the room when the time came for wardgrave to return to his bungalow to dress for dinner she begged him to stay and dine with her i shall be all alone and it would be a charitable act 
to take pity on my solitude she said my husband is dining at your mess tonight thank you very much for asking me replied the subaltern i should have loved to accept your invitation but it is our guest night and the colonel likes all of us to be present at mess on such evenings oh i forgot she exclaimed i ought to have remembered for mr raymond told me the same thing only last week when i invited him informally well you must come some other night soon reluctant to part with her new playmate she accompanied him to the door and to the scandal of the stately champrasses stood at it to watch him drive away and to wave him a last good-bye as he looked back when the pony turned out of the gate india is a land of lightning friendships between men and women end of chapter two chapter three of the jungle girl by gordon casserly this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the love song of har dial the bugler was sounding the second mess call as the resident's carriage drew up before the steps of the mess veranda on which stood all the officers of the regiment dressed in the white drill uniform worn at dinner in india during the hot weather from the carriage major norton a stout middle-aged man in civilian evening dress descended stiffly and shook hands with the commandant of the battalion colonel trevor who had come down the steps to meet him and whose guest he was to be on the veranda wargrave was introduced to him by the colonel and took his outstretched hand with reluctance for frank felt stirring in him a faint jealousy of the man who was violet's legal lord and an infinite hostility to him for not appreciating his charming wife as he ought and while the resident was shaking hands with the others wargrave looked at him with interest major norton was a very ordinary-looking man more elderly in appearance than his years warranted he was bald and clean-shaved but for scraps of side whiskers that gave him a resemblance to the traditional stage lawyer of amateur theatricals a likeness increased by his heavy and prosy manner it was hard to believe that he had ever been a young subaltern though such had once been the case for the indian political department is recruited chiefly from officers of the indian army but he was never the gay and light-hearted individual that most junior subs are at the beginning of their career even then he had been a sober and serious individual favorably noted by his superiors as being earnest and painstaking and now he was well thought of by the heads of his department for his plodding and methodical disposition and his slavish adherence to the rules and regulations had earned him the reputation of being an eminently safe man how such a gay laughter-loving coquettish and attractive woman as violet deering came to marry one so entirely her opposite puzzled every one who did not know the inner history of a girl one of a large family of daughters given her chance in life by being sent out to relatives in calcutta for one season with a definite warning not to return home unmarried under penalty of being turned out to face the world 
as a governess or hospital nurse and violet liked comfort and hated work during dinner wargrave found himself instinctively criticizing norton's manner and conversation and rapidly arrived at the conclusion that raymond had described him accurately the resident though a very worthy individual was undoubtedly a bore and colonel trevor besides whom he sat strove in vain to appear interested in his conversation for he had heard his opinions on every subject on which norton had any opinions over and over again as the resident was the only other european in the station he dined regularly at the mess on the weekly guest night with one or other of the officers he was not popular among them but they considered it their duty to be victimized in turn to uphold the regiment's reputation for hospitality and in consequence each resigned himself to act as his host after dinner as the resident played neither cards nor billiards the colonel sat out on the veranda with him all the while longing to be at the bridge table instead and as his guest was a strict tree toddler he did not like to order a drink for himself so he tried to keep awake and hide his yawns while listening to a prosy monologue on insects until the residency carriage came to take major norton away when his guest had left the colonel entered the ante-room heaving a sigh of relief phew thank god that's over he exclaimed piteously really norton becomes more of a bore every day i'm sick to death of hearing the life story of every indian insect for the hundredth time i'll dream of coloperta and polyoptera and other weird beasties to-night the other officers looked up and laughed ross rose from the bridge table and said come and take my place sir we finished the rubber have a drink you want something to cheer you up after that infliction boy whiskey soda commanding salib kiwas lao bring a whiskey and soda for the commanding officer you've my entire sympathy colonel said major hepburn the second in command it's my turn to ask the resident to dinner next i feel tempted to go on the sick list to escape it i say sir i've got a good idea said an irish subaltern named dally who was seated at the bridge table couldn't we pass a resolution at the next mess meeting that in future no guests are ever to be asked to dinner that will save us from our weekly penance the others laughed but the colonel whose sense of humor was not his strong point took the suggestion as being seriously meant no no we couldn't do that he said in an alarmed tone the resident would be very offended and might mention it to the general when he comes here on his annual inspection the remark was very characteristic of colonel trevor who was a man who dreaded responsibility and whose sole object in life was to reach safety the time when his period of command being finished he could retire on his full pension he was always haunted by the dread that some carelessness or mistake on his part or that of any of his subordinates might involve him in trouble with his superiors and prevent that happy consummation of his thirty years of indian service this fear made him merciless to any one under him whose conduct might bring the censure of the higher authorities on the innocent head of the commanding officer 
who was in theory responsible for the behavior of his juniors it was commonly said in the regiment that he would cheerfully give up his own brother to be hanged to save himself the mildest official reprimand perhaps he was not altogether to blame for he was not his own master in private life it was hinted that colonel trevor commanded the battalion but that mrs trevor commanded him and unfortunately there was no doubt that this lady interfered privately a good deal in regimental matters much to the annoyance of the other officers now relieved of the incubus that hitherto spoiled his enjoyment of the evening the colonel gratefully drank the whisky and soda brought him by rosa's order and sat down cheerfully to play bridge he always liked dining in the mess where he was a far more important person than he was in his own house it did not take wargrave long to settle down again into the routine of regimental life and the humdrum existence of a small indian station but he had never before been quartered in so remote and dull a spot as rohar the only distractions it offered besides the shooting and pig-sticking were two tennis afternoons weekly one at the residency the other at the mess here the dozen or so europeans who knew every line of each other's faces by heart gathered regularly from sheer boredom whether the game amused them or not neither mrs trevor nor her bosom friend mrs baird the regimental surgeon's better half ever attempted it but they invariably attended and sat together usually talking scandal of mrs norton as she played or chatted with the men mrs trevor's chief grievance against her was that the general commanding the division when he came to inspect the battalion took the younger woman in to dinner for as her husband the resident was the viceroy's representative she could claim precedence over the wife of a mere regimental commandant no english village is so full of petty squabbles and malicious gossip as a small indian station like every one else in the land wargrave hated most those terrible hours of the hot weather between nine in the morning and five in the afternoon he and raymond passed them like so many thousands of their kind elsewhere shut up in their comfortless bungalow which was darkened and closely shuttered to exclude the awful heat and the blinding glare outside too hot to read or write almost to smoke they lay in long cane chairs gasping and perspiring freely while the whining punka overhead barely stirred the heated air one exterior window on the windward side of the bungalow was filled with a thick mat of dried and odorous couscous grass against which every quarter of an hour the beastie threw water to wet it thoroughly so that the hot breeze that swept over the burning sand outside might enter cooled by the evaporation of the water but frank found alleviation and comfort in frequent visits to the residency where mrs norton and he spent the baking hours of the afternoon absorbed in making music or singing duets for violet had a well-trained voice which harmonized well with his no thought of sex seemed to obtrude itself on them they were just playmates comrades nothing more yet it was only natural that the woman's vanity should be flattered by the man's eagerness to seek her society and by his evident pleasure in it 
and it was delightful to have at last a sympathetic listener to all her little grievances one who seemed as interested in her petty household worries or the delinquencies of her london milner in failing to execute her orders properly as in her greater complaint against the fate that condemned a woman of her artistic and gaiety-loving nature to existence in the wilds and to the society of persons so uncongenial to her as were the majority of the white foot folk of rohar to a man the role of confidant to a pretty woman is pleasant and flattering and wargrave felt that he was highly favored by being made the recipient of her confidences it never occurred to him that there might be danger in the situation he regarded her only as a friend in need of sympathy and help his chivalry was up in arms at the thought that she was not properly appreciated by her husband who he began to suspect was inclined to neglect her and treat her as a mere chattel the suspicion angered him true violet had never definitely told him so but he gathered as much from her unconscious admissions and revered her all the more for her bravery in endeavouring to keep silent on the subject certainly major norton did not seem to him to be a man capable of understanding and valuing so sweet and rare a woman as this after their introduction in the mess frank's next meeting with him was at his own table at the residency when in due course wargave was invited to dinner after his duty call raymond was asked as well and the two subalterns were the only guests their hostess looked very lovely in a paris made gown of a green shade that suited her coloring admirably england did not seem to the young soldiers so very far away when this charming and exquisitely dressed woman received them in her large drawing-room from which all trace of the east in furniture and decoration was carefully excluded for the english in india try to avoid in their homes all that would remind them of the land of exile in which their lot is cast major norton came into the room after his guests muttering an intelligible apology he shook hands with them with an abstracted air and failed to recall wargrave's name at table he asked frank a few perfunctory questions and then wandered off into his inevitable subject etymology but finding him ignorant of and uninterested in it he engaged in a desultory conversation with raymond he soon tired of this and for the most part ate his dinner in silence he never addressed his wife and wargrave watching him pitied her if her husband was as little companionable at meal times when they were alone he pictured her sitting at table every day with this abstracted and uncommunicative man whose thoughts seemed far from his present company and surroundings and who was scarcely likely to exert himself to talk to and entertain his wife when he made so little effort to do so to his guests determined that on this occasion at least his hostess should be amused frank did his best to enliven the meal he described to her as well as he could all that he remembered of the latest fashions in england told her the plots of the newest plays at the london theatres repeated a few laughable stories to make her smile and provoke raymond 
who had a dry humour of his own, to a contest of wit. Between them the two subalterns brightened up what had threatened to be a dull evening. Mrs. Norton laughed gaily and helped to keep the ball rolling, and even the host in his turn woke up and actually attempted to tell a humorous story. It certainly lacked point, but he seemed satisfied that it was funny, so his guests smiled as in duty bound. But Wargrave noted Mrs. Norton's look of astonishment at this new departure on the part of her husband, and thought that there was something very pathetic in her surprise. When the meal was ended, she laughingly declined to leave the men over their wine and stayed to smoke a cigarette with them. When they all quitted the dining room, the resident asked his guest to excuse him for returning to his study, pleading urgent and important work, and his wife led the subalterns up to the drawing room and out on to the veranda that ran alongside its french windows here easy chairs and a table with a big lamp had been placed for them as soon as they were seated one of the stately chuprasses brought coffee while another proffered cigars and cigarettes and held a light from a silver spirit lamp then both the solemn servitors departed noiselessly on bare feet after some conversation mrs norton said to the adjunct do you remember mr raymond that you have promised to take me out shooting one day i haven't forgotten he replied but i was not able to arrange it as the maharajah had pig-sticking meats fixed up for all our free days but i don't think we'll have another for some time for i hear that his kindness is laid up from the effects of his fall so we might go out some day soon good when shall we go asked wargrave let's fix it up now what about next thursday said his friend turning to mrs norton yes that will suit me where shall we go there are a lot of partridge and a few hares i'm told near the tank at marwa where there is a good deal of cultivation answered raymond then turning to his friend he continued you are not very keen on small game shooting frank so you can bring your rifle and try for chinkara i saw a buck and a couple of doe there not very long ago a little venison would be very acceptable in mess the tank is about eight miles away isn't it said the hostess i'll write to the maharajah and ask him to lend us camels to take us out my cook will put up a good cold lunch for us she rose from her chair and continued now mr wargrave come and sing something i've been trying over those new songs of yours to-day she led the way into the drawing-room and raymond was left alone on the veranda to smoke and listen for the rest of the evening while the others forgot him as they played and sang suddenly he sat up in his chair and with a queer little pang of jealousy in his heart stared through the open window at the couple at the piano he watched his friend's face turn eagerly towards his hostess wargrave was gazing intently at her in a voice full of feeling and pathos a voice with a plaintive little tone in it that thrilled him strangely she sang that haunting melody the love song of her dale wistfully sadly she uttered the sorrowful words that kipling puts into the mouth of the lovelorn pathan maiden my father's wife is old and harsh with years 
and drudge of all my father's house am i my bread is sorrow and my drink is tears come back to me beloved or i die come back to me beloved or i die and the singer looked up into the eager eyes bent on her and sighed a little as she struck the final chords out on the veranda raymond frowned as he watched them and wondered if this woman was to come between them and take his friend from him just then the barefooted servants entered the room carrying silver trays on which stood the whiskies and sodas that are the stirrup cups they hints to guess that the time of departure has come of dinner parties in india as the two subalterns drove home in raven's trap through the hot indian night under a moon shining with a brilliance that england never knows wargrave hummed the love song of har dial suddenly he said she's wonderful ray isn't she fancy such a glorious woman buried in this hole and married to a dry old stick like the resident doesn't it seem a shame the adjunct mumbled in an incoherent reply behind his lighted cheroot arrived in their bungalow they undressed in their rooms and in pajamas and slippers came out into the compound where on either side of a table on which was a lighted lamp stood their bedsteads the mattress of each covered with a thin strip of soft china matting for in the hot weather in many parts of india this must be used to lie upon instead of a linen sheet which would become saturated with perspiration looking carefully at the ground over which they passed for fear of snakes they reached and lay down on their beds over each of which a punka was suspended from a crossbeam supported by two upright posts sunk in the ground one rope moved both punkas and the motive power was also supplied by a coolie who salamaning to the salibs and seating himself on the ground picked up the end of the rope and began to pull raymond put out the lamp wargrave stared up at the moon for a while then he said i say ray didn't mrs norton look lovely tonight didn't that dress suit her awfully well oh go to sleep old man we've got to get up in a few hours for this confoundedly early parade good night growled the adjunct turning on his side and closing his eyes but he listened for some time to his friend humming the love song of har dal again and not until frank was silent did he doze off an hour later he woke up suddenly bathed in perspiration and devoured by mosquitoes for the punkas were still the coolie had gone to sleep he called to the man and aroused him then before shutting his eyes again he looked at his companion the moon shone full on wargrave's face he was sleeping peacefully and smiling raymond stared at him for a few minutes then he muttered inconsequently confound the woman and closing his eyes resolutely he fell asleep in the days that elapsed before the shoot at marwa wargrave rode every afternoon to the residency with the cease carrying his violin case except when tennis was to be played in their small community this could not escape notice and comment not that it occurred to him to try and void either the resident did not object to the frequency of his visits and frank saw no harm in his friendship with mrs norton but others did 
and the remarks of the two ladies of his regiment on the subject were venomously spiteful but their censure was reserved for the one they termed that shameless woman for like everyone else they were partial to wargrave and held him less to blame his brother officers although being men they were not so quick to nose out a scandal could not help noticing his absorption in mrs norton's society one afternoon his double company commander major hepburn walked into the compound of raymond's bungalow and on the veranda shouted the usual angle indian caller's demand boy ko hai is anyone there a servant hurried out and salamaning answered ajitan sahib hai the adjunct is here oh come in major cried raymond rising from the table at which he was seated drinking his tea don't get up said hepburn entering the room is wargrave in no sir he went out half an hour ago confound it it seems impossible ever to find him in the afternoon nowadays said the major penitently i wanted him to get up a hockey match against number three double company today he used to be very keen on playing with the men but since he came back from england he never goes near them where is he poodle faking at the residency as usual this is the term contemptuously applied in india to the paying of calls and other social duties that imply dancing attendance on the fair sex i didn't see him before he went out sir was raymond's equivocal reply he loyally evaded a direct answer hepburn shook his head doubtfully i'm sorry about it i hope the boy doesn't get into mischief look here raymond you're his pal keep your eye on him he's a good lad and it would be a pity if he came to grief the adjunct did not answer the major put on his hat well i suppose i'll have to see to the hockey myself he left the bungalow with a curt nod to raymond who watched him pass out through the compound gate then the adjunct walked over to wargrave's writing table and stood up again in its place a large photograph of mrs norton which he had hurriedly laid face downward when he heard hepburn's voice outside he looked at it for a minute then turned away frowning when the morning of the shooting party arrived wargrave and raymond having sent their syce on ahead with the guns rode at dawn to the residency in front of the building a group of camels lay on the ground burbling blowing bubbles grumbling incessantly and stretching out their long necks to stamp viciously at any one but their drivers that chanced to come near them at the hall door mrs norton stood dressed in a smart and attractive costume of khaki drill consisting of a well-cut long fraught coat and breeches with the neatest of cloth gaiters and dainty but serviceable boots to their surprise her husband was with her and evidently prepared to accompany them for he wore an old coat knickerbockers and putties from a strap over his shoulder hung a specimen box and he was armed with all the requisite appliances for the capture and slaughter of many insects avoiding the camel's vicious teeth the party mounted after exchanging greetings mrs norton and wargrave rode the same animal and frank unused to this form of locomotion took a tight grip 
as the long-legged beast rose from the ground in unexpected jerks and set off at a jolting walk that shook its riders painfully then it broke into a trot equally disconcerting but finally settled into an easy canter that was as comfortable a motion as its previous paces had been spine dislocating the route lay at first over a space of desert which was unpleasant for the sand was blown in clouds by a high wind almost a gale but the camels were fast movers and it did not take very long before they were passing through scrub jungle and finally reached the wide stretch of cultivation near marwa the tank as lakes are called in india lay in the centre of a shallow depression the rim of which all round was about four hundred yards from the water which now half a mile across evidently filled the whole basin in the rainy season the strong breeze churned its surface into little waves and piled up masses of froth and foam against the bending reeds at one end of the tank where about fifty yards from the water's edge stood a couple of thorny trees offering almost the only shade to be found for a long distance around in the shadows were many young egrets while a saurus crane stalked solemnly along the far bank and everywhere bird life rare elsewhere in the state abounded the land all about was green a refreshing change from the usual sandy and parched character of most of the country but beyond the tank the field stretched away out of sight at the edge of the cultivation the camels were halted and the party dismounted from them and separated mrs norton who was a fair shot and carried a light twelve-board gun started to walk up the partridges with raymond while her husband went to search the reeds and the borders of the lake for strange insects wargrave armed with a sporting man like her rifle set off on a long tramp to look for chinkara which are pretty little antelope with curving horns the wind which was freshening prevented the heat from being excessive the sport was fairly good when lunch time came the adjunct and mrs norton had got quite a respectable bag of partridges and a few hares the entomologist was in high spirits for he had secured two rare specimens and wargrave had shot a good buck so in a contented frame of mind all gathered under the trees near the end of the tank where lunch was laid by a couple of the residency servants on a white cloth spread on the ground as they ate their tiffin lunch the members of the party chatted over the incidents of the morning and each related the story of his or her sport after the meal mrs norton decided to rest for the ride and the long walk with her gun had tired her the servant spread a rug for her under the trees and placed a camel saddle for her to recline against then carrying away the empty dishes plates glasses and cutlery they retired out of sight are you sure you don't mind being left alone mrs norton asked wargrave not in the least do go and shoot again she replied smiling up at him i'm very comfortable and i'm glad to have a good rest before undertaking that tiresome ride back it's very pleasant here the wind comes so cool and fresh off the water isn't it strong though 
the breeze had freshened to a gale and under the trees the temperature was quite bearable the resident had already gone out of sight over the rim of the basin having exhausted the neighborhood of the tank and being desirous of searching farther afield wargrave and raymond now followed him but soon separated the latter making for the cultivation again while his friend set off for the open plain ordinarily the heat would have been intense for the hours after noon up to three o'clock or later are the hottest of the day in india but the gale made it quite cool to wargrave tramping about unsuccessfully this time came frequently the sound of raymond's gun ray seems to be having all the luck he thought as through his field glasses he scanned the plain without seeing anything i'm getting fed up at last in despair he shouldered his rifle and turned back after a long walk he came in sight of the adjunct standing near the edge of the fields talking to norton when frank reached him he found that his friend had increased his bag very considerably well done old boy you'd better luck than i had he said then turning to the resident he continued how have you done sir nothing of any value replied norton have you finished we're thinking of going back now yes sir i am through by jove i'm thirsty i could do with a drink couldn't you ray rather my throat's like a lime kiln we'll join mrs norton and then have an ice drink while the camels are being saddled they strolled towards the lake which was hidden from their view by the rim of the basin as they reached the slight ridge that made all three stop dead and gazed in amazement as they reached the slight ridge that this made all three stopped dead and gazed in amazement what's happened to the tank exclaimed raymond the water's almost up to the trees good god my wife look look cried the resident they stood appalled the wide body of water had swept up to within a few yards of the trees under which mrs norton lay fast asleep and stealthily emerging from it a large crocodile was slowly cautiously crawling towards the unconscious woman end of chapter three Chapter Four of the Jungle Girl by Gordon Casserly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. A crocodile intervenes. Major Norton opened his mouth to cry a warning, but Wargrave grasped his arm and said hurriedly, "Don't shout, sir! Don't wake her!" she'll be too confused to move he then thrust his field glasses into the adjunct's hand watch for the strike of my bullet ray he said he threw himself at full length on the ground and pressed a cartridge into the breech of his rifle his companion stood over him as he cast a hurried glance forward and adjusted his sight muttering just about four hundred yards the crocodile was nearly broadside on to him and even at that distance he could see the scaly armor covering head back and sides that would defy any bullet the unprotected spot behind the shoulder was hidden from him the only vulnerable part was the neck wargrave laid his cheek to the butt and sighted on this the crocodile crept on inch by inch dragging its limbs forward with the slow stealthy movement of its kind when stalking their prey on land 
The horrified watchers saw that the terrible snout with its protruding fangs was barely a yard from Mrs. Norton's feet. Raymond's hands holding the glasses to his eyes trembled violently. The resident shook as with the palsy, and he stared in horror at the crawling death that threatened the sleeping woman. Wargrave fired. As the rifle rang out, the creeping movement ceased. "'You've hit him, I swear!' cried Raymond. "'I didn't see the bullet strike the ground.' Wargrave rapidly worked the bolt of his rifle, jerking out the empty case and pushing a fresh cartridge into the chamber. He fired again. "'That's got him! That must have gotten!' exclaimed Raymond. The crocodile lay still. Frank leapt to his feet and, rifle in hand, dashed down the incline. At that moment Mrs. Norton awoke, turned on her side, raised her body a little, and suddenly saw the horrible reptile. She sat up rigid with terror and stared at it. The brute slowly opened his huge mouth and disclosed the cruel, gapped teeth. Then the iron jaws clashed together. With a shriek, the woman sprang to her feet, but stood trembling, unable to move away. "'Run, run!' shouted Wargrave, springing down the slope towards her. Behind him raced Raymond, while her husband, who was unable to run fast, followed far behind. Mrs. Norton seemed rooted to the spot but she turned to Wargrave with outstretched arms and gasped, Save me, Frank! Save me! With a bound he reached her, and, as she clung to him convulsively, panted out, It's all right, dear. You're safe now. He pushed her behind him, and bringing the rifle to his shoulder, faced the crocodile. The brute opened and shut its great jaws, seeming to gasp for air, while a strange whistling sound came from its throat. Its body appeared to be paralyzed. It can't move. You've broken its spine, cried Raymond, as he reached them. Your first shot it must have been. Look, your second's torn its throat. He pointed to the neck and went round to the other side. From a jagged, gaping wound where the expanding bullet had torn the throat, the blood spurted and air whistled out with a shrill sound. Wargrave turned to Violet and took the terrified woman, who seemed on the point of fainting, in his arms. "'All right, little girl, it's all right.' the brute's done for. She pulled herself together with an effort and looked nervously at the crocodile. Then she released herself from Frank's clasp and said, smiling feebly, What a coward I am. I'm ashamed of myself. Where's John? Oh, here he is. Doesn't he look funny? The resident, very red-faced and out of breath, had slowed down into a shambling walk and was puffing and blowing like a grampus. As he came up to them, he sputtered, Is it safe? Is it dead? It's harmless now, sir, answered Raymond. It's still living, but it can't move. The spine's broken, I think. The resident turned to his wife. The poor man had been in agony while she was in danger, but now that the peril had paused, he could only express his relief in irritable scolding. How could you be so foolish, Violet? he asked crossly. The idea of going to sleep near the tank. Most unwise. You might have been eaten alive. His wife smiled bitterly and glanced at the grumbling man with a contemptuous expression on her face. Yes, John, very inconsiderate of me, I dare say. But how was I to know that there was a mugger crocodile in the tank? 
then for the first time she realized the nearness of the water good gracious i thought i was much farther how did i get so close to it did i slip down in my sleep no there are the trees said raymond it's extraordinary the whole tank seems to have shifted the resident was mopping his bald scalp and lifted his hat to let the gusty wind cool his head a sudden squall blew the big pith sun helmet out of his hand wargrave caught it in the air and returned it to its owner by jove it's a regular gale he said i think i know what's happened this wind's so strong that it's blown the water of the tank before it and actually shifted the whole mass thirty or forty yards this way yes i've known that to occur before with shallow ponds said raymond i've heard the passage of the red sea by the israelites and the drowning of pharaoh's army explained the same way it's said that the crossing really took place at one extremity of the bitter lake through which the suez canal passes major norton was staring at the far end of the tank now left bare there may be some interesting insects stranded on the bottom uncovered by the receding water he said abstractedly and was moving away to search for them when wargrave said disgustedly don't you think sir that as mrs norton has had such a shock the sooner we get off the better yes yes very true but you can order the camels to be saddled while i'm having a look replied the enthusiastic collector i really must go and see there may be some very interesting specimens there and he hurried away his wife smiled rather bitterly as he went then she turned to the two subalterns but tell me what happened how did the mugger come here how was i saved raymond rapidly narrated what had taken place violet looked at wargrave with glistening eyes and held out her hands to him so you saved my life how can i thank you she said gratefully her lips trembled a little frank took her hands in his but answered lightly oh it was nothing anyone else would have done the same i happened to be the only one with a rifle raymond turned away quickly and walked over to the crocodile neither of them took any notice of him violet gazed fondly at wargrave i owe you so much frank so very much she murmured in a low voice you've made my life worth living and now you make me live he was embarrassed but he pressed the hands he held in his he then released them and tried to speak lightly shall i have the mugger skinned and get a dressing bag made out of his hide for you he said smiling that be a nice souvenir of the brute she shuddered i don't want to remember him she cried turning to glance at the crocodile horrid beast i can't bear the sight of him the mugger certainly looked a most repulsive brute as it lay stretched on the ground its jaws occasionally opening shutting spasmodically the blood from its wounded throat spreading in a pool on the sun-baked earth it was evidently an old beast and skull and back were covered with thick horny plates and bosses through which no bullet could penetrate the big teeth studded irregularly in the cruel jaws were yellow and worn as were the thick nails tipping the claws at the ends of the powerful limbs the devil's not dead yet shall i put another bullet into him said wargrave 
it's only wasting a cartridge replied his friend he can't do any more harm when the men come we'll have him cut open and see what he's got inside him violet shuddered oh do you think he has ever eaten any human being she asked gazing with loathing at the huge reptile judging from the way he stalked you i should think he has answered raymond hello here comes one of the camel drivers with some of the villagers they'll be able to tell us about him on the rim of the basin appeared a group of natives moving in their direction suddenly they caught sight of the crocodile stopped and pointed to it and began to talk excitedly one of the local peasants ran back shouting the rest hurried down for a closer view of the reptile a chorus of wonder rose from them as they stood round it the mahomodian camel driver exclaimed in hindustani awi bahai kia janwar puka shaitan a brother what an animal a veritable devil as the villagers spoke only the dialect of the state raymond used this man as interpreter and questioned them about the crocodile they asserted that it had inhabited the tank for many years hundreds said one man it had to their certain knowledge killed several women incautiously bathing or drawing water from the tank as women are not valued highly by the poor er hindus this did not make the mugger very unpopular but early in that very year it had committed the awful crime of dragging under water and devouring a brahmi bull an animal devoted to the gods and held sacrosanct by this time the crocodile had breathed his last raymond measured it roughly and found it to be over twelve feet in length the peasants turned the great body on its back wargrave saw that the skin underneath was too thick to be made into leather so he bade them cut the belly open the stomach contained many shells of freshwater crabs and crayfish as well as a surprising amount of large pebbles either taken for digestive purposes or swallowed when the fish were being scooped up off the bottom but further search resulted in the finding of several heavy brass or copper anklets and amulets such as are worn by indian women some have evidently been a long time in the reptile's interior when the camels had come and the party was preparing to mount and start back home a crowd of villagers led by their old priest bore down upon them learning that frank was the slayer of the sacrilegious crocodile the holy man hung a garland of marigolds round his neck and through the interpreter offered him the thanks of gods and men for his good deed and to a chorus of blessings and compliments he rode away with his companions so ended the incident apparently but consequences undreamed of by any of the actors in it flowed from it for imperceptibly it brought a change into the relations between mrs norton and wargrave and eventually altered them completely at first it merely seemed to strengthen their friendship and increase the feeling of intimacy to violet they were violet and frank to each other now the saving of her life constituted a bond that could never be severed he had preserved her from a horrible death and she owed wargrave more than gratitude hitherto she had often toyed with the idea of him as a lover 
and the thought had been a pleasant one but it had hardly occurred to her to be in love with him in return in all her life up to now she had never known what it was to really love she had married without affection her girlhood had been passed without the mildest flirtation for she had been brought up in a quiet country village where there never seemed to be any bachelors of her own class between the ages of seventeen and fifty even the curate was gray-haired and married she had made up for this deprivation during the voyage out to india and her season in calcutta but although she found many men ready to flirt with her norton's proposal was the only serious one that she had and she accepted him in desperation she had never felt any love for him she did not realize that he had any for her for although he really entertained a sincere affection of a kind for her it was so seldom and so badly expressed that she was never aware of its existence since her marriage she had had several careless flirtations during her visits to her relatives in calcutta but her heart was not seriously affected she never acknowledged to herself that any gratitude or loyalty was due from her to her husband on the contrary she felt that she owed him as well as fate a grudge she was young warm-blooded of a passionate temperament yet she found herself wedded to a man who apparently needed a housekeeper not a wife her husband did not appear to realize that a woman is not essentially different to a man that she has feelings desires passions just as he has although by a polite fiction the prudish anglo-saxon races seem to agree to regard her as of a more spiritual more ethereal and less earthy a nature yet it is only a fiction after all violet was a living woman a creature of flesh and blood who was not content to be a chattel a household ornament a piece of furniture it was not to be wondered at that she longed to enter into woman's kingdom to exercise the power of her sex to sway the other and to experience a thrill of the realization of that power often in her loneliness she pined to see eyes she loved look with love into hers she was not a marble statue it was but natural that she should long for love a lover the clasp of strong arms the pressure of a man's broad chest against her bosom the feel of burning kisses on her lips the glorious surrender of her whole being to some adored one to whom she was the universe who lived but for her now for the first time in her life her errant dreams took concrete shape at last she began to feel the companionship of a particular man necessary for her happiness she had never before realized the pleasure the joy to be derived from the presence of one of the opposite sex who was in sympathy in perfect harmony with her nature in her lonely hours and they were many she thought constantly of wargrave his face was ever before her his voice sounding in her ears she usually saw her husband absorbed in his work and studies only at meals and as she looked across the table at him then she could not help contrasting the heavy unattracted man sitting silent usually reading a book while he ate 
with the good-looking laughter-loving playfellow who had come into her life she learned to daydream of wargrave to watch for his coming and hate his going to enjoy every moment of his presence he had brought a new interest into her hitherto purposeless life the life he had preserved and that consequently seemed to belong to him new feelings awakened in her the world was a happier brighter place than it had been it pleased her to realize what it all meant to know that the novel sensations the fluttering hopes and fears the strange delightful thrills were all symptoms of that longed-for malady that comes sooner or later to all women she knew at last that she loved wargrave and gloried in the knowledge and she never doubted that he loved her in return did he it was hard to tell to a man the thought of love in the abstract seldom occurs and the realization of the concrete fact that he is in love with some particular woman generally comes somewhat as a shock he is by nature a lover of freedom and in theory at least resents fetters even silken ones and wargrave had never thought of analyzing his feelings towards violet he was not a professional amorist and although not a puritan would never set himself deliberately to make love to a married woman under her husband's roof he was fond of mrs norton as a sister he thought she was a delightful friend a real pal so understanding so companionable he said to himself frequently it had not occurred to him that his feelings for her might be love he had often before been on terms of friendship with women married and single but none of them had ever attracted him as much as she did he had never felt any desire to be married domesticity did not appeal to him but now as he watched violet moving about her drawing-room or playing to him he found himself thinking that it would be pleasant to return to his bungalow from parade and find a pretty little wife waiting to greet him with a smile and a kiss and the wife of his dreams always had violet's face wore smart well-cut frocks like violet's and showed just such shapely silken-clad legs and ankles and such small feet in dainty silver-buckled high-heeled shoes and he thought with an inward groan that such a luxury was not for a debt-ridden subaltern like him that his heavy mortgaged pay would not run to expensive gowns silk stockings and costly footwear yet it never occurred to him that violet cared for him nor did it enter his mind to try to win her love but he felt that he would do much to make her happy that saving her life made him in a way responsible for it in future and he knew that she was not a contented woman his sympathy went out to her for what he guessed she must suffer from her ill assorted union but soon he had no need to surmise it for before long violet began to confide all her sorrows to him and the recital made his heart bleed for one so young and beautiful mated to a selfish wretch who as blind to her suffering as he was to her charm the younger man's chivalry was up in arms and he felt that such a bore did not deserve so bright a jewel at times frank was tempted to confront the callous husband 
and force him to open his dulled eyes to the bravely borne misery of his neglected wife and realize how fortunate he ought to consider himself in being the owner of such a transcendent being but the next moment the infatuated youth was convinced that norton was incapable of appreciating so rare a woman that only a nature like his own could understand or do full justice to the perfections of hers such is a young man's conceit he rejoiced to know that his poor sympathy could help in a measure to make up to violet for the happiness that she declared that she had missed in life and so he gladly consented to play the consoler and she for the pleasure of being consoled continued to pour out her griefs to him but if frank was unconscious of the danger of his post as sympathizing confidant to another man's young and pretty wife others were not her husband of course was as blind as most husbands seem to be in anglo-indian society for in that land of the household of three the eternal triangle it is almost a recognized principle that every married woman who is at all attractive is entitled to have one particular bachelor always in close attendance on her to be constantly at her beck and call to ride with her to drive her every afternoon to tennis or golf or watch polo then on to the club and sit with her there his duty a pleasant one no doubt is to cheer up her otherwise solitary dinner in her bungalow on the nights when her neglectful husband is dining out en garçon no cavalier servant of old italy ever had so busy a time as the tame cat of the india of to-day and the husband allows it nay seems as major norton did to hail his presence with relief as it eases the conscience of the selfish lord and master who leaves his spouse much alone but if the resident saw no harm or danger in the young officer constantly seeking the society of his pretty wife others did at first frank's well-wishers tried to hint to him that there was likelihood of his friendship with her being misunderstood but he laughed at raymond's badly expressed warning and rather resented major hepburn's kindly advice when on one occasion his company commander spoke plainly though tactfully to him on the subject then violet's enemies took a hand in the game mrs trevor having failed to decoy him to her bungalow for what she called a quiet tea and a motherly little chat concerned him one afternoon when he was on his way to the residency and spoke very openly to him of the risk he ran of being entangled in the coils of such an outrageous coquette as that mrs norton as she termed her frank was so indignant at her abuse of his friend that for the first time in his life he was rude to a woman and snubbed mrs trevor so severely that she went in a rage to her husband and insisted on taking immediate steps to arrest the progress of a scandal that she declared would attract the unfavorable attention of the higher military authorities to the regiment do you realize william that you will be the one to suffer said the angry woman if anything happens if major norton complains if that shameless creature succeeds in making that foolish young man run away with her you will be blamed 
you can't afford it you know that the general's confidential report on you last year was not too favorable it wasn't really bad my dear it only hinted that i lacked decision pleaded the henpecked man exactly you are not firm enough persisted his domestic tyrant they will say that you should have put your foot down at once and stopped this disgraceful affair but what can i do asked the colonel helplessly someone ought to speak to major norton at once oh my dear jane i couldn't i daren't for two pins i'd do it myself mrs baird said the other day that it was our duty as respectable women no 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 jane you mustn't think of it exclaimed the alarmed man i forbid you you mustn't mix yourself up in the affair it would be committing me then send that impertinent young man away said mrs trevor firmly no general would have accused her of lack of decision i used to have a high opinion of him once but after his insolence to me i believe him to be nearly as bad as the woman where can i send him asked the worried colonel he has done all the courses and passed all the classes and examinations he can i know you have only to write confidently to the staff and inform them that young wardgrave's removal to another station is absolutely necessary to prevent a scandal and they'll send him off somewhere else at once her husband nodded his head he was well aware of the fact that the army in india looks closely after the behavior and morals of its officers that a colonel has only to hint that the transfer of a particular individual under his command is necessary to stop a scandal and without loss of time that officer finds himself deported to the other side of the country one morning a week after mrs trevor's conversation with her husband wargrave superintending the musketry of his double company on the rifle range was given an official note from the adjunct informing him that the commanding officer desired to see him at once in the orderly room as major hepburn was not present frank handed the men over to the senior indian company commander and rode off to the regimental office wondering as he went what could be the reason of the sudden summons reaching the building he found raymond on the watch for him while ostensibly engaged in criticizing to the battalion dursey taylor the fit of the new uniforms of several recruits i say ray what's up asked his friend cheerily as he swung himself out of the saddle the adjunct nodded warningly towards the orderly room and dropped his voice as he replied i don't know old chap the c o s said nothing to me but he's in there with hepburn trying to work himself up into a rage so that he can bully rag you properly you better go in and get it over wargrave entered the big color-washed room the colonel was seated at his desk frowning at a paper before him and did not look up major hepburn was standing behind his chair and glanced commiseratingly at the subaltern frank stood to attention and saluted good morning sir he said you wanted to see me colonel trevor did not reply but turning slightly in his chair said major hepburn call in the adjunct please as the second-in-command went out on the veranda and summoned raymond 
wargrave's heart misgave him he had no idea of what the matter was but the colonel's manner and presence of the second in command were ominous signs he wondered what crime he was going to be charged with shut the doors raymond said the commanding officer curtly as the adjunct entered the latter did so and sat down at his writing table glancing anxiously at his friend colonel trevor's lips were twitching nervously and he seemed to experience a difficulty in finding his voice at last he took up a paper from his desk and said mr wargrave this is a telegram just received from western army headquarters it says lieutenant wargrave is appointed to number twelve battalion frontier military police direct him to proceed forthwith to report to o c detachment ranga duar eastern bengal end of chapter four chapter number five of the jungle girl by gordon casserly this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c sentence of exile at the words of the telegram raymond started and frank stared in bewilderment at the colonel but i never asked for the military police sir he exclaimed i the colonel licked his dry lips and working himself up into a passion shouted no you didn't but i did i applied for you to be sent to it i asked for you to be transferred from this station you can ask yourself the reason why i will not tolerate conduct such as yours sir i will not have an officer like you under my command frank flushed deeply i beg your pardon sir i don't understand i really don't know what i have done i should but the colonel burst in furiously he says he doesn't know what he's done major hepburn listen to that he does not know what he's done and the speaker pounded on the desk with his clenched fist working himself up into a rage as a weak man will do when he has to carry out an unpleasant task but sir surely i have a right began wargrave clenching his hands until the nails were almost driven into his palms in an effort to keep his temper i cannot argue the question with you wargrave said the colonel loftily you have got your orders headquarters approve of my action i have discussed the matter with my second in command and he agrees with me you can go raymond make out the necessary warrants for mr wargrave's journey and give him an advance of a month's pay he will leave to-morrow tell the quartermaster to make the necessary arrangements frank bit his lip his years of discipline and the respect for authority ingrained in him since his entrance to sandhurst kept the mutinous words back he saluted punctiliously and turned about smartly walked out of the orderly room in the glaring sunshine he strode out of the compound and down the white dusty road to his bungalow his brain in a whirl blind to everything seeing neither the sepoys saluting him nor his scythe hurrying after him and dragging the pony by the bridle when he reached his house he entered the sitting-room and dropped into a chair his boy approached salamanning and asked if he should go to the mess to order the sahib's breakfast to be got ready wargrave waved him away impatiently he sat staring unseeingly at the wall he could not think coherently he felt dazed 
his bewildered brain seemed to be revolving endlessly round the thought of the telegram from headquarters and the colonel's words i will not have an officer like you under my command what was the meaning of it all what had he done a pang shot through him at the sudden remembrance of colonel trevor's assertion that major hepburn agreed with him frank held the second in command in high respect for he knew him to be an exceptionally good soldier and a gentleman in every sense of the word had he so disgraced himself then that hepburn considered the colonel's action justified but how he shifted uneasily in his chair and his eyes fell on mrs norton's portrait at the sight of it his company commander's advice to him about her and mrs trevor's spiteful remarks flashed across his mind could violet be mixed up in all of this was his friendship with her perhaps the cause of the trouble he dismissed the idea at once there was nothing to be ashamed of in their relations a figure darkened the doorway it was raymond wargrave sprang up and rushed to him what in heaven's name is it all about ray he cried is the colonel mad the adjunct took off his helmet and flung it on the table well tell me what the devil have i done said his friend impatiently raymond tried to speak but failed go on man what is it cried wargrave seizing his arm the adjunct burst out it's a damn shame old man i'm sorry but what is it what is it i say cried wargrave shaking him the adjunct nodded his head towards the big photograph on the writing table it's mrs norton he said mrs norton echoed his friend what the what's she got to do with it raymond threw himself into a chair someone's been making mischief the c o s been told that there might be a scandal so he's got scared lest trouble should come to him frank stared blankly at the speaker then suddenly turned and walked out of the bungalow the pony was standing huddled into the patch of shade at the side of the house the cease squatting on the ground at its head and holding the reins wargrave sprang into the saddle and galloped out of the compound raymond ran to the veranda and saw him thundering down the sandy road that led to the residency arriving at the big white building frank pulled up his panting pony on its haunches and dismounting threw the reins over its head and left it unattended walking to the hall door he cried kohai a drowsy shupasi at the back of the hall sprang up and hurried to receive him mem sahib hi is the mistress in hi sahib yes sir said the servant salamanning wargrave was free of the house and taking off his hat went into the cool hall and walked up the great staircase he entered the drawing-room after the blinding glare outside the closely shuttered apartment seemed so dark that at first it was difficult for him to see if it were tenanted or not but it was empty and he paced the floor impatiently frowning in chaotic thought good morning frank you are early to-day and what a bad temper you seem to be in exclaimed a laughing voice and mrs norton looking radiant and delightfully cool in a thin white madras muslin dress entered the room he went to her they're sending me away violet he said sending you away she repeated in an astonished tone sending you where to hell i think he cried oh i beg your pardon i mean yes they're sending me away from rohar from you 
sending me to the other side of india the blood slowly left her face as she stared uncomprehendingly at him sending you away why she asked because because we're friends little girl because we're friends she echoed what do you mean but you mustn't go i must i can't help it i've got to go pale as death violet stared at him got to go to leave me then with a choking cry she threw her arms about his neck and sobbed you mustn't you mustn't leave me i can't live without you i love you i love you i'll die if you go from me frank started and tried to hold her at arm's length to look into her face but the woman clung frenziedly to him while convulsive sobs shook her body his arms went round her instinctively and holding her to his breast he stared blankly over the beautiful bowed head it was true then she loved him without meaning it he had won her heart whose earnest wish it had been to save her from pain to console her to brighten her lonely life he had brought this fresh sorrow on her to the misery of a loveless marriage he had added a heavier cross an unhappy a misplaced affection no exultant vanity within him rejoiced at the knowledge that unsought she had learned to care for him only regret pity for her stirred in him he was aware now as always that his feeling for her was not love but she must not realize it he must save her from the bitter mortification of learning that she was given her heart unasked his must have been the fault he it must be to bear the punishment she should never know the truth he bent down and reverently tenderly kissed the tear-stained face it was the first time that his lips had touched her dearest we will go together you must come with me he said violet started and looked wildly up at him go with you what do you mean how can i i mean that you must come away with me to begin a new life a happier one together i cannot leave you here with a man who neglects you who does not appreciate you who cannot understand you do you mean run away with you she asked yes it's the only thing to do she slowly loosened her clasp of him and released herself from his arms but i don't understand at all why are you going and where he briefly told her what had happened his face flushed darkly as he repeated the colonel's words he wouldn't have an officer like me under his command he said he treated me like a criminal i don't value his opinion much but major hepburn agrees with him that hurts i respect him but where is this place they're sending you to she asked rangadar i don't know eastern bengal i believe bengal what anywhere near calcutta no it must be somewhere up on the frontier otherwise they wouldn't send military police to garrison it but what is it like is it a big station she persisted i can't tell you but it's sure not to be no it must be a small place up in the hills or in the jungle there's only a detachment there but what have i got to do with your being sent there she asked in perplexity don't you understand someone's been making mischief he replied those two vile-minded women have been talking scandal of us to the colonel what 
talking about you and me oh she exclaimed his words brought home to her the fact that these bitter-tongued women who she despised had dared to assail her her the burra mem the great lady of their little world had dared to she could not silence them and what would they say of her how their tongues would wag if she ran away from her husband and they would have a right to talk scandal of her then the thought made her pause but how could i go with you to this place in bengal where could i live she asked you'd live with me oh in your bungalow how could i and how would i get there she continued i haven't any money i don't suppose i've got a ten rupee note and i couldn't ask my husband of course not i would he paused by jove i never thought of that it had not occurred to him that elopements must be carried out on a cash basis he had forgotten that money was necessary and he had none he was heavily in debt the local scroffs the native money lenders would give him no more credit when they knew that he was going away all that he would have would be the one month's advance of pay probably not enough for violet's fare and expenses across india the government provided his and certainly not enough to support them for long he frowned in perplexity running away with another man's wife did not seem so easy after all violet was the first to recover her normal calm sit down and let us talk quietly she said one of the servants may come in or my husband if people are talking scandal of us she touched the switch of an overhead electric fan the government of india housed its political officer in rohar much more luxuriously than the military ones and sat down under it wargrave began to pace the room impatiently come frank stop walking about like a tiger in a cage and let's discuss things properly with an effort he pulled himself together and took a chair near her the woman was more self-possessed of the two the shock of suddenly finding herself up against the logical outcome of her desires had sobered her and faced with the prospect of an immediate flight involving the abdication of her assured social position and the surrender of a home she was able to visualize the consequences of her actions the most sobering reflection was the thought that by so doing she would be casting herself to the female wolves of her world and she knew the extent of their mercy there were others of her acquaintance besides mrs trevor who would howl loud with triumph over her downfall the thought has saved many a woman from social ruin thinking only of what she had so often told him of the misery of living with a man as unsympathetic as her husband frank pleaded desperately with a conviction that he was far from feeling the hard fact of the lack of sufficient money to pay for her travelling expenses the difficulty of getting off together from this out-of-the-way station were not to be got over then the impossibility of knowing whether she could remain with him when he was on frontier duty and of supporting her away from him the realization of the fact that they would have to face the divorce court with its heavy costs and probably crushing damages all made the situation seem hopeless in despair he sprang up and resumed his nervous pacing of the room at last violet said all i can see dearest 
is that we must wait it will be harder for me than for you you at least will not have to live with anyone uncongenial to you but i must yet i can bear it for your sake he stopped before her and looked at her in admiration of her courageous and self-sacrificing spirit then he bent down and kissed her tenderly sitting beside her he discussed the situation more calmly than he had hitherto done it was finally agreed that he was to go alone to his new station save all that he could to pay off his debts he would receive a higher salary in the military police and his expenses would be less and when he was free and made a home for her violet would sacrifice everything for love and come to him with almost tears in his eyes as he thought of her nobility he strained her to his heart when the time came for parting the woman broke down completely and wept bitterly as she clung to him he kissed her passionately then with an effort put her from him and almost ran from the room while she flung herself on a lounge and sobbed convulsively one of the residency ceases had taken charge of the pony and wargrave mounting it galloped madly back to his bungalow his heart torn with anguish for the unhappiness of the broken-hearted woman that he was leaving behind when he arrived home he found that raymond and his own boy and sword orderly his native soldier servant had begun his packing for him for his heavy baggage had to be dispatched that afternoon the bungalow was crowded with his brother officers waiting to see him he had intended to avoid them for he felt disgraced by the colonel's censure which it was evident the commanding officer had not kept secret though the whole matter should have been treated as confidential but they made light of the scruples and showed him that he had their sympathy he had meant to dine alone in his room that night but his comrades insisted on his coming to the mess where they were to give him an informal farewell dinner they would take no refusal daly who was the acting quartermaster of the battalion told him that the arrangements for his journey had been made he was to leave at dawn and drive sixty miles in a tonga a two-wheeled native conveyance drawn by a pair of ponies to a village called bas d on the shores of a narrow gulf or deep inlet of the sea which formed the eastern boundary of the state of manha here he would have to spend the night in a dak bungalow or rest house and cross the water in a steam launch the next morning after that five days more of travel by various routes and means awaited him before dinner that night a few minutes apart with hepburn made frank happier than he had been all day for his company commander told him that he had only agreed with the colonel's action because he believed that it would be for the subaltern's own good not because he considered that the latter had done anything to disgrace him hepburn added that if he was given command of the regiment in two years time as should happen in the ordinary course of events he would be glad to have wargrave back again in the battalion then frank with a guilty feeling when he remembered his compact with violet thanked him gratefully and with a lightened heart went to the very festive meal that was to be his last for some long time at least with his old corpse the colonel had refused to agree to his being invited formally 
to be the guest of the regiment and neither he nor the other married man the doctor were present if they slept that night they were the only two officers in the cantonment that did for none of the others not even senior major hepburn left the mess until it was time to escort their departing comrade to his bungalow to change for the journey and as the tonga ponies rattled down the road and bore him away frank's last sight of his old comrades was the group of white-clad figures in the dawn waving frantically and cheering vociferously from the gateway of his bungalow the memory of it rejoiced him throughout the terrible hours of the long journey in the baking heat and blinding glare of the hot weather day the worst moments were the stops every ten miles to change ponies where he had to wait in the blazing sunshine his boy who sat on the front seat of the vehicle beside the driver produced from a basket packed with wet straw cooled bottles of soda water without which wargrave felt that he would have died of sunstroke then on after each halt and the endless strip of white road again unrolled before him while the never-ceasing clank of the iron-shod bar coupling the ponies maddened his aching head with its monotonous rhythm as the weary miles slid past him his thoughts were with violet so beautiful so patient and brave in her self-denying endurance and he cursed himself for having added to her pain and inwardly vowed that some day he would atone to her for it at last the tonga rattled into the bare compound of the basidi dak bungalow standing on a high stone plinth the untidy kansama the custodian of the rest home hurried on to the veranda to greet the unexpected visitor and show his boy where to put the sahib's bedding and baggage in a bleak room with a cane bottom wooden bed hung with torn mosquito curtains from a glass case in the sitting-room containing a scanty store of canned provisions the can sama provided a meal with such ill-assorted ingredients as somebody's desiccated soup lukewarm a tin of sardines and sweet biscuits to eat with them and a bottle of beer to wash it down with wargrave was too choked with dust too sickened with the heat and glare to have any appetite after a smoke he dragged his weary body to bed and in spite of the mosquitoes that flocked joyously through the holes in the gauze curtains to feast on him slept the profound sleep of utter exhaustion he was up at daybreak for the tide served in the early morning and only at its height could the launch approach the shore which at low water was boarded with the filthy slime of mangrove swamps landed at the other side of the gulf he had even a worse experience of travel before him than on the previous day for the next stage of the journey was forty miles across a salt desert in a tram drawn by a camel the car was open on all sides and covered by a cardboard roof and its wooden seats were uncomfortably hard for long hours of sitting the heat was appalling it struck up from the baked ground and seemed to scorch the body through the clothes the glare from the white sand and even whiter patches of salt was blinding and penetrated through the closed eyelids a hot wind blew over the hazy shimmering desert setting the whirling dust devils dancing and striking the face like the touch of a heated iron 
wargrave's small store of ice and mineral water was exhausted and he felt that he was likely to die of thirst for in the villages where they changed camels chlorea was raging and he dared not drink the water from their wells the tram slid easily along the shining rails that stretched away out of sight over the monotonous plain the camel loping lazily along its soft sprawling feet falling noiselessly on the sand the last ten miles of the way lay through less sterile country and the tram passed herds of black buck the pretty spiral horned antelope used to its daily passage the graceful animals which were protected by the game laws of the native state through which the line ran barely troubled to move out of the, its way they stood about in hundreds staring lazily at it some not ten yards off the bucks turning their heads away to scratch their sides with the points of their horns or rubbing their noses with dainty hooves that night wargrave slept at a dak bungalow near the terminus in a little native town with a small branch railway connecting it with a main line then for four days he travelled across the scorching plains of india shut up in stuffy carriages with violet-hued glass windows and venetian wooden shutters meant to exclude the heat and glare over bare plains broken by sudden flat-topped rocky hills through closely cultivated fields and stretches of scrub jungle by mud-walled villages he journeyed day and night the train crossed countless wide river beds in which the streams had shrunk to mean rivulets but when it clattered over the ganges at allahabad the sacred flood rolled a broad and sluggish current under the bridge on its way to the far distant bay of bengal on the fourth night wargrave slept on a bench in the waiting-room of a small junction near alda from which a narrow gauge railway branched off to the north from the main line through eastern bengal at an early hour next morning he took his seat in the one first-class carriage of the toy train was journeyed through typical bengal scenery by mud banked rice fields groves of tall feathery bamboos and hamlets of pretty palm thatched huts their roofs hidden by the broad green leaves of sprawling creepers soon across the sky to the north a dark blurred line rose stretching out of sight east and west it grew clearer as the train sped on more distinct it was the great northern rampart of india the himalayas then seeming to float in air high above the highest of the dark mountain peaks and utterly detached from them the white crests of the eternal snows shone fairy-like against the blue sky as wargrave gazed enraptured suddenly hills and plains were shut out from his sight as the train plunged from the dazzling sunlight into the deep shadows of a tropical forest and the subaltern recognized with a thrill of delight that he was entering the wonderful terai jungle the marvelous belt of woodland that stretches for hundreds of miles along the foot of the himalayas through assam and bengal to the far siwalik range clothed their lower slopes or scaling their steep sides into nepal and bhutan deep in its recesses the rhinoceros bison and buffalo hide herds of wild elephants roam tigers prey on the countless deer 
and the great mountain bears descend to prowl in it for food frank had learned the, on the way that ranga duar was practically situated in it and the knowledge almost consoled him for his exile in the promise of sport that kings might envy at a small wayside station in a clearing in the forest his railway journey ended beside the one small stone building two elephants were standing incessantly swinging their trunks flapping their ears and shifting their weight restlessly from leg to leg frank on getting out of his carriage learned with pleasure from their salamanning mahouts drivers that these animals were to be his next means of transport a novel one that harmonized with the surroundings on the back of each great beast was a massive straw-filled pad secured by a rope passing sir single wise around its body each mahout carried a gun one a heavy rifle the other a double-barreled fowling piece which they offered to wargrave Hazor, the presence a polite mode of address in hindustani said one man the burra sahib the political sahib sends salams and lends you these as you might see something to shoot on the way oh the political officer very kind of him i'm sure remarked the subaltern what is his name Durumut sahib what a curious name thought frank for in the vernacular Durumut means do not be afraid he concluded that it was a nickname why is he called that he asked in hindustani because the sahib is a very brave sahib replied the man where he is there no one need fear the other mahout nodded assent then said the commanding sahib has sent your honor from the mess a basket with food and drink i have put it on the table in the baboo's clerk's office in the station frank blessed his new c o for his thoughtfulness and made a welcome meal while he watched his baggage being loaded on to one of the elephants booth lie down cried the mahout and the obedient animal slowly sank to its knees and stretched out its legs before and behind frank's boy mounted timorously when the luggage had been strapped on to the pad when the subaltern was ready the second elephant was ordered to kneel down for him and he clambered up awkwardly and clung on tightly when the mahout getting astride of the great neck made it rise along a broad road cut through the forest the huge beast lumbered with a plunging swaying stride that was very tiring to a novice holding both guns frank glanced continually ahead aside and behind him with a delicious feeling of excited hope that at any moment some dangerous wild beast might appear on either hand the dense undergrowth of great flower-covered bushes and curving fan-shaped palms restricted the view to a few yards from its dense tangle rose the giant trunks of huge trees their leafy crowns striving to push through the thick the thick canopy of vegetation overhead into the life-giving air and sunshine but no wild animal appeared to cheer wargrave on the long way and as hour after hour went by his whole body ached with the strain of sitting upright without a support to his back and being jolted violently at every step of the elephant at last they reached a clearing in the forest where stood the mahout's huts and a tall wooden building the peel kahana 
or elephant stables it lay at the foot of the mountains and from here the road wound upwards among the lower hills under steep cliffs by the brink of precipices and beside deep ravines down which brawling streams tumbled as the party mounted higher and even higher the big trees fell away behind them until frank could look down on a sea of foliage stretching away out of sight east and west but bounded on the south by the plains of india seen vaguely through the shimmering heat haze up up they climbed until far above him he caught glimpses of buildings dotted about among jungle-clad knolls and spurs jutting out from the dark face of the mountains and at last as evening shadows began to lengthen they reached a lovely recess in the hills a deep horse shoe and in it an artificially leveled parade ground a rifle range running up a gully a few bungalows dotted about among the trees and lines of single-storied barracks enclosed by a loop-holed stone wall told wargrave that he had come to his journey's end this was his place of exile this was ranga duwar end of chapter five chapter six of the jungle girl by gordon casserly this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c a border outpost what a beautiful spot thought frank as he gazed entranced at the scenery i've never seen anything like it it looks like heaven after the ugliness of rohar and how delightfully cool it is too up in the mountains well with this climate and good shooting in the forest below life won't be as dreadful as i thought i wish poor violet were here out of the heat and glare how she'd love all this beauty these trees these gardens the glorious mountains he sighed as he thought of the woman who was so far away Hazor, that is the mess broke in the voice of his mahout as he pointed to a long red-tiled building half hidden among the trees a few hundred feet above them to reach it they had to pass a large well-built stone bungalow two-storied unlike all the others and standing in a lovely garden glowing with the vivid hues of the flowers the flaming red of huge bushes of bougainvillea and poinsettia frank glancing towards it was about to ask the mahout who lived in it when he started in horror and cried to the man stop stop you animal look there and he snatched at his rifle for on the farther side of the house a huge tusker elephant in the garden stood over a little european boy about four years old who was sprawling almost under the huge feet and high above its head the brute held in its curved trunk a younger child a girl with long golden curls as if about to dash it to the ground as frank grasped the rifle the mahout who had turned at his cry seized the barrel and said with a smile duramut sahib do not fear sir those are duramut sahib's babies and the elephant is their playmate and as he spoke wargrave saw the elder child spring up from the ground and beat the great animal's legs with his tiny hands crying mooch ko be badsha mooch ko be uth uth me too badsh 
Me too, take me up. And the baby held aloft was crowing in glee and kicking its fat little legs frantically. The elephant lowered it tenderly to the ground and picked up the boy in its steed and lifted him into the air while he laughed and clapped his hands. The two mahouts raised their palms respectively to their foreheads and cried to their animals, Salam Kuro, salute. And the two trunks were lifted together in the Salamut, the royal salute given to kings and viceroys. Frank's mahout explained, Garib Parwar, protector of the poor the pagan ignorant hindus around here say that the elephant is a god a eh? and that his master duromut sahib is one too that's like enough well allah alone knows the truth of everything but those two are more than mere man and animal that is certain Mulmoti, go on, Pearl. And he kicked his elephant under the ears with his bare feet to quicken her pace. But Frank bade him stop. Despite the man's optimism, he could not believe it wise to allow tiny tots like that to play with such a huge, clumsy animal. He was sure that their mother would be horrified if she knew it. He loved children, and felt that it was madness to allow these babies to continue their dangerous pastime. Have they a mother? he asked the mahout. Yes, Huzor, the Mem Sahib lady, is doubtless within the house. I want to dismount, said Frank, as he grasped the Sir Ingle rope as the elephant sank jerkily to its knees. Then sliding down from the pad, he entered the gate and passed through the garden towards the bungalow. As he did so, a dainty little figure in white, a charmingly pretty girl with golden hair and blue eyes, came out on the veranda. Seeing him, she walked down the steps to meet him and held out her hand saying in a pleasant musical voice you are mr wargrave of course welcome to ranga Duar. frank uncomfortably curious of his disheveled appearance and travel-stained attire almost blushed as he took off his hat and quickened his steps to meet her wondering who this delightful young girl she looked about nineteen could be possibly an elder sister of the children outside. But as they shook hands, she said, I am the wife of the political officer here. My husband, Colonel Dermont, has just gone up to the mess to see your C.O., Major Hunt. Frank was astonished. The pretty young girl, scarcely more than a child herself, the mother of the two chubby babies, touched by her kind manner he shook her hand warmly and said thank you very much for your welcome mrs dermot it's awfully good of you and i i assure you i appreciate it a lot just now i was coming to tell you i wonder do you know that your babies i suppose they are yours are playing what seems to me rather a dangerous game with an elephant at the side of the house mrs dermot smiled and the dimples that came with the smile carried his mind back for an instant to violet yes they are my chicks she said i left them in bansha's charge frank was not altogether reassured the young mother evidently did not know what was happening but pardon me is it quite safe i was a bit scared when i saw them the animal was tossing them up in the air you needn't be alarmed mr wargrave 
though it's very good of you to be concerned and come tell me she replied but bad shah that's the elephant's name is a most careful nurse and i know that my babies are quite safe when they are in his care he has looked after them since they were able to crawl come and be introduced to him i must tell you that he is a very exceptional animal indeed we almost forgot that he is an animal he has saved our lives my husband's and mine on more than one occasion next to the children and me i think that kevin loves him better than anyone or anything else in the world and after my chicks and kevin and my brother i believe i do too as for the babies i'm not sure that he doesn't come first with them she led the way round the house and in spite of her assurances wargrave felt a little nervous when they came in sight of the strange nurse and its charges the tiny girl was seated on the ground tightly clasping one huge foreleg while the boy was beating the other with his little fists crying mukako uth peer peer lift me up again and again when he saw his mother he ran to her and said mummy bad naughty bansha won't lift me up he suddenly caught sight of the stranger and paused shyly brian darling this is a new friend and his mother bending down to him won't you shake hands with him the child conquered his shyness with an effort and walked over to frank holding out his little hand how do you do he said politely the subaltern gravely shook the proffered hand the little girl scrambled to her fat little legs and finger in mouth surveyed him solemnly then satisfied with her inspection she toddled forward to him and said tis me frank laughed joyously with all my heart you darling she cried this delightful welcome in the dreadful place of exile was inexpressibly cheering he swung the dainty mite up in his arms and kissed her she put her arms around his neck and hugged him me like oo she said you little flirt eileen exclaimed her mother laughing now it's badshaw's turn she walked to the elephant a splendid specimen of its race though it had only one tusk the right she held out her hand to it the long trunk shot out brushed her fingers and then her cheek with a light touch that was almost a caress she stroked the trunk affectionately now badshaw this is a new sahib frank with the baby girl seated on his shoulders stepped forward and extended his hand the animal smelt it and then laid its trunk for a moment on his free shoulder badshaw accepts you mr wargrave said mrs dermot seriously and there are few whom he takes too readily eileen with one arm around frank's neck stretched out the other to the elephant me love badsha she said the snake-like trunk lingered caressingly on her golden head the baby caught it and kissed it now then chickies time for bed said their mother say good night to badsha the little boy ran to the great animal and hugged its leg tightly while the snaky trunk touched the child's face affectionately come along brian let him go now and at his mother's bidding the boy released his clasp and ran to her good night badshah salam said mrs dermot waving her hand to the mammoth while her little daughter on wargrave's shoulder imitated her 
the big animal raised its trunk in salute and turning walked with swaying stride out of sight behind the bungalow by jove what a splendid beast exclaimed frank and how wonderfully well trained he is i'm not surprised now that you let the kiddies play with him mrs dermot smiled you would be even less so if you knew his story she said he is my husband's private property now the government of india presented him to kevin now come back to the house and have tea oh no after your long ride you'll prefer a whisky and soda i really rather have the tea i think mrs dermot i don't feel thirsty up in this deliciously cool air it's awful down in the plains now but what about my elephants and baggage tell the mahouts to go to the mess you are to have a room there frank did so and the two animals lumbered away up the hill after the mahouts had brought the colonel's guns into the bungalow mrs dermot led the way into the house the little boy had possessed himself of wargrave's free hand the other one being engaged in holding eileen who was perched on the subaltern's shoulder mrs dermot found it difficult to separate the children from their new friend when at last she bore them off to bed left to himself frank examined with deep interest and admiring envy the splendid display of colonel dermot's trophies of big game shooting that filled the bungalow from the walls many heads of bison and buffalo of sambler and bara singh those fine indian stags looked mildly at him with their glass eyes while tigers bears and panthers snarled at him from the ground long elephant tusks leaned in corners smoking and liqueur tables made up from the mammoth legs and feet stood about and crossed from ceiling to floor on the walls were the skins of enormous snakes such as frank had never seen or imagined he had thought a six-foot cobra or an eight-foot python long here were reptiles sixteen or eighteen feet in length and he hoped that he would never meet their equals alive in the jungle while he was gazing with admiration at the fine collection of trophies mrs dermot returned what a magnificent lot of heads and skins you've got here he exclaimed all your husbands i suppose she laughed as she glanced around the room while pouring out the tea that her butler had brought i'm afraid they make the house rather like a museum of natural history she answered yes they are all kevin's or nearly all there are a few of mine among them he looked at her in open admiration oh you shoot how splendid he said have you ever got a tiger a couple she replied smiling i envy you awfully he said i never even seen one out of a cage well if you are keen on shooting mr wargrave you ought to have little difficulty in begging a tiger or two before long she said i'd love to have the chance of going after big game i'm hoping for it here shall i i've never had any although i've shot a panther or two and a few black buck and chinkara you will have every opportunity of good sport here neither of the other two europeans your commanding officer and the doctor of your detachment go in for it 
the latter because his sight is very bad major hunt because he doesn't care for it i'm sure my husband will be glad to take you out with him and nobody in the whole terai knows more about big game than he by jove how ripping exclaimed frank eagerly would he i'm sure he would he'll be only too delighted to have someone for company i used to go with him always until my babies came now kevin has no one but badshaw badshaw oh yes that ripping elephant i don't know much about those animals but isn't it unusual for him to have only a single tusk yes badshaw is what the natives call a ganesh you know that ganesh is the hindu god of wisdom and is represented as having an elephant's head with only the right tusk consequently any of these animals born with a single tusk and that the right is considered sacred and looked upon as a god one of the mahouts said that the hindus here regard your husband as one too said frank and he seemed inclined to believe it himself i like the name they've given colonel dermot Dermot sahib fear not sahib a look of pride came in the young wife's eyes as she repeated the name softly to herself fear not sahib yes it suits him then aloud she continued i think you'll like my husband mr wargrave all men do he's a man's man the hill and jungle people worship him he understands them ah here he is i think her face brightened and frank saw the light of love shine in her eyes as she turned expectantly to the door he sprang up as a tall man with handsome clear-cut figures dark complexion and eyes and close-cropped black hair touched at the temples with gray entered the room with a pleasant smile the newcomer walked towards the subaltern with outstretched hand saying in a friendly voice glad to welcome you to ranga duar wargrave thank you very much sir replied frank gripping his hand and greatly taken at once by the political officer's appearance and friendly manner it was very kind of you to send those guns for me but i had no luck we saw nothing on the way after greeting him colonel dermot bent over his wife and kissed her fondly it was obvious to the subaltern that after their five years of married life they were lovers still frank looked at them a little enviously he wondered would it be so with violet and him after the same lapse of time for the sight of their happiness sent his thoughts flying to the woman who loved him are you keen on shooting wargrave said the colonel oh yes he is kevin broke in his wife i told him that i was sure you'd be glad to take him with you into the jungle sometimes i'd be happy to do so if you care to come with me wargrave said the colonel i'd love to sir it would be awfully good of you replied the subaltern eagerly but i've only a man leaker rifle ah you'll need a bigger bore than that but i can lend you a 470 high velocity cordite weapon you want something with great hitting power for dangerous game said dermot he went on to speak of the jungle and its 
denizens and his conversation was so interesting that wargrave forgot the flight of time until his hostess reminded him that he had to report his arrival to his commanding officer and find his new quarters her husband volunteered to show him the way to the mess and introduce him to major hunt as wargrave shook hands with mrs dermot she said i wanted to ask you to dinner this evening but kevin thought you might prefer to spend your first night with your brother officers but we shall expect you to-morrow when they are coming too on their way up the steep road from his bungalow the political officer spoke of the great forest below them and the sport to be found in it then he said it's lucky you like shooting wargrave for ranga dwar is very isolated and life is it dull to a person who has no resources still it has its advantages and chief among them is the climate it's delightful in the cold weather and pleasant in the hot by jove it is indeed sir it's like heaven after the heat in the plains below i don't know how i lived through it coming across india the rainy season is the hardest to bear we have five months of it and over three hundred inches of rain during them one never sees a strange face then not that we ever do have many visitors here at any time still you'd like your c o and burke the doctor is a capital fellow here we are he turned in through a narrow gate leading to a pretty though neglected garden in which stood the mess a long single storied building raised on piles on the broad wooden veranda to which a flight of steps led from the ground two men were reclining in long chairs reading old newspapers on seeing dermot and his companion they rose and the colonel introduced frank they shook hands with him and gave him a hearty welcome which coming on the top of the dermots cheered the subaltern exceedingly and for the first time made him forget the circumstances of his coming it's mighty glad i am to see you here wargrave said burke the doctor in a mellow brogue and av it's only to have someone living in the mess with me the major there lives in solitary state in his little bungalow and i'm all alone here at night with shatans devils and wild beasts walking on the veranda what has that panther been prowling round the mess again asked the political officer faith and he has that sure i heard him sniffing at me door last night i wish to the powers ye'd shoot him sir i can't get him i've tried often enough troth and it's waking up one fine morning i'll be to find he's made a meal of me keep your door shut at night wargrave merrick who lived in the room you'll have forgot to do it once and the divil nearly had him is that really a fact asked frank delighted at the thought of having come to a place with such possibilities of sport yes we're plagued by a brute of a panther that prowls about the station at night jumps the wall of the fort and carries off the sepoys dogs and has actually entered rooms here in the mess he has killed several bhutia children on the hills around here 
nobody can ever get a shot at him he's too cunning will you have a drink colonel said hunt the political officer thanked him but declined and reminding them all of his wife's invitation for the morrow bade them good night that's one of the finest men in india exclaimed bert as they watched dermot's figure receding down the road the doctor had a pleasant ugly face and wore spectacles he is indeed he keeps the whole bhutan border in order said the commandant major hunt a slight gray-haired man with a quiet and reserved manner the bhutias are more afraid of a cross look from him than of all our rifles and machine guns have a drink wargrave yes and you burke hey boy a gurkha servant with the ugly cheery face of his race appeared and was ordered to bring three whiskies and sodas ranga's not a bad place if you can stand the lowliness continued the major are you fond of shooting yes sir awfully hooray that's good cried burke now we'll have someone to go down to the jungle and shoot for the mess we want a change from tin army rations and the tough old tins that these benighted hathens call chickens yes you'll be a godsend to us if you're a good shot wargrave added the commandant we never get meat here unless someone shoots a stag or a buck in the jungle and for that we generally have to rely on dermont but he is away such a lot wandering along the frontier keeping an eye on the peace of the border now we'll be able to look to you we have three transport elephants with the detachment all steady to shoot from frank was delighted i'd love to go into the jungle if you'll let me sir yes i'll be glad if you do there's not much work for you here and this is a dull place for a youngster unless he's keen on sport i'm not myself burke's as blind as a bat but you can always have an elephant when they aren't wanted to bring up supplies from the railway the subaltern thanked him gratefully and inwardly decided that his new commanding officer was a great improvement on colonel trevor now burke i'm off to my bungalow show wargrave his quarters said the major rising see you at dinner burke showed the subaltern his room one of the four into which the mess was divided like the doctor's quarters it was at one end of the building the center apartment being the officer's ante-room and dining-room frank found that his boy with the ready deftness of indian servants had unpacked his trunks hung up his clothes and stowed his various belongings about the scantily furnished room he had stood violet's photo on the one rickety table and laid out his master's white mess uniform on the small iron cot major hunt wargrave learned lived in a bungalow a few hundred yards away but being unmarried took his meals in the mess the indian officers and sepoys of the detachment were quartered in barracks in the fort frank dressed and entered the ante-room or officers sitting room from which a door led into the mess room both apartments were poorly furnished but the walls were adorned with the skulls and skins of many beasts of the jungle presented by colonel dermot as frank learned 
shelves filled with books ran across one end of the anteroom as the interior of the mess was rather hot at that time of year though to wardgrave it seemed very cool after rohar the dinner table was laid on the veranda and while the officers sat at their meal the pleasant mountain breeze played about them frank thought with gratitude of the escape from the burning heat which at that moment was tormenting the hundreds of millions in the furnace of the plains of india stretching away from the foot of the cool hills the meal was not luxurious for it consisted almost exclusively of tin provisions fresh meat being unprocurable in rangadar except fowls of exceeding toughness and vegetables and bread being rare dainties during dinner wargrave learned how completely isolated his new station was their only european neighbors were the planters on tea gardens scattered about in the great forest below the nearest thirty miles off the few visitors that ranga Dwar saw in the year were the general on his annual inspection an occasional officer of the indian civil service the public works or the forest department or some planter friend of the dermots the reason of the existence of the outpost and its garrison was the guarding of the dwars or passes through the himalayas against raiders from bhutan that little known independent state lying between tibet and bengal border its frontier was only two miles from and a few thousand feet above rangodwar you are just in time for our one yearly burst of gaiety wargrave said the commandant the visit of the deb zimpoon what on earth is that sir asked the subaltern sounds like a new disease doesn't it said bert laughing but it isn't the deb zimpoon is a gentleman of high degree the hereditary cup-bearer to the deb rajah to the what demanded the bewildered frank major hunt smiled bhutan is supposed to be ruled by a temporal monarch called the deb rajah and also by a spiritual one known in india as the durma rajah in reality it is under the sway of the most powerful of the several great feudal lords of the land the tongsa penop or chief of tongska whom we regard as the maraja of bhutan he has placed himself as far only as the foreign relations of the country go under the suzerainty of the government of india and in return we grant him a subsidy of a lakha of rupees in a year it used to be fifty thousand but the sum was doubled years ago to get the money one of the state council comes every year he is an official called the dem zipun faith he's a rum old beggar wargrave broke in burke looks like the pope of rome in his triple crown for he wears a high gold-edged cap and a flowing red robe of chinese silk out of which sticks a pair of hairy bare legs the political officer receives him in dubar and we furnish a guard of honor the colonel gives a dinner to him and us and we have another spread in the mess that reminds me i suppose dermot will be going into the jungle soon to shoot for the pot as the derber is next week 
you'd better get him to take you you can have one of our elephants and provide for our larder thanks very much major said the delighted subaltern the colonel promised to let me accompany him and lend me a rifle when he went to his room that night the subaltern turned up the oil lamp that lighted it and before he undressed sat down before violet's photograph as he looked at it he thought affectionately and a little sadly of the lonely woman so far away from him now he pitied her for the isolation in which she lived an isolation far completer than his own for she had few friends no intimates and a husband worse than a stranger in his lack of understanding of her surely it would be only right to take her from such a man right to give her a fresh chance of finding the happiness that she had missed for the warm-hearted intelligent and artistic natured woman would be far happier with him in this beautiful spot remote from the world though it was and his new comrades would appeal to her dermot strong capable one who would always stand out from his fellows hunt grave kindly well-read burke witty clever and good-hearted and little though violet cared for her own sex as a rule surely in mrs dermot she would find a friend this happy wife this loving mother was so sweet and sympathetic that she would win the older woman's liking while the two delightful children would take her heart by storm poor lonely violet so beautiful so ill-fated frank sighed as he took up her portrait and kissed it when he extinguished the lamp and lay down in bed it was pleasant after the heat in rohar to find it so cool that he was obliged to pull a blanket over him only those who have endured the torment of hot nights in the tropics can appreciate his thankfulness as in the silence broken only by the monotonous cry of the night jars he drowsed contentedly to sleep already he was reconciled to ranga duar End of chapter 5chapter number seven of the jungle girl by gordon casserly this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c in the terai jungle in the pleasant light of the morning the little outpost looked as charming to wargrave as it had done on the previous evening above ranga Dwar, the mountains towered to the pale blue sky while below it the foothills fell in steps to the broad sea foliage of the great forest stretching away to the distant plains seen vaguely through the haze the horseshoe hollow in which the tiny station was set was bowered in vegetation the gardens glowed with the varied hues of flowers and were bounded by hedges of wild roses the road and paths were bordered by the tall graceful plumes of the bamboo and shaded by giant mango and banyan trees their boughs clothed with orchids frank had noticed the previous day that the fort barracks and bungalows were all newly built and he learned that during the great war which had raged along the frontiers of india five years before the post had been fiercely attacked by an army of chinese and bhutanese and the little station practically wiped out of existence 
although victory had finally rested with the few survivors of the garrison from the first the subaltern took great like to the tall punjabi mahadim and hook-nosed fair-skinned pathan native officers and sepoys of the detachment the work was light and scarcely required two british officers and frank soon found that major hunt who seemed driven by a demon of quiet energy preferred to do most of it himself frank got the impression that to the elder man occupation was an anodyne for some secret sorrow although the subaltern had no wish to shirk his duty he could not but be glad that his superior officer seemed always ready to dispense with his aid and thus he would find it easier to get permission to go shooting his first excursion into the jungle was arranged at dinner at the dermot's house on his second evening in ranga dwar the colonel proposed to take him out on the following monday for on the next day the deb zimpun would arrive he always brings a big train of butias with him eighty swordsmen as an escort to the small army of coolies necessary to carry a hundred thousand silver rupees in boxes over the himalayan passes i like to give them the flesh of a few semper stags as a treat said the colonel heaven help ye av ye bring any samber flesh to the mess wargrave said burke we want something we can get our teeth into no we expect a kakur from you what's a kakur asked frank it's the muntjac or barking deer replied dermot you wouldn't know it if you haven't shot in forests it gets its english name from its call which is not unlike a dog's bark when ye hear one saying wonk wonk in the jungle wargrave get up the nearest tree for the kakur is warning all whom it may concern that there's a tiger in the imagent vicinity frank had already learned to distrust most of burke's statements on sport for the doctor was an invertate joker so he looked to the political officer for confirmation yes it's supposed to be the case agreed the colonel and i've more than once heard a tiger loudly express his annoyance when a kakur barked as he was trying to sneak by unnoticed there's a barking deer he pointed to the well-mounted head of a small deer on the wall of the dining-room whom do you expect up for the durbar mrs dermot asked major hunt only mr carter the subdivisional officer and probably mr benson a is isn't miss benson coming too asked the doctor in a hesitating manner so unlike his usual cheery and assured self that frank looked at him it seemed to him that burke was blushing oh yes i hope so replied mrs dermot er haven't you heard from her persisted the doctor anxiously i had a letter this afternoon brought by a coolie muriel wrote to say that they were in the buxa reserve but hope to get here in time i'm looking forward to her coming immensely it's four months since i saw her frank could not help noticing that burke seemed to hang on mrs dermot's words and he began to wonder if the unknown lady held the doctor's heart it's rather hard on a girl like miss benson to have to lead such a lonely life and rough it constantly in the jungle as she does remarked major hunt at her age she must want gaiety and amusement muriel doesn't mind it replied the hostess 
she loves jungle life and she thinks that her father couldn't get on without her sure she's right there mrs dermot cried burke the dear odd boy'd us uh, lose her head av he haven't her to hold it on for him she does most of his work it's a sight to see that slip of a girl bossing all the forest guards and haboos and giving them their orders wargrave was anxious to hear more of this girl in whom it appeared to him burke was very much interested but colonel dermot broke in talking of orders have you any for the butcher's man noreen he asked smiling at his wife yes dear will you please bring me a cur and some jungle fowl and if you can manage it a brace of kaje pheasants said the good housewife seriously well wargrave we've both got our orders and know what to bring back from the jungle said the colonel turning to frank who was sitting beside him then the conversation between them drifted into sporting channels until all adjourned outside for coffee on the veranda next afternoon the subaltern passing down the road was hailed from the dermot's garden by an imperious small lady with golden curls and big blue bows and ordered to play with her her brother and badcha had to join in the game too frank chasing the dainty mite round and round the elephant began to think himself in the garden of eden but that same evening he found his himalayan paradise was not without its serpent the three officers of the detachment were seated at dinner on the mess veranda major hunt with his back to the rough stone wall of the building a swinging oil lamp with a metal shade threw the light downward and left the ceiling and upper part of the wall in shadow when dinner was ended the commandant lighting a cheroot tilted his chair on its back legs until his head nearly touched the wall frank talking to him chanced to look up at the roof he stared into the shadows for a moment then suddenly grasping the astonished major by the collar jerked him out of his chair and as he did so a snake a deadly hill viper which had been trying to climb up the rough face of the wall slipped and dropped on to the commandant's chair slid to the floor and glided across the veranda and down into the garden before any one could find a stick with which to attack it major hunt his sallow face a little paler than usual looked up at the wall to see if any more reptiles were likely to follow then sat down again calmly thank you wargrave he said quietly but for you that brute would have got me and his bite is death ranga's full of snakes like all these places in the hills we've killed several in the mess since i've been here but no one's had such a close shave as this i'll stand you a drink for that hi boy but for all this quiet manner of taking it frank had made a staunch friend that night by his prompt action as burke took the filled glass that the gurkha mess servant brought him at the major's order he said i hate snakes worse than the devil hates holy water they're only things in life i'm afraid of i never go to bed without looking under the pillow nor put on my boots in the morning without first turning them up and shaking them i wish st patrick had made a trip to india and driven the serpents out of the country the same as he did in ireland we've the worst snake in the world i believe here in the terai wargrave said major hunt 
look out for it when you're in the jungle it's the hamadrin or king cobra have you heard of it i saw the skin of one sixteen feet long in a bombay museum sir replied the subaltern it's the only snake in asia that will attack human beings unprovoked it's deadly poisonous unlike all other big snakes and they say it moves so fast that it can overtake a man on a pony benson the first officer of the district tells me there are many of them in the jungles here one of the devils chased dermot's elephant once and turned on the colonel when he interfered it got its head blown off for its pains put in the doctor don't tell me any more burke exclaimed wargrave laughing or i won't be able to sleep tonight he pushed back his chair as the commandant rose from the table and saying good night to the two junior officers picked up from the veranda and lit a hurricane lantern and walked down the mess steps with it on his way home to his bungalow europeans in india do not care to move about at night without a lamp least in the darkness they might tread on a snake early on the following monday morning wargrave dressed in khaki knickerbockers shirt and puttees and wearing besides his pith helmet a spine protector a quilted cloth pad buttoned to the back as a guard against sunstroke went down to the dermot's bungalow in the garden the colonel also prepared for their shooting expedition stood talking to his wife while their children were trying to climb up badshah's legs the elephant was equipped with a light pad provided with large pockets into which were thrust thermos flasks packets of sandwiches and of cartridges close by two servants were holding guns good morning wargrave said the colonel as a subaltern greeted him and his wife you're in good time eileen deserting bagshaw ran to frank and demanded to be lifted and kissed when he had obeyed the small tyrant he said i haven't brought a rifle sir that's right i have one and a ball and shotgun for you we'll walk down to the peel kahana by a short cut through the hills to look for kalj peasant on the way take the gun with you and load one barrel with shot but put a bullet in the other for you never know what we may meet bagshaw will go down by the road as well as one of the servants to bring the rifles and tell the mahouts to get a detachment elephant ready it will follow us in the jungle to carry any animals we kill while we'll ride bagshaw kissing his wife and children the colonel led the way down the road followed by frank and the servant bagshaw walking unattended behind him good sport mr wargrave called out mrs dermot as the subaltern turned at the gate to take off his hat in a farewell salute and the little coquette beside her kissed her tiny hand to him after they had gone half a mile the two officers carrying their fowling pieces turned off along a footpath through the undergrowth leaving the servant and the elephant to continue down the road the track led steeply down the mountain side at first between high closely matted bushes and then through scrub jungle dotted with small trees among the foliage of which gleamed the f yellow fruit of the limes and the plantain's glossy drooping leaves and long curving stalks from which the nimble fingers of wild monkeys had plucked the ripe bananas here and there the ground was open and the path following a natural depression in the hills gave down the gradually widening valley 
a view of the panorama of forest and plain lying below as they passed a clump of tangled bushes a rustle and a pattering over the dry leaves under them caught the colonel's ear look out kelge he whispered picking up a stone and throwing it into the cover a large speckled black and white bird whirred out and wargrave brought it down good shot there's another called out dermot and fired with equal success we're lucky he continued as a rule they won't break but scuttle along under the bushes so that one often has to shoot them running frank picked up the birds and examined them with interest before the colonel stuffed them into his game bag and moved on down the path which was growing steeper the trees became more numerous and larger as they descended nearer the forest out of another clump of bushes the sportsmen succeeded in getting a second brace of peasants lower down they passed through a belt of bamboos where in one spot the long feathery boughs were broken off or twisted in wild confusion for a space of fifty yard radius wild elephants said the political officer briefly and pointed to a patch of dust in which was the round imprint of a huge foot frank was a little startled for he felt that against these great animals the bullets in their guns would be useless are they dangerous sir he asked not as a rule when they are in a herd although cow elephants with calves may be so fearing peril for their young but sometimes a bull takes to a solitary life becomes vicious and develops into a dangerous rogue it probably happens that finding crops growing near a jungle village and raiding them he is driven off by the cultivators turns savage and kills some of them then he usually seems to take a hatred to all human beings and attacks them on sight hello here we are at the pilkahana at last they had reached the high wooden building which housed the three transport elephants of the detachment in the clearing before it badshah and another animal were standing a group of mahouts and coolies near them we'll mount and start at once said colonel dermot beckoning to his elephant which came to him get up wargrave the subaltern looked up doubtfully at the pad on bagshaw's back how can i sir isn't he going to kneel he asked put your foot on his trunk when he crooks it and grab hold of his ears he'll lift you up then the understanding elephant at once curled his trunk invitingly and cocked its great ears forward frank did as he was directed and found himself raised in the air until he was able to get on to the elephant's head and from it scrambled on to the pad dermot followed and seated himself astride the huge neck mole go on he ejaculated with a swaying lurching stride badshaw at once moved across the clearing followed by the transport elephant onto which a mahout and a coolie had climbed and plunged into the dense undergrowth which was so high that it nearly closed over the riders heads the sudden change from the blinding glare of the sun to the enchanting green gloom of the forest from the intense heat to the refreshing coolness of the shade was delightful beyond the clearing the vegetation was tangled and rank high grass concealing thorny shrubs tall matted bushes covered with large white bell-shaped flowers all so dense that men on foot could not push their way through but it divided like water before the leading elephant's weight and strength the trees were now not the lesser growth of bamboo lime 
and cerro palm that covered the foothills they were the great forest giants enormous teak sal and semel trees tearing up bare of branches for a good height above the ground rising to the green canopy overhead and thrusting their leafy crowns through it seeking their share of the sunlight their massive branches were matted thick with the glossy green leaves of orchid plants and draped with long trails of the beautiful mauve and white blossoms of the exotic flowers hanging from the highest branches or swinging between the massive boles creepers of every kind rioted in bewildering confusion a chaos of natural cordage of festooned lianas thick as a liner's hawser some twisting around each other others coiling about the tree trunks biting deep into the bark or striving to strangle them in a cruel grip not even the elephant's weight and strength could burst through the stout network of these creepers in places while they tore at the obstructions with their trunks it was necessary for their drivers to hack through the creepers with their sharp kirkries the heavy curved knives carried in their belts and similar to the gurkha's favorite weapon here and there the party came upon glades free from undergrowth where in the cool shade of the trees the ground was knee-deep in bracken in one such spot wargrave's eye was caught by a flash of bright color and his rifle went halfway to his shoulder only to be lowered again when he saw two sambur hinds graceful animals with glossy chestnut hides watching the advancing elephants curiously but without fear for used to seeing wild ones they did not realize that badshah and his companion carried human beings their sex saved them from the hunters who leaving them unscathed passed on and plunged into the dense undergrowth on the far side of the clearing the elephants fed continually as they moved along sweeping up great bunches of grass tearing down trails of leafy creepers breaking off branches from the trees they crammed them all impartially into their mouths picking up twigs in their trunks they used them to beat their sides and legs to drive off stinging insects or snuffing up dust from the ground blew clouds of it along their bellies for the same purpose suddenly the colonel stopped badshah and whispered there's a samher stag wargrave there to your left in the undergrowth have a shot at him the subaltern looked everywhere eagerly but in the dense tangle he could not discern the animal like all novices in the jungle he directed his gaze too far away and suddenly a dark patch of deep shadow in the undergrowth close by materialized itself into the black hide of a stag only as it dashed off it had been standing within fifteen paces of the elephants knowing the value of immobility as a shield at last its nerve failed it and it revealed itself by breaking away but as it fled colonel dermot's rifle spoke and the big deer crumpled up and fell crashing through the vegetation to the ground the second elephant's mahout a grey-bearded mahomedan slipped instantly to the earth and drawing his kirki struggled through the arresting creepers and undergrowth to where the stag lay feebly moving its limbs seizing one horn he performed the halal that is he cut its throat to let blood while there was still life in the animal muttering the short muslim creed as he did so for his religion enjoins this hygiene practice borrowed by the prophet from the mosaic law 
to guard against long dead carrion being eaten at the touch of the colonel's hand bagshaw sank to its knees and wargrave very annoyed with himself for his slowness in detecting the deer forced his way through the undergrowth to examine it the stag was a fine beast fourteen hands high with sharp brow antlers and a pair of thick stunted horns branching at the ends into two points leaving the elephants to graze freely the mahout and his coolie disemboweled the sambhur and hacked off the head with their heavy kirkies aided by the political officer and wargrave they skinned the animal and then with the skill of professional butchers proceeded to cut up the carcass into huge joints while they were thus engaged the colonel went to a small straight-stemmed tree common in the jungle and clearing away a patch of the outer mottled bark disclosed a white inner skin which he cut off in long strips with these which formed unbreakable cordage they fastened the heavy joints to the pad of the transport elephant when this was done wargrave looking at his hands covered with blood and grime said ruefully how on earth are we to get clean sir is there any water in the jungle we haven't seen any the political officer looking about him pointed to a thick creeper with withered seeming bark and said with a laugh there's your water wargrave lots of it on tap see here he cut off a length of the liana which contained a whitish pulpy interior from the two ends of the piece water began to drip steadily and increase to a thin stream by george sir that's a plant worth knowing said frank it's a most useful jungle product said the colonel holding it up so that his companion using clay as soap could wash his hands it's called the panny bell water creeper one need never die of thirst in a forest where it is found try the water in it he raised it so that the clear liquid flowed into the subaltern's mouth it was cool palatable and tasteless by george sir that's good exclaimed wargrave examining the plant carefully now let me hold it for you after dermot and the two natives had cleansed their hands and arms the party moved on the transport elephant looking like an interrent butcher's shop as it followed bad shah again the undergrowth parted before the great animals like the sea cleft by the bows of a ship and closed similarly behind them when they had passed of its own volition the leader swerved one side or the other when it was necessary to avoid a tree trunk or too dense a tangle of obstructing creepers but once dermot touched and turned it sharply out of its course to escape what seemed a very large lump of clay adhering to the underside of an overhanging bough in their path a wild bee's nest said the colonel pointing to it it wouldn't do to risk hitting against that and being stung to death by its occupants a few minutes later he suddenly arrested bagshaw at the edge of a fern carpeted glade and whispered look out there's a barking deer get him across the glade a graceful little buck with a bright chestnut coat stepped daintily followed at a respectable distance by his doe their restless ears pointed incessantly this way and that for every warning sound as they moved but neither saw the elephants hidden in the undergrowth raising his rifle frank took a quick aim at the buck's shoulder and fired the deer pitched forward and fell dead while its startled mate swung round and leapt wildly away a good shot of yours wargrave remarked colonel dermot when bagshaw had advanced to the prostrate animal 
broke its shoulder and pierced the heart frank looked down pityingly at the pretty little deer stretched lifeless among the ferns it seems a shame to slaughter a harmless thing like that he said yes i always feel the same myself and never kill except for food replied the political officer unless of course it's a dangerous beast like a tiger well the kakur is too dead to halal but that doesn't matter as we're going to eat it ourselves and not give it to the sepoys the mahout and the coolie were already cleaning the deer and without troubling to cut it up bound its legs together with udal fibre and tied it to the pad of their elephant and the party moved on again half a mile further on the silence of the forest was broken by the loud crowing of a cock taken up and answered defiantly by others hello are we near a village sir asked wargrave surprised at the familiar sound so far in the heart of the wild no those are jungle fowl whispered the political officer get your gun ready he halted the elephant and picked up his fowling piece frank hurriedly substituted a shot cartridge for the one loaded with ball in his gun he heard a pattering on the dry leaves under the trees and into a fairly open space before them stalked a pretty little bantam cock with red comb and wattles and curving green tail feathers followed by four or five sober brown hens so like in every respect to domestic fowl that wargrave hesitated to shoot but suddenly the birds whirred up into the air and as the colonel gave them both barrels frank did the same the cock and three of his wives dropped the mahout urged his elephant forward and made the reluctant animal pick up the crumpled bunches of blood-stained feathers in its curving trunk and pass them to him colonel dermot searched the jungle for some distance around but could not find the other jungle cocks that had answered the dead one's challenge looking at his watch he suggested a halt for lunch which wargrave whose back was beginning to ache with fatigue gladly agreed to dismounting they sat on the ground and ate and drank the contents of the pockets of badshaw's pad but with loaded rifles beside them lest their meal should be disturbed by any dangerous denizen of the jungle the two natives sat down some distance away and turning their backs on each other drew out claws in which their midday repast of chupatis or thick pancakes with curry and an onion or two was tied up the elephants left to themselves grazed close by and did not attempt to wander away their meal and a smoke finished the party mounted again and moved on but luck seemed to have deserted them much to the political officer's disappointment they wandered for miles without adding anything to their bag he had calculated on getting another couple of sambur stags to present to the deb zimpan as food for his hungry followers the route that they were now taken led circuitously back towards the pilkahana which they wished to reach before sundown they had got within a mile of it and were close to the foot of the hills when Badshaw stopped suddenly and smelt the ground. Colonel Dermot leaned over the huge head and stared down intently at something invisible to his young companion. "'What is it, sir?' asked Wargrave in a whisper. "'Bison. Badshaw's pointing for us. We can't shoot them here, for we're in government jungle where the killing of elephants, bison, and rhino is forbidden.' unless they attack you but the track leads north towards the mountains and at their foot the government forest ends 
that's only half a mile away and we can bag them there load your rifle with solid nose bullets this is the pug footprint of a bull i think the two natives had seen the tracks by this and were wildly excited badshaw without urging moved swiftly through the trees and soon brought his riders to the hills and into sight of the sky once more the mountains stood out clear and distant in the slanting rays of the setting sun suddenly a loud though distant almost musical bellow sounded seeming to come from a bamboo jungle about one mile away that's a cow bison calling said dermot in a low voice there's a herd somewhere about but the pugs were following up are those of a solitary bull we're in free forest now so with luck you may get your first bison it's very steep here we'll dismount leave the elephants and go on foot the subaltern was wildly excited and his heart thumped at a rate that was not caused by the steep slope up which he followed dermot the colonel tracked the bull unhesitatingly although to wargrave there was no mark to be seen on the ground they were creeping cautiously through bamboo cover on a hill when dermot who was leading suddenly threw himself on his face lay still for a minute or two then motioning to his companion to halt crawled forward like a snake a few paces on he stopped and beckoned to wargrave and when the latter reached him pointed down into the gully below they were almost on the edge of a descent precipitous enough to be called a cliff immediately underneath by a small stream was a massive black bull bison eighteen hands six feet high with short square head broad ears and horizontal rounded horns the only touches of color were on the forehead and the legs below the knees which were whitish the animal with head thrown back was staring vacantly with his large slaty blue eyes wargrave trembled with excitement and his heart beat so violently that the rifle shook as he brought it to his shoulder and gently pushed the muzzle through the stiff dry grass at the edge of the cliff but for the one necessary instant he became rigidly steady and without a tremor pressed the trigger then the rifle barrels danced again before his eyes when he saw the great bull collapse on the ground its forelegs twitching violently the hind ones motionless good shot you've broken his spine exclaimed dermot springing to his feet and sliding scrambling jumping down the steep descent the excited subaltern outstripped him but before he reached the bull it lay motionless dead you're a lucky man wargrave a splendid bison on your first day in the jungle those horns are six feet from tip to tip i bet and the political officer held out his hand frank shook it heartily as he said gracefully i've only you to thank for it it was ripping of you to let me have the first shot and you gave me such a sitter that i couldn't miss thank you awfully colonel dermot gave a piercing whistle and stood waiting while the overjoyed subaltern walked round and round the dead bison marvelling at its size and exclaiming at his own good fortune when in a few minutes bagshaw appeared followed by the panting men colonel dermot set the mahout on his elephant to the stable to fetch other men to cut up and bring in the bison then he and wargrave on badshaw made for the road to rangadar it was dark long before they reached the little station the colonel brought his companion in for a drink after the three thousand foot climb most of which they had done on foot 
mrs dermot met them in the hall and after she had heard the result of the day's sport warmly congratulated wargrave on his good luck loud whispers and a scuffle over their heads attracted the attention of all three elders and on the broad wooden staircase they saw two small figures one in pajamas the other in a pretty trailing nightdress daintily tied with blue bows looking imploringly down at their mother she smiled and nodded there was a whirlwind rush down the stairs and the mites were caught up in their father's arms then frank came in for his share of caresses from them before they were sternly ordered back to bed again and as he passed out into the darkness he carried away with him an enchanting picture of the charming babes climbing the stairs hand in hand and turning to blow kisses to the tall man who stood below with a strong arm around his pretty wife gazing fondly up at his children and the picture stayed with him when after dinner at which he was congratulated by his brother officers he went to his room and found a letter overlooked in his rush to dress for mess it was from violet the first that had come from her since his arrival in ranga Dwar. it breathed passion and longing discontent and despair in every line as he laid his face on his arm to shut out the light where he sat at the table he felt that he was nearer to loving the absent woman than he had ever been for the vision of the dermot's married happiness of the deep affection linking husband and wife of the children climbing the stair and smiling back at their parents came vividly to him and it haunted him in his sleep when in dreams tiny arms were clasped round his neck and baby lips touched his lovingly end of chapter seven chapter eight of the jungle girl by gordon casterly this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c a girl in the forest from the frontier of bhutan six thousand feet up on the face of the mountains a line of men wound down the serpentining track that led to ranga Dwar. at their head walked a stockily built man with cheery mongolian features wearing a white cloth garment kimono shaped and kilted up to give freedom to the sturdy bare thighs and knees the legs and feet cased in long felt soled boots it was the deb zimpun the envoy of the independent border state of bhutan behind him came a tall man in khaki tunic breeches puttees and cap his breast covered with bright-colored ribbons his uniform was similar to the british but his face was unmistakably chinese as were those of the twenty tall khaki-clad soldiers armed with magazine rifles at his heels they were followed by three or four score Bhutanese swordsmen, thick set and not unlike Gurkhas in feature, with bare heads, legs, and feet, and clad only in a single garment similar to their leaders and kilted up by a cord around the waist, from which hung a da, a short sword or long knife in rear of them trudged a number of coolies some laden with bundles others with baskets of fruit where the track came out on the bare shoulder of a spur free from the small trees and undergrowth clothing the mountains the deb zimpun pointed to the roofs of the building in the little station a thousand feet below them and hitherto invisible to them 
that is ranga dwar he said briefly the chinaman behind him looked down at it it seems a very small and weak place to have stopped our invading troops in the war he said in bhutanese so here lives the man the man yes perhaps he is a man but many very many there be that think him a god or devil they say he can call up a horde of demons in the form of elephants with such he trampled your army into the earth devils leave such tales to lamas and the ignorant fools that believe their teaching but if even a part of what i have heard about this man be true he is more dangerous than many devils he stands in china's way and he who does shall be swept aside he is my friend said the deb simpun shortly and tramped on in silence before they reached the station they were met by two of the political officers men Butias resident in british territory detailed to receive and guide them to the government dak bungalow in which the deb zimpun and as many of his followers as could crowd into it were to reside during their stay arrived at it the long line filed into the compound half a mile away down the hill colonel dermot and wargrave watched them through their field glasses who is that fellow in khaki uniform sir asked the subaltern the political officer lowered his binoculars and laughed a gentleman i've been very anxious to meet he's the chinese amban we call him an envoy of the republic of china to bhutan but the chinese themselves prefer to regard him as a representative of the suzerainty they pretend to exercise over the country i'm curious to see him he is a product of the times an example of the modern celestial educated at heidelberg university and oxford speaks german french and english he has been specially chosen by his government to come to a buddhist land as he is a son of the abbot of the yellow lama temple in pekin and so might have influence with the bhutanese by reason of his connection with their religion but what have the chinese to do with bhutan nothing now but they've been intriguing for years to re-establish the suzerainty they once had over it this amban wan si hung by name is a clever unscrupulous and particularly dangerous individual you seem to know a lot about him colonel it's my business to do so there is no apparent reason for his coming here with the deb zimpun nor has he a right to but i won't object for i want to study and size him up by the way the envoy will make his official call on me this morning would you like to be present very much indeed i am always interested in seeing the various races of india and learning all i can about them i love a job like yours sir going in out of the way places and dealing with strange peoples would you the political officer looked at him thoughtfully are you good at picking up native languages fairly so i got through my lower and higher standard hindustani first go and have passed in marathi and taken the higher standard persian colonel dermot regarded him critically and then said abruptly come to my office a few minutes before eleven that's the hour i fixed for the deb zimpun's visit punctually at the time named wargrave reached the dermot's bungalow on the road outside of which a guard of honor of fifty sepoys 
under an indian officer was drawn up passing along the veranda he entered the office and saluted the colonel who seated at his desk looked up and nodded for him to be seated and then returned to the dispatch that he was writing in a few minutes a confused murmur drew nearer down the road and was stilled by the sharp words of command to the guard of honor and by the ring of rifles brought to the present in salute over the low wall of the garden appeared the heads and shoulders of the envoy and his chinese companion followed by a train of attendants and swordsmen they passed in through the gate the political officer rose as the deb zimpun removed his cap entered the office and rushed towards him the bullet-headed cheery old gentleman beamed with pleasure as they shook hands and greeted each other in boutonese wargrave marvelled at the ease and fluency with which colonel dermot spoke the language the ambin now entered the room and was formally presented by the deb zempoon speaking in excellent english but with an accent that showed that he had first acquired it in germany he said i am very pleased to meet you colonel i have heard much of you in bhutan it gives me equal pleasure to make your excellency's acquaintance and to welcome you to india replied dermot with a bow then in his turn wargrave was presented to the two asiatics and the envoy calling an attendant in took from him two white scarves of chinese silk and placed one round each officer's neck in the custom known as katag all sat down and the envoy plunged into an animated conversation with colonel dermot first producing a metal box and taking betel nut from it to chew while the attendant placed a spittoon conveniently near him yun shi hung chatted in english with wargrave who was astonished to find him a well-educated man of the world and thoroughly conversant with european politics art and letters but for the inscrutable yellow face the subaltern could have believed himself to be talking to an able continental diplomat the contrast between the semi-savage bhutanese official and his companion in whom the most modern civilized gentleman's manners were successfully grafted on the old-time courtesy of the chinese aristocrat was very striking the old envoy was a frank barbarian he laughed loudly and clapped his hands in glee when colonel dermot presented him with a gramophone which it appeared he had longed for ever since seeing one on a previous visit to india and taught him how to work it he showed his beetle-stained teeth in an ecstatic grin when a record was turned on and from the trumpet came the political officer's familiar voice addressing him by name and in his own language with many flourishes of oriental compliment towards the termination of their call the deb zoom pin called in two attendants with large baskets of fine blood oranges and walnuts from bhutan and presented them in return a number of coolies were needed to carry off the royal gift of the flesh of the bison the sight of which made the envoy's eyes glisten he shook wargrave's hand warmly when he learned to whose rifle he owed it then he and his chinese companion took their leave and with their followers passed up the hilly road wargrave gazing after them came to the conclusion that of the pair he preferred the savage to the ultra cultivated celestial having thanked the colonel for permitting him to be present at the interview which had interested him greatly 
the subaltern was about to leave when mrs dermot appeared at the office door may i come in kevin she began oh good morning mr wardgrave i was just sending a chit letter to you and captain burke asking you to tea this afternoon a coolie has arrived from the pilkahana to say that mr and miss benson and mr carter are on their way up and will be here soon so you'll meet them at tea you will like miss benson she's a dear girl thanks very much mrs dermot i'd be delighted to come if you'll forgive me should i be a little late i've got to take the signaler's parade this afternoon i'll tell burke when i get to the mess i'm going straight there now thank you that will save me writing au revoir halfway up the road to the mess wardgrave looked back and saw an elephant heave into sight around a bend below the dermot's house and plod heavily up to their gate on the charjama the passenger carrying contrivance of wooden seats on the pad with footboards hanging by short ropes sat a lady and two european men holding white umbrellas up to keep off the vertical rays of the noonday sun when the animal sank to its knees in front of the bungalow wargrave saw the girl it could only be miss benson spring lightly to the ground before either of her companions could dismount and offer to help her her big sun hat hid her face and at that distance wargrave could only see that she was small and slight as she walked up the garden path when the signer's afternoon practice was over the subaltern passed across the parade ground to the political officer's house when he entered the pretty drawing-room bright with the gay colors of chintz curtains and cushions he found the strangers present one man talking to mrs dermot at her tea-table the other chatting with the colonel while burke was installed beside a girl seated in a low cane chair and dressed in a smart hand embroidered to soar silk dress suede shoes and silk stockings little brian stood beside her with one arm affectionately around her neck while eileen was perched in her lap but when frank appeared the mite wriggled down to the floor and rushed to him the subaltern was presented to miss benson her father and carter the subdivisional officer or civil service official of the district when he sat down eileen clambered on to his knee and seriously interfered with his peaceful enjoyment of his tea but while he talked to her he was watching miss benson over the small golden head she was astonishingly pretty with silky black hair curving in natural waves dark bordered irish gray eyes fringed with long thick lashes a rose-tinted complexion a pouting red-lipped mouth and a small nose with the most fascinating provoking suspicion of a tip tilt she was as small and daintily fashioned as her hostess and wargrave thought it marvellous that their forgotten outpost on the face of the mountains should hold two such pretty women at the same time his comrade burke was evidently acutely conscious of muriel benson's attractions and his pleasantly ugly face aglow with a happy smile he was flirting as openly and outrageously with her as she with him sure it's a cure for sore eyes ye are miss flower face he said that's the name i christened her with the first moment i saw her wargrave doesn't it fit her then turning to the girl again he continued 
aren't you ashamed of yourself for laving me to pine for a sight of ye all these weary months miss benson could claim to be irish on her mother's side and so was a ready-witted match for the doctor's celtic exuberance though to wargrave watching it seemed that burke's easy banter cloaked a deeper feeling drawn into their conversation frank found the girl to be natural and unaffected without a trace of conceit gifted with a keen sense of humour and evidently as full of the joy of living as a schoolboy he thought her laugh delightfully musical and it was frequently and readily evoked by burke's droll remarks or the quaint oracular sayings from the self-possessed elf on wargrave's knee her admiration of and genuine affection for mrs dermot was very evident when noreen joined their group the subaltern covertly and critically observing her could hardly believe the tales which the hostess had previously told him of the courage and ability that this small and dainty girl had frequently shown but only a few minutes conversation with her father convinced frank that he was an amiably weak and incompetent individual more fitted to be a recluse and a bookworm than a roamer in wild jungles where his work brought him in contact with strange peoples and constant danger it was evident that the reputation which his large section of the terai forest bore as being well managed and efficiently run was not due to him and that somebody more capable had the handling of the work hardly had wargrave come to this conclusion and begun to believe that the stories that he had heard of the daughter's business ability and powers of organization were true when he was given a very convincing proof of her courage and coolness in danger after tea as the sun was nearing its setting and a deliciously cool breeze blew down from the mountains a move was made to the garden where the party sat in a circle and chatted when evening came and the dusk rose up from the world below blotting out the light lingering on the hills mrs dermot made her children say good night to the company and bore them reluctant away to their beds as the darkness deepened the servants brought out a small table and placed a lamp on it and by its light carried round drinks to the men of the party miss benson was leaning back in a cane chair and chatting lazily with burke who sat beside her she had one shapely silk-clad leg crossed over the other and a small foot resting on the grass opposite her sat colonel dermot and wargrave as the brilliant tropic stars came out in the velvety blackness of the sky occasional silences fell on the party a tale of burke's was interrupted by the political officer's voice saying in a quiet forceful tone miss benson please do not move your foot remain perfectly still a snake is passing under your chair steady burke keep still there was a terror-stricken hush frank looked across in horror the lamplight barely showed in the shadow under the chair a deadly hill viper writhing its way out within a few inches of the small foot firmly planted in its dainty high-heeled shoe he looked at the motionless girl less pale than the men about her she sat quietly smiling faintly and apparently not frightened by the death almost touching her one pink hand lay without a tremor in her lap but the other rested on the arm of her chair and the knuckles showed as white as the fingers gripped the bamboo tightly she did not even glance down but the men frozen with dread 
watched the shadowy writhing line passing her foot slowly all too slowly until it had wriggled out into the centre of the circle of motionless beings then colonel dermot sprang up seizing his light bamboo chair in a powerful grip he whirled it aloft and brought it crashing down on the viper shattering the chair but smashing the reptile's spine in half a dozen places the other men had risen from their seats but the girl remained seated and said quietly thank you very much colonel for warning me i might easily have moved my foot and trodden on the snake i've seen so many of the horrid things in camp lately now captain burke i'm sorry that the interruption spoiled your story please go on with it her coolness silenced the men who were breaking into exclamations of relief and congratulation even her father sat down again calmly but burke's enthusiastic admiration of her courage found an outlet at mess that night when he recounted the adventure to major hunt and appealed to wargrave for confirmation of the story of her plucky behavior later in his room as he was going to bed frank smiled at the recollection of the irishman's exuberant expressions but he confessed to himself that the girl's calm courage was worthy of every praise she is certainly brave he thought i'm not surprised at old burke's infatuation she is decidedly pretty what lovely eyes she's got and what a provokingly attractive little nose well the doctor's a lucky man if she marries him she seems awfully nice violet will certainly have two very charming women friends in the station if she hits it off with them but as his eyes rested on her pictured face his heart misgave him for he remembered that she had little liking for her own sex and then he told himself these two would probably refuse to know a woman who had run away from her husband to another man when he had turned out the light and jumped into bed he lay awake a long time puzzling over the tangle into which the threads of her life and his seemed to have got time alone could unravel it he tossed uneasily on his bed unable to sleep and presently a slight noise on the veranda outside caught his ear he lay still and listened and it seemed to him that soft footfalls of a large animal's pads sounded on the wooden flooring then suddenly he heard a beast sniffing at his closed door a stray dog he thought but suddenly he remembered burke's account of the panther that haunted the mess and a thrill of excitement ran through him and drove all his unhappy thoughts away he sprang out of bed and rushed across the room to get his rifle but in the darkness overturned a chair which fell with a crash to the ground this scared the animal for there was a sudden scurry outside and by the time wargrave had found the rifle and groped for a couple of cartridges there was nothing to be seen on the veranda when he threw open the door it was a brilliant star-lit night burke called to him from his room and when wargrave went to him said that he too had heard the animal which was undoubtedly the panther returning to bed frank was dropping off to sleep half an hour later when he was startled by a shrill agonized shriek coming from a distance rifle in hand he rushed out on to the veranda again and heard faint shouts coming from a small group of butia huts on a shoulder of the hills hundreds of feet above the mass he called out but got no answer 
and after listening for some time and hearing nothing further he returned to bed and at last fell asleep in the morning he learned that the panther had made a daring raid on a hut and carried off a butia woodcutter's baby from its sleeping mother's side and had devoured it in the jungle not two hundred yards away the durbar or official ceremony of the public reception of the bhutan envoy and the paying over to him of the annual subsidy of a hundred thousand rupees was held in a marquee on the parade ground in the afternoon there was a guard of honor of a hundred sepoys to salute first the political officer and afterwards the deb zimpoon when he arrived on a mule at the head of the swordsmen and coolies the solemnity of his dignified greeting to colonel dermot was somewhat spoiled by shrieks of delight and loud remarks from eileen who was seated beside her mother in the marquee at the stately appearance of the envoy he was attired in a very voluminous red chinese silk robe embroidered in gold and wearing a peculiar gold-edged cap shaped like a papal tiara the political officer's official dinner took place that evening at his bungalow besides the officers and the three european visitors the deb zimpoon and the ampan were present the latter wore conventional evening dress cut by a london tailor with the stars and ribbons of several orders but the old envoy in his flowing red silk robe completely outshone the two ladies although miss benson was wearing her most striking flock sure we don't look like a state banquet at beckingham palace or a charity dinner at the dublin mansion house said burke looking around the company gathered about the oval dining table he was seated beside miss benson who was on the host's right and facing the amben on his left at the durbar wargrave had noticed that the chinaman stared all the time at the girl and now during the meal he seemed to devour her with an unpleasant gaze gloating over the beauties of her bared shoulders and bosom until she became uncomfortably conscious of herself the unveiled flesh of a white woman is peculiarly attractive to the asiatic the better class females of whose race are far less addicted to the public exposure of their charms than are european ladies while the deb simpoon touched nothing but water the amban drank champagne port and liqueurs freely even the untravelled chinaman is partial to european liquors yet they seem not to affect him but his slanted eyes burned all the more fiercely as their gaze was fixed on the girl opposite him he endeavoured to engage her in conversation across the table and appeared ready to resent any one else intervening in the talk as he dilated on the gaieties and pleasures of life in london berlin and paris where he had been attached to the chinese embassies he glared at burke when the doctor persisted in mentioning the panther's visit during the previous night for the conversation at their end of the table then turned on sport a chance remark of miss benson on tiger shooting made wargrave ask have you shot tigers too like mrs dermot and i've never seen one outside a cage the girl smiled and the colonel answered for her miss benson has got at least six seven is it more than my wife has and among them was the famous man-eater of Mardurha. 
which had killed twenty-three persons the natives of the district call her the tiger girl troth my name for you is a prettier one miss benson said burke laughing she made a moo at him but said to the subaltern cheer up mr wargrave you've got lots of time before you yet you oughtn't to complain you've only been a few days here and you've already got a splendid bison and they're rare in these parts we'll have to find him a tiger muriel said the host when you hear of a kill anywhere conveniently near let me know and we'll arrange a beat for him with pleasure colonel we're soon going to the southern fringe of the forest and as you know there are usually tigers to be found in the mullahs on the borders of the cultivated country i'll send you kuburber news thank you very much said wargrave i do want to get one all through the conversation the girl felt the chinaman's bold eyes seeming to burn her flesh and she was glad when the political officer spoke to him and engaged his attention and she was still more relieved when dinner ended and mrs dermot rose to leave the table when the men joined them later on the veranda burke and wargrave made a point of hemming her in on both sides and keeping the amban off for even the short-sighted doctor had become cognizant of the chinaman's offensive stare when he and the deb zimpun had left the bungalow she said to the two officers i'm so glad you didn't let that awful man come near me he makes me afraid there's something so evil about him that i shudder when he looks at me the curse of the crows on the brute exclaimed burke hotly don't ye be afraid we won't let the divil come next or nigh ye will we wargrave and on the following day when the visitors were entertained by athletic sports of the detachment on the parade ground and an interesting archery competition between excited teams of the deb zimpun's followers and of local butias they allowed the ampan no opportunity of approaching her during the sports wargrave noticed on one occasion that he seemed to be speaking of her to the commander of his escort of chinese soldiers a tall evil-faced manchu pock-marked and blind of the right eye who stared at her fixedly for some time at the dinner at the mess that night the two ladies wore frocks that were very little decollete burke as mes president had arranged the table so that the amban was as far away from them as possible and wargrave and he mounted guard over miss benson when the meal was ended the deb zimpun had fixed his departure for an early hour on the following morning and was to be accompanied by the political officer who was going to visit the maraja of bhutan in the course of the day the chinese amban had announced to colonel dermot that he did not wish to leave so soon and desired to remain longer in rangadwar but the political officer courteously but very firmly told him that he must go with the envoy early next morning while noreen dermot was occupied with her children and her husband was completing his preparations for departure muriel benson went out into the garden badshaw pad strapped on ready for the road was standing at one side of the bungalow swinging his trunk and shifting from foot to foot as he patiently awaited his master the girl greeted and petted him then went to gather flowers 
and cut branches of bright colored leaves from high bushes of bougainvillea and poinsettia that hid her from view from the house suddenly a harsh voice sounded in her ears i have tried to speak to you alone but those fools were ever in my way do not cry out you must listen to me she started violently and turned to find the amban dressed in khaki and ready to march behind her courageous as she usually was the extraordinary repulsion and terror with which he inspired her kept her silent as he continued i want you and i shall take you sooner or later listen i am one of the richest men in all china one day i shall be president and then emperor the next and when i rule my country I shall no longer be the effigy despised land torn with dissension that it is now i can give you everything that the heart of a woman white or yellow can desire take you from your dull poverty-stricken life to raise you to power and immense wealth i shall return for you one day will you come to me the girl drew back pale as death and unable to cry out he glanced around the tall red-leaved bushes hid them there was no one or nothing within sight except the elephant shifting restlessly answer me he said almost menacingly she was silent he sprang forward and seized her roughly speak you must answer he said the girl shrank at his touch and struggled in vain in his powerful grasp then suddenly she cried out badshaw the chinaman thrust his face inflamed with passion and desire close to hers you must you shall come to me by force if not willingly he growled by all the gods or devils but at that instant he was plucked from her by a resistless force and hurled violently to the ground dazed and half stunned he looked up and saw the elephant standing over him with one colossal foot poised over his prostrate body ready to crush him to pulp brave as the chinaman was he trembled with terror at the imminent awful death but a quiet voice sounded clear through the garden jane doe let him go the elephant brought the threatening foot to the ground but stood with curled trunk and ears cocked forward ready to annihilate him if the invisible speaker gave the word the girl shrank against the great animal clinging to it and looking with horror at the prostrate man the amban slowly dragged his bruised body from the ground and staggered shaken and dizzy out of the garden muriel kissed the soft trunk and laid her cheek against it and it curved to touch her hair with a gentle caress then she fled into the bungalow to find colonel dermot on the veranda grimly watching the chinaman stumbling blindly up the steep road his wife beside him opened her arms to the shaken girl he shall pay for that some day muriel said the political officer sternly but not yet an hour later the two women watched the snaking line crawl up the steep face of the mountains and through field glasses they could distinguish badshaw with his master on its neck the deb zimpoon and his followers and the tall form of the chinaman until all vanished from sight in the trees clothing the upper hills benson and carter left that afternoon muriel remaining to spend a little longer with her friend and as she told wargrave to try and regain the affections of the children which he had stolen from her frank was thinking of her the next day 
as he was standing on the mess veranda after tea cleaning his fowling piece when on a wooded spur running down from the mountains and sheltering the little station on the west he heard a jungle cock crowing in the undergrowth not a four hundred yards away seizing a handful of cartridges he loaded his gun and running down the steps and across the garden plunged into the jungle he walked cautiously his rope-soled boots enabling him to move silently and stopped occasionally to listen for the bird's crow or the telltale pattering over the dried leaves peering into the undergrowth and searching the ground he crept quietly forward suddenly his heart seemed to leap to his throat in a patch of dust he saw the unmistakable pug footprint of a large panther one claw had indented a new fallen leaf showing that the animal had very recently passed wardgrave halted and thought hard he had only his shotgun but the sun was near its setting and if he returned to the mess to get his rifle which was taken to pieces and locked up in its case darkness would probably fall before he could overtake the panther which was possibly moving on ahead of him so he resolved not to turn back but opened the breech of his gun and extracted the cartridges with his knife he cut their thick cases almost through all round at the wad dividing the powder from the shot for he knew that thus treated and fired the whole upper portion of the cartridges would be shot out of the barrels like solid bullets and carry forty yards without breaking up and scattering the shot reloading he advanced cautiously frequently losing and refinding the trail creeping through a clump of thin bushes he stopped suddenly frozen with horror and dread in an open patch of woodland the two dermot children stood by a tree the girl huddled against the trunk while the little boy had placed himself in front of her and with a small stick in his hand was bravely facing in her defence an animal crouching on the ground not twenty yards away it was a large panther belly to earth tail lashing from side to side it was crawling slowly imperceptibly nearer its prey with ears flattened against the skull and lips drawn back to bear the gleaming fangs in a devilish grin it snarled at the brave child whose dauntless attitude doubtless puzzled it don't cry eileen i won't let it hurt you said the little boy encouragingly go away nasty dog he raised his little stick above his head a boy should always protect a girl his father had often said so he was not going to let the beast harm his tiny sister the panther crouched lower the watcher in the bushes saw the powerful limbs gathering under the spotted body for the fatal spring every muscle and sinew was tense for the last rush and leap as the subaltern raised his gun end of chapter eight chapter nine of the jungle girl by gordon casserly this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c tigerland wargrave fired his shot struck the panther rather far back wounding but not disabling it it swung round to face its assailant seeing frank it promptly charged the second cartridge took it in front of the shoulder and raked its body from end to end coughing blood the beast rolled over and over 
biting its paws clawing savagely at the earth trying to rise and falling back in fury while frank rapidly reloaded and stepped between it and the children but the convulsions became fewer and less violent the limbs stiffened the beautiful black and yellow body sank inert to the ground the tail twitched a little a few tremors shook the panther then it lay still the subaltern turned eagerly to the children it's frank look eileen it's frank cried brian he's killed the nasty dog the little girl who had sunk to the ground struggled to her feet and with her brother was swept up in a joyous embrace by the subaltern then bidding the boy hold on to the sleeve of the arm carrying the gun wargrave started back with eileen perched on his shoulder as they passed the panther's body she looked down at it and clapped her hands he's deaded nasty bad dog she cried striking a path through the undergrowth the subaltern climbed down the steep ravine that lay between the hill and the political officer's bungalow as he struggled up the steep side of the mola he heard their mother calling the children with a note of inquietude in her voice and he answered her with a reassuring shout coming up on the level behind the low stone wall of the garden he found mrs dermot and muriel anxiously awaiting him mumsy hello mumsy here's me Frank shooted bad dog cried eileen waving her arms and kicking her bearer violently in her excitement yes mumsy frank killed the nasty dog that wanted to eat us added brian wardgrave passed the children over the wall into the anxious arms outstretched for them then vaulted into the garden what has happened mr wardgrave asked mrs dermot pressing her children to her nervously what is this about your shooting a dog the subaltern told the story briefly oh my babies my babies cried the mother with tears in her eyes clasping the mites to her breast and kissing them frantically the little woman who had many times faced death undauntedly at her husband's side broke down utterly at the thought of her children's peril she overwhelmed wargrave with her thanks while muriel complimented him on his promptness and presence of mind and then scolded the urchins for their disobedience in wandering away from the garden by themselves but the unrepentant pair smiled genially at her from the shelter of their mother's arms and assured her that frankie would always take care of them their mother even when she grew more composed could not be severe after so nearly losing them but although unwilling to terrify them by a recital of the awful fate from which the subaltern had saved them by the merest chance she impressed upon them again and again her oft-repeated warning that they must never leave the garden alone but they were not awed so bidding them thank and kiss him she bore them off to bed her eyes still full of tears wargrave sent a servant to fetch his orderly and the detachment mochi or cobbler to skin the panther the news of the death of which soon spread so major hunt and burke joined miss benson and the subaltern when they went to look at the body and numbers of sea boys streamed up from the fort to view the animal which had long been notorious in the station lamps had to be brought to finish the skinning of it and the hide when taken off was carried in triumph to the mess compound to be cured on the following afternoon on the tennis court in a corner of the parade ground 
Miss Benson was left with Burke and Wargrave when Mrs. Dermot had taken her children home at sunset. "'You've completely won her heart,' the girl said to the subaltern, pointing with her racket to the disappearing form of her friend. "'Nothing's too good for you for saving those precious mites. But she'll never let them out of her sight again until their big nurse returns.' you mean their elephant well of course he's marvelously well-trained animal but is he really so reliable that he can always be trusted to look after those children badshaw is something very much more than a well-trained animal perhaps some time out in the jungle you may understand why the natives regard him as sacred and call colonel dermot the god of the elephants you don't know Badshaw as we do. Well, old Burke here has told me some strange yarns about him, but as he's always pulling my leg, I never know when to believe him. The doctor grinned. We won't waste words on him, Captain Burke, said the girl. It's time to go home now. They escorted her to the Dermot's bungalow where the doctor lingered for a few more minutes in her society while wargrave climbed up to the mess and went to look at the panther's skin pegged out on the ground under a thick coating of ashes and now as hard as a board after a day's exposure to the burning sun a few days later miss benson left the station to rejoin her father in one of the three or four isolated wooden bungalows built to accommodate the forest officer in different parts of his district each one lost and lonely in the silent jungle for days after her departure burke was visibly depressed and wargrave too missed the bright and attractive girl who had enlivened the quiet little station during her stay a fortnight later colonel dermot returned from bhutan and his gratitude to the subaltern for the rescue of his children was sincere and heartfelt he was only too glad to take the young man out into the jungle on every possible occasion and continue his instruction in the ways of the forest this companionship and sport was particularly beneficial to wargrave just then for they served to take him out of himself and raise him from the state of depression into which he was falling thanks to violet's letters the tone of which was becoming more bitter each time she wrote her reply to his long and cheery epistle describing rangadwar's unusual burst of gaiety during the envoy's visit and his own rescue of the children was as follows you do not seem to miss me much among your new friends while i am leading a most unhappy and miserable life here you appear to be enjoying yourself and giving little thought to me you are lucky to have two such very beautiful ladies to make much of you and i dare say they think you a wonderful hero for saving the little brats who if they are like most children would not be much loss the mother seems extremely friendly to you for such a devoted wife as you try to make her out to be or perhaps it is the girl you admire most this marvellous young lady who shoots tigers and apparently manages the whole Terai forest. You say you love me, but you don't seem to be pining very much for me, while each day that comes since you left me is a fresh agony to me. You appear to contrive to be quite happy without me. This letter stung Wargrave like the lash of a whip across the face. To do Violet justice, no sooner had she sent it than she regretted it, but deeply hurt as he was by the bitter words he forgave her, for he felt that her life was indeed miserable, 
and that he was unconsciously in a great measure to blame for its being so but it maddened him to realize his present helplessness to alter matters he was more than willing to sacrifice himself to help her but it would be a long time before he could hope to save enough to pay his debts and make a home for her whether it was wicked or not to take away another man's wife did not occur to him all that he knew was that a woman was unhappy and he alone could help her it seemed to him that the sin if sin there were was the husband's who starved her heart and rendered her miserable in his distress work and sport proved his salvation he threw himself heart and soul into his duty and whenever there was nothing for him to do with the detachment major hunt encouraged him to go with the political officer into the jungle for little as he suspected it the senior guessed the young man's trouble and watched him sympathizingly one never to be forgotten day as wargrave was returning from afternoon parade colonel dermot called to him from his gate and showed him a telegram it ran tiger marked down come immediately dak bungalow mad pure dwar muriel as the subaltern perused it with delight the colonel said ask your c o for leave then if he gives it get something substantial to eat in the mess and be ready to start at once mad pur dewar is thirty odd miles away and will have to travel all night come to my bungalow as soon as you can half an hour later the two were trudging down the road to the pilkahana carrying their rifles badshaw with a howda roped on to his pad plodded behind them for it is far more comfortable to walk down a steep descent then be carried down it by an elephant at the foot of the hills they mounted and were borne away into the gathering shadows of the long road through the forest as they proceeded their talk was all of tigers for in india though there be bigger and more splendid game in the land its traditional animal never fails to interest and to wargrave on his way to his first tiger shoot all other topics were insignificant the sun went down and darkness settled on the forest the talk died away and no sound was heard but the soft padding of their elephant's huge feet in the dust of the road the subaltern soon found the howda infinitely more trying than a seat on the pad when badshaw was in motion for the plunging gait of the animal jerked him backwards and forwards and threw him against the wooden rails if he forgot to hold himself at arm's length from them the discomfort spoiled his appreciation of the strange attractive experience of being borne by night through the sleepless forest where in the dark hours only the bird and the monkey repose and even to them the creeping menace of the climbing snake affrights the one and the wheeling shapes of the night flying birds of prey scare the other but on the ground all are awake the glimmering whiteness of the road was occasionally blotted by the scurrying forms of animals hunted and hunters dashing across it once a tiny shriek in the distance broke the silence of the jungle a wild elephant said colonel dermot then followed the loud crashing of rending boughs and falling trees that's a herd feeding they graze until about ten o'clock and then sleep on well into the small hours wake and begin to feed again at dawn continued the political officer 
once a wild unearthly wailing cry that seemed to come from every direction at once startled the subaltern good heavens what's that he exclaimed gripping his rifle and trying to pierce the darkness around them only a giant owl was the reply it's an uncanny noise there right over their heads it rang out again and the stars above them were blotted out for a moment by a dark circling shape above the tree tops hour after hour went by as they were borne along through the night and wargrave bruised and battered by the how done rails fell constantly against them so overcome with sleep was he at last to his relief his companion called a halt for a few hours rest and they brought the elephant to his knees dismounted and stripped him of the howdah and pad sitting on the ladder they supped on sandwiches and coffee from thermos flasks and then stretched themselves to sleep while badshah standing over them grazed on the grasses and branches within reach wargrave was dropping off to sleep when he was roused by the sharp staccato bark of a kakur buck repeated several times the tired man lost consciousness and was sunk in profound slumber when the silence of the forest was shattered by a snorting braying roar that rang through the jungle with alarming suddenness wargrave sprang up and groped for his rifle but his companion lay tranquilly on the pad it's all right it's only a tiger that's missed his spring and is angry about it he said sleepily lie down again only a tiger sir repeated wargrave but it sounded close by yes but badshaw will look after us don't worry and the colonel turned over and fell asleep it was a little time however before frank followed his example and he had his rifle under his hand when he did but the dark bulk of the elephant towering over them comforted him as he sank to sleep a couple of hours later they were on their way again it was broad daylight before they emerged from the jungle it seemed strange to be out once more in the wide stretching open and cultivated plains and to look back on the great forest and beyond it to the mountains towering to the sky before them lay the flat expanse of the hedgeless fertile fields dotted here and there with clusters of trimly built huts or thick groves of bamboos and seamed with the lines of deep mullahs the tops of the trees in them barely showing above the level and marking their winding course the dak bungalow at madpur was soon reached a single-storied building with a couple of trees shading the well behind it and a group of elephants and their mahouts on the veranda benson and his daughter were standing the girl dressed in a khaki drill coat and a skirt over breeches and soft leather gaiters and waving a welcome to badshah's riders after a hurried breakfast the latter were ready to start for the day's sport by then a line of ten female elephants the tallest carrying a howdah the rest only their pads was drawn up before the bungalow and a word from their mahouts their trunks went up in the air and the animals trumpeted in salute as the party came out on the veranda we borrowed mr carter's and the settlement officer's elephants for the beat said miss benson as wearing a big pith sun hat and carrying a double-barreled four hundred cordite rifle she led the way down the veranda steps it had been arranged that she was to take wargrave with her in her howdah 
while her father accompanied colonel dermot on badshaw her big elephant knelt down and a ladder was laid against its side up which she climbed followed by the subaltern when all were mounted she led the way across the plain although the ground was everywhere level and just there uncultivated the elephants tailed off in single file as is the habit of their kind wild or domesticated each stepping with precise care into the footprints of the one in front of it here in the plains the heat was intense and wargrave shading his eyes from the blinding glare thought enviously of the coolness up in the mountains that he had left as they moved along muriel explained to him how the beat was to be conducted when the southern fringe of the terai jungle borders the cultivated country it is a favorite haunt of tigers which from its shelter carry on a war against the farmer's cattle creeping down the ravines seeming the soft soil and worn by the streams that flow through the forest from the hills they pull down the cows grazing or coming to drink in the mullahs which are filled with small trees and scrubs affording good cover a tiger when it is killed drags the carcass of its prey into shade near water eats a hearty meal of about eighty pounds of flesh drinks and then sleeps until it is ready to feed again if disturbed it retreats up the ravine to the forest so beating for one with elephants here the sportsmen place themselves on their howdah bearing animals between the jungle and the spot where the tiger is known to be lying up and the beater elephants enter the scrub from the far side and shepherd him gently towards the guns pointing to a distant line of treetops showing above the level plain she said there is the mullah in which about a mile farther on a cow was killed yesterday i hope the tiger is still lying up in it we'll soon see they reached the ravine which was twenty or thirty feet deep and contained a little stream flowing through tangled scrub and moved along parallel to it and about a couple hundred yards away presently the girl pointed to a tree growing in it and a quarter of a mile ahead of them its upper branches were bending under the weight of numbers of foul-looking bald-headed vultures squawking huddled together jostling each other on their perches and pecking angrily at their neighbors with irritable cries some circled in the air and occasionally swooped down towards the ground only to rock it up again affrightedly to the sky for the tiger lay by its kill and resented the approach of any daring bird that aspired to share the feast muriel hurriedly explained how the conduct of the birds indicated the beast's presence if he were not there they'd be down tearing the carcass to pieces she said as she held up her hand and halted the file behind her the beater elephants had better stop here colonel she called out to dermot there is a way down and across the mullah by which you can take badshaw to the far side we will remain on this the political officer who was seen and realized the significance of the vultures waved his hand and moved off at once muriel called up the mahouts and bade them enter the ravine and begin the beat in about ten minutes then told her driver to go on half a mile beyond the tree she ordered him to halt and take up a position close to the edge of the nullah in which they could look down 
below them the bottom was clear of scrub which ended fifty yards away dermot stopped opposite and both elephants were turned to face towards the spot where the tiger was judged to be mr wargrave get to the front of the howdah and be ready she said in a low tone the subaltern protested chivalrously against taking the best place oh it's all right we've brought you out to get the tiger so you must do as you're told if he breaks out this side take the first shot she said peremptorily he submitted and took up his position with cocked rifle as the nullah wound a good deal the tops of the trees in it prevented them from seeing if the beater elephants had gone in but in a few minutes they heard distant shouts and the crashing of the undergrowth as the big animals forced their way through the scrub be ready mr wargrave whispered the girl sometimes a tiger starts on the run at the first sound his nerves a quiver and his heart beating violently the subaltern held his rifle at the ready as the noise of the beaters drew nearer again and again he brought the butt to his shoulder only to lower it when he realized that it was a false alarm the sounds of the beat grew louder and closer and still there was no sign of the tiger frank's heart sank he saw the vultures stir uneasily and some rise in the air as the elephants passed under them at last through the trees he began to catch occasional glimpses of the malhuts and he lost hope but suddenly from the scrub below them in the nola a number of small birds flew up and the next instant the edge of the bushes nearest them was parted stealthily and a tiger slunk cautiously out in the bottom of the ravine wargrave's rifle went up to his shoulder and he fired a startled roar from the beast told that it was hit but it bounded in a flash across the ravine and up the steep bank on the other side on their side not forty yards from them as it scrambled swiftly over the edge it caught sight of the elephant and with a deep woof charged straight at it frank fired again and his bullet struck up the dust missing the swift rushing animal by a couple of feet the next moment with a roar the tiger sprang at the elephant with one leap it landed with its hind paws on the elephant's head its four feet on the front rail of the howdah standing right over the mahout who crouched in terror on the neck the savage snarling yellow and black mask was thrust almost into wargrave's face and from the open red mouth lined with fierce white fangs he could feel the hot breath on his cheek as he tugged frantically at the under lever of his rifle to open the breech and reload in another moment the tiger would have been on top of them in the howdah when a gun barrel shot past the subaltern and pushed him aside the muzzle of muriel's rifle was pressed almost against the brute's skull as she fired frank hardly heard the report all he knew was that the snarling face disappeared as quickly as it had come the whole thing was an affair of seconds shot through the brain the tiger dropped back to the ground with a heavy thud and fell dead beside the staunch elephant which had never moved all through the terrible ordeal a cry of relief and a prayer to allah burst from the grey-bearded mohammedan mahout as he straightened himself and wargrave turned with glowing face and outstretched hand to the girl oh well done splendidly done he cried 
you saved me from being lugged bodily out of the howdah or at least from being mauled this lever jammed and i couldn't reload her eyes shining and face beaming with excitement she shook his hand wasn't it thrilling i thought he'd have both of us then to the mahout she continued in urdu gul dad are you hurt the man was solemnly feeling himself all over he stared at a rent in the shoulder of his coat torn by the tiger's claw it was the only injury that he had suffered he put his finger on it and grumbled missy baba the shatan devil has torn my coat in their reaction from the strain the girl and wargrave went off in peals of laughter at his words but are you not wounded miss benson repeated has it not clawed you the mahout shook his head no missy baba but it was my new coat he insisted frank looked down at the tiger stretched motionless on the yellow grass by george you shot him dead enough miss benson he exclaimed she stared down at the animal yes but it's well to be careful i've seen a tiger look as dead as that and yet spring up and maul a man who approached it incautiously she said she raised her rifle and covered the prostrate animal throw something at it she continued wargrave took out a couple of heavy copper case cartridges and flung them one by one at the tiger's head striking it on the jaw and in the eye the animal did not move seems dead enough said the girl lowering her rifle here come the beaters the other elephants had now burst out in line through the scrub their mahouts shouted inquiries to gold dad and when they heard of the tiger's death cheered gleefully for it meant back sheesh to them badshah was seen to be searching for a way down into the mola and in a few minutes brought his passengers up alongside miss benson and the subaltern her father and dermot congratulated the girl warmly and the latter having made badshah kick the tiger to make certain that it was dead dismounted and examined it here's your shot wargrave he said pointing to a hole in the belly a bit too low but it made a nasty wound that would have killed the beast eventually i'm so ashamed of missing it with my second barrel sir said the subaltern but for miss benson i'd have been a gone coon yes it certainly looked exciting enough from our side of the mola said the colonel smiling so what must it have been like from where you were well anyhow it's your tiger oh nonsense sir it's miss benson's i ought to be kicked for being such a muff jungle law mr wargrave said the girl laughing you hit it first so it's your beast you needn't be ashamed of missing it added the colonel a charging tiger coming full speed at you is not an easy mark no the skin is yours and muriel has so many that she can spare it well miss benson i accept it as a gift from you but i won't acknowledge that i earned it said the subaltern now we'd better pat it and see about getting back said dermot looking at his watch the other elephants had now found their way up the bank and joined badshah and his companion when their mahouts heard from goldad the story of the tiger's death they exclaimed in amazement and admiration ah re chai o brother truly the missy baba is a wonder she will be the death of many tigers indeed 
they said then each in turn brought the elephant up to the prostrate animal and made her smell and strike it with her trunk in order to inspire her with contempt for tigers colonel dermot measured it with a tape and found it to be nine feet six inches from nose to tip of tail it was a young fully grown male in splendid condition then came the troublesome business of padding it that is hoisting it on the pad of one of the elephants to bring it back to the bungalow to be skinned it was not an easy matter for the tiger weighed nearly three hundred and fifty pounds and to raise the limp carcass which sagged like a feather bed at every spot where there was not a man to support it was a difficult task but it was achieved at last and with the tiger roped firmly on a pad the elephant started back in single file as they went over the plain in the burning sun wargrave looked back to where the straight body was borne along with stiff dangling legs by jove it's been great miss benson he exclaimed some people say tiger shooting's not exciting they ought to have been with us today i am lucky to have got a bison already and now to have seen this with luck i'll be having a shot at an elephant next the girl replied in a serious tone don't say that to colonel dermot elephants are his especial friends besides you are only allowed to shoot rogues and since he's been here there have been none in these jungles which formerly swarmed with them there's no doubt that he has a wonderful uncanny control over even wild elephants do you know that once a rajah tried to have him killed in his place by a mad tusker which had just slaughtered several men and the moment the brute got face to face with him it was cowed and obeyed him like a dog good gracious is that so yes i could tell you even more extraordinary things about his power over elephants but some day when you're in the jungle with him you may see it for yourself oh isn't it hot i do wish we were home arrived at the dak bungalow the tiger's carcass was lowered to the ground and given over to the knives of the flayers summoned from the bazaar of mapur dwar a mile away as soon as the news was known in the small town crowds of hindu women streamed to the bungalow compound where their saris shawls pulled modestly across their brown faces by rounded arms tinkling with glass bangles they squatted on the ground and waited patiently until the skin was drawn clear off the raw red carcass then they crowded around a couple of the older mahouts who first cutting off all the firm white fat of the well-fed cattle thief to be melted down for oil esteemed to be a sovereign remedy for rheumatism hacked the flesh into chunks which they then threw into the eager hands of the women these took the meat home to cook for their husbands to eat to instill into them the spirit and vigor of a tiger the skin spread out and pegged to the ground was covered with wood ashes and left to dry little of the animal was left but the bones to the disappointment of the wheeling whistling kites waiting on soaring wings in the sky above after tea the two officers took their leave with many expressions of gratitude from the younger man to the girl for her kindness in arranging the beat for him hours afterwards as they halted in the forest for a rest in the middle of the night colonel dermot said you told me once that you'd like a job like mine wargrave would you care for frontier political work here i'd love it sir 
exclaimed the subaltern enthusiastically would it be possible to get it well i've been thinking for some time of applying to the government of india for an assistant political officer who would help me and take over if i went on leave but i'd want to train my own man and not merely accept any youngster who was pitchforked into the department just because he had a father or an uncle with a pull at simla now if you'd like i'll apply for you on condition that you'll work at bhutanese and the frontier dialects i'll teach them to you i'd like nothing better sir i'm not bad at languages yes i've noticed that your hindustani is very good and idiomatic i've been watching you and i like your manner with natives one must be sympathetic kind and just but also firm with them well i'll try you the rainy season will be on us very soon and then all outdoor work and sport will be impossible one dare not go into the jungle it's too full of malaria and blackwater fever the planters and forest officers have to cage themselves in wire gauze mosquito houses during the rains you'll have plenty of time to work at the languages thank you very much colonel i promise you i'll go at them hard you'll have a fellow student for part of the time miss benson's coming to stay with us during the monsoons for a bit and she asked me to teach her bhutanese too she wants it as she has to deal with bhutia woodcutters and hill folk generally well that's fixed good night good night sir answered the subaltern as he lay down on the pad and stared at the stars he was overjoyed at colonel dermot's offer and as he dropped asleep it was with a thrill of pleasure that he realized he would see something more of the girl who had been his companion that day end of chapter nine chapter ten of the jungle girl by gordon casserly this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c a political officer in the making the lightning spattered the heavens and tore the black sky into a thousand fragments the thunder crashed in appalling peals of terrifying sound which echoed again and again from the invisible mountains the rain fell in ropes of water that sent the brown foam-flecked torrents surging full fled down every gully and ravine in the mist-wrapped hills the single steep road of ranga dwar was now the rocky bed of a racing flood inches deep that swirled and raged round wargrave's high rubber boots as he waded up towards the mess clad in an oilskin coat off which the rain splashed he was glad to arrive at the garden gate turn in through it climb the veranda steps and reach his door here he flung aside his coat and kicked off the heavy boots entering his room he pulled on his slippers filled his pipe with tobacco from a lime-dried bottle and sat down at one rickety table at the window then he took out of his pocket and laid before him a manuscript book filled with notes on the frontier dialects taken at the lesson with colonel dermot from which he had just come he opened it mechanically but did not even glance at it his thoughts were elsewhere months had elapsed since the day on which he had first seen his first tiger killed not long afterwards the rains had come to put a stop to descents into the jungle 
but his interest in the preparation for his new work compensated him for the imprisonment within the walls by the terrible tropical storms and the never-ceasing downpour he had flung himself enthusiastically into the study of the frontier languages of which colonel dermot proved to be a painstaking and able teacher miss benson who had returned to ranguadoir and remained there longer than she had originally intended owing to fever contracted in the jungle joined him in these studies and astonished her fellow pupil by her aptitude and quickness of apprehension but her presence proved disastrous to him thrown constantly together as they were spending hours every day side by side the subaltern realized to his dismay that he was falling in love with the girl it would have been strange had it been otherwise so pretty and attractive was she often mrs dermot peeping into her husband's office and seeing the dark and the fair head bent close together over a book smiled to herself well pleased at the thought of her favorites being mutually attracted to her husband the thought never occurred men are very dull in these matters but to wargrave the realization of the truth was unbearable he was pledged to another woman whose heart he had won even if unconsciously who was willing for love of him to give up everything and face the world's censor and scorn he could not play her false he had given her his word he could not now be disloyal to her without utterly wrecking all her chances of happiness in life and dishonoring himself for ever in his own eyes muriel benson had left the station ten days ago to rejoin her father and wargrave had instantly felt that he dared not see her again until he was irrevocably and openly bound to violet so he had written to her on the morrow of the girl's departure and without giving her the real reason for his action begged her to come to him at once enclosing as he was now able to do a check for her expenses it seemed to him that only by her presence could he be saved from being a traitor to his word as soon as he had sent the letter he went to his commanding officer and told him everything it was not until he was actually explaining his conduct that he realized that he should have obtained his permission before inviting violet to come for major hunt as commandant of the station had the power to forbid her residing in or even entering it the senior officer listened in silence when the subaltern had finished he said i've known about this matter since you came wargrave your colonel wrote me as your new c o what i considered an unnecessary and unfair letter giving me the reason of you being sent here but hepburn who i know slightly discovered i was here and also wrote explaining matters more fully and i think more justly the subaltern looked at him in surprise but his face brightened at the knowledge of his former commander's kindness now wargrave we've got on very well together so far you and i i have always been satisfied with your work and was glad to help you by agreeing to colonel dermot's application for you i believe that you will make a good political officer otherwise i wouldn't have done so even though i'm your debtor for saving me from that snake oh major that was nothing broke in the subaltern any one would have done it yes i know but it happened that you were the anyone now 
i'm going to talk to you as your friend and not as your commanding officer frankly i am very sorry for what you have just told me i was hoping that time and separation were curing you and the lady of your folly believe me only unhappiness and misery can come to you both from it perhaps so sir but i'm bound in honour the older man shook his head sadly is honour the word for it i'll make a confession to you wargrave you consider me a bachelor well i'm not married now but i was when i was a young subaltern i was thrown much with a married woman older than myself i was flattered that she should take any notice of me for she was handsome and popular with men while i was a shy awkward boy she said she was being a mother to me you know what a married woman mothering boys leads to in india she used to tell me how misunderstood she was neglected mated to a clown and all that frank grew red at certain memories women have a regular formula when they're looking for sympathy they've no right to i pitied her i felt that her husband ought to be shot looking back now i see that he was just the ordinary easy-going indifferent individual that most husbands become but then i deemed him a tyrant and a brute well i ran away with her he paused and passed his hand wearily across his brow there was the usual scandal divorce damages and costs that plundered me into debt i'm not out of yet we married in a year we were heartily sick of each other hated is nearer the truth she consoled herself with other men i protested we quarrelled again and again at last we agreed to separate and i insisted on her going to england and staying there i couldn't trust her in india living in lodgings and bayswater boarding houses wasn't amusing she got bored but i wouldn't have her back she took to drinking and ran up debts that i had to pay then and i selfishly felt glad but it was a happy release for both she died drank herself to death now you know why i'd be sorry that another man should follow the path i trod he was silent wargrave felt an intense sympathy for this quiet kindly man whose life had been a tragedy he had guessed from the first that his senior officer had some ever-present grief weighing on his soul he would have given much to be able to utter words of consolation but he did not know what to say major hunt spoke again you must dree your own weird wargrave if the lady wishes to come here well i shall not prevent her but the general when he knows of it will not permit her to remain but you have to deal with colonel dermot you had better tell him you might go now without a word the subaltern left the bungalow he went straight to the political officer and repeated his story colonel dermot did not interrupt him but when he had finished said i have no right and no wish to interfere with your private life wargrave nor to offer you advice as to how to lead it your work is all that i can claim to criticize of course i see with major hunt the difficulty that will arise over the ladies remaining in this small station where her presence must be known to the staff if you are both resolved on taking this irretrievable step 
it would be wiser to defer it until you were elsewhere i don't offer to blame either of you for i don't know enough to judge well sir i perhaps you won't want me under you and mrs dermot you mightn't wish me to stammered the subaltern standing miserably before him oh yes you'll make a good political officer none the less said the colonel smiling and you need not be afraid of my wife turning away from you with horror if she can be a friend to the lady she will as for you well you saved our children wargrave he laid his hand on the young man's shoulder you are our friend for life i shall not repeat your story to my wife perhaps some day you may like to tell it to her yourself wargrave tried to thank him gratefully but failed and picking up his hat went out into the rain that was days ago and no answer had come from violet so that the subaltern lived in a state of strain and anxious expectation indeed some weeks had passed since her last letter as usual an unhappy one and sitting staring out into the grey world of falling rain turned to flame every minute by the vivid lightning he racked his brains to guess the reason of her silence a jangle of bells sounded through the storm glancing out wargrave saw a curiously grotesque figure climb the veranda steps from the garden and stand shaking itself while the water poured from it it was an almost naked man squat and sturdy limbed with glistening wet brown skin an oilskin covered package on his back a short spear hung with bells in his hand it was the postman for a miserable pittance he jogged up and down the mountains in fine weather or foul carrying his majesty's mails passing fearlessly through the jungle in peril of wild beasts his ridiculous weapon the bells of which were supposed to frighten tigers his only protection wargrave opened the door and went out to him the man grinned unslung and opened his parcel from it he took out a bundle of letters handed them to the subaltern and went on to knock at burke's door with his correspondence frank returned to his room with the mail which contained the official letters for the detachment of which he was still acting as adjunct he threw them aside when he saw an envelope with violet's handwriting on it he tore it open eagerly to his surprise the letter was addressed from a hotel in Pune, the large and gay military and civil station in the west of india a few hours rail journey inland from bombay he skimmed through it rapidly she wrote that utterly weary of the dullness of rohar she had gone to Pune to spend part of the festive and fashionable season there and was now reveling in the many dances dinners theatricals and other gaieties of the lively station everybody was very kind to her especially the men she was invited to the private entertainments at government house and his excellency the governor always danced with her her program was crowded at every ball and she had been asked to take one of the leading parts in the country girl to be produced by the amateur dramatic society she had two excellent ponies with which to hunt and to join in gimahanas she wished frank could be with her but probably he was enjoying himself more with his wild beasts and tiger girls as to his proposal that she should go to him at once 
in that little station he must have been mad when he made it for had they not discussed the matter thoroughly and decided they must wait she presumed that he had not suddenly come into a fortune from his description of rangadwar and its inhabitants it could be no place for her under the circumstances no there was nothing to do but wait besides it was so very jolly now at puna frank must not be an impatient boy and she sent him all her love his check she had torn up the subaltern whistled read the letter again very carefully folded and put it away what had come to violet this was so unlike her still she had to confess to himself that she was relieved at not yet having to cross the rubicon perhaps she was right it might be better to wait he was glad to know that for a time at least she was away from the uncongenial surroundings of rohar and again enjoying life he went through the official correspondence shoved it in his pocket put on coat and boots and splashed through the water down the road to the commanding officer's bungalow when they had discussed the official letters and drafted answers to them wargrave told major hunt of the gist of violet's reply the senior officer nodded but said nothing about it and went on to talk of other matters next day the subaltern informed colonel dermot who made no comment and did not refer to the matter again his wife ignorant of mrs norton's existence delighted to talk to wargrave about muriel a topic always interesting to him dangerous though it was to his peace of mind his thoughts were constantly with the girl and he sought eagerly for news of her when occasional letters came to mrs dermot from her touring their wide forest district with her father frank had never been able to fathom burke's feelings towards her the irishman's manner to her in public was always light-hearted and cheerfully friendly but the subaltern suspected that it concealed a deeper warmer feeling he betrayed no jealousy of frank's constant companionship with her when she took part in his studies and his friendly regard for his younger brother officer never altered on her side the girl showed openly that she shared the universal liking that the kindly peasant natured doctor inspired the weary months of the rainy season dragged by but the subaltern spent them to advantage under colonel dermot's tuition and possessing the knack of readily acquiring foreign languages made rapid progress with bhutanese tibetan and the frontier dialects his good ear for music helping him greatly in getting the correct accent another accomplishment of his a talent for acting was of service for the political officer wished him to be capable of penetrating into bhutan in disguise if need be so he taught him how to be a merchant peasant nobleman's retainer or a lama red or yellow of the country but always a man of northern bhutan and the tibetan borderland for his height and blue eyes were not usual there though seldom or never seen in the south frank was carefully instructed in the appropriate manners customs and expressions of each part that he played how to eat and behave in company how to walk sit and sleep but he specialized as a lama for in that character he would meet 
with the least interference in the priest-ridden country he was taught the buddhist chants and how to drone them how to carry his praying wheel and finger a rosary to the murmured om mani pami hung of the tibetans and for he was something of an artist how to paint the buddhist pictorial wheel of life the sid pa e kor lo or cycle of existence that the gentle guatama the buddha himself drew first and that hangs in the vestibule of every lamasery to teach priest and laymen the leading law of their religion rebirth colonel dermot was helped in his instruction of his pupil by his chief spy and confidential messenger an ex-monk from a great monastery in pukana the capital of bhutan this man tashi before he wearied of the cloistered life and fled to india had been always one of the principal actors in the great miracle plays and devil dances of his lamasery for he was gifted with considerable histronic talent he delighted in teaching wargrave to play his various roles for he found the subaltern an apt pupil as soon as the rains ended the political officer began to take his disciple with him on his tours and patrols along the frontier along they roamed on badshah among the mountains on which the border ran in a confusedly irregular line sometimes with or without tashi they crossed into bhutan in disguise and watered among the steep forest-clad hills and deep unhealthy valleys seamed with rivers prone to sudden floods that rose in a few hours thirty or forty feet wargrave marvelled at the engineering skill of the inhabitants who with rude and imperfect appliances had thrown cantilever bridges over the deep gorges of this mountainous southern zone among the dull-witted peasants in the villages he practised the parts that he had learned speaking little at first and taking care to mingle tibetan and chinese words with the language of bhutan to keep up the fable of his northern birth he soon promised to be in time as skilful in disguise as his tutor colonel dermot was anxious to investigate the activities of the chinese amban reputed to reach their height in the territory just across the indian border ruled by the tuna pelope and lying west of the black mountain range that divides bhutan this great feudal chieftain was reputed to be completely under the influence of wan shi hung and both anti-british and disloyal to his overlord the maraja or songa penulp the close watch that his martyrdoms kept on the stretch of frontier between his territories and india prevented dermot from learning what went on behind the scene for the spies of the political officers secret screens could not penetrate it and bring back news wargrave was present when the last sturdy-limbed bhutia emissary reported his failure to cross the line as the man withdrew the colonel turned to frank and said we go ourselves i wanted to avoid it if possible for it wouldn't do for me to be caught not only because it would cause political complications for i'm not supposed to trespass on Bhutanese territory uninvited but also because fatal accidents might happen to us if yon shi hung 
and his friends get hold of us i'm not anxious to die yet be ready to start at midnight do you really think we'll be able to get through sir queried the subaltern how shall we do it wait and see before the sun rose next day bashaw was deep in the forest bearing the two officers and tashi on his back he moved rapidly along animal paths through the jungle into a direction paralleled with the mountains jungle fowl whirred up from under his feet deer crashed away through the undergrowth as he passed but never a shot was fired at them though rifles and guns were in the riders hands little brown monkeys peeped down at them from the tree tops or kept leaping away along the air lanes among the leafy branches swinging by hand or foot springing across the voids the babies clutching fast to their mothers bodies in the dizzy flights in the afternoon a distant crashing which told of trees falling before the pressure of great heads and the weight of huge bodies made wargrave ask wild elephants sir dermot nodded sounds as if they were right in our path shall we see them yes don't touch that said the colonel sharply for the excited subaltern who had never yet seen a wild herd was reaching for his rifle wargrave obeyed remembering miss benson's remark on the political officer's love of the great animals soon unmistakable signs showed they were on the track of a herd and presently frank caught sight of a slate-colored body in the undergrowth then another and another as he was wondering how the animals would receive them bagshot emerged on an open glade filled with elephants of all ages and sizes from newborn woolly calves a bare three feet at the shoulder to splendid tuskers nine feet ten inches in height and lean ragged-eared old animals a hundred and thirty years of age all were regarding the newcomer and their trunks were raised to point towards him while from their throats came a low purring sound which appeared to the subaltern to have more of pleasure than menace in it instead of seeming hostile or alarmed they behaved as though they had expected and were whelming their domesticated brother this was so evident that frank felt no fear even when they closed in on badshaw and touched him with their trunks dermot smiling at his companion's amazement said this is badshaw's old herd wargrave and they're used to him and me i've come in search of them for it is by their aid that i propose to enter bhutan and the subaltern was still more surprised when the animals which numbered over a hundred fell in behind bagshaw cows with calves leading tuskers in rear and followed him submissively in single file as he headed for the mountains when night fell they were climbing above the foothills under the vivid tropic stars a couple of hours before midnight the leader halted and the line behind him scattered to feed on the bamboos and the luscious grasses even though the younger calves nuzzled their mother's breasts bashaw sank to his knees to allow his passengers to dismount and relieve him of his pad three men ate and then wrapped themselves in their blankets for it was very cold high up in the mountains and stretched themselves to sleep as the great animals around them ceased to feed and rested 
bagshaw lowered himself cautiously to the ground and lay down near his men before wargrave lost consciousness he marvelled at dermot's uncanny power over the huge beasts around them a power that could make the shy mammoths thus subservient to his purposes he began to understand why his companion was regarded as a demigod by the wild jungle folk and hill dwellers when at daybreak the herd moved on again climbing over higher in the mountains the three men lay flat on badshaw's back and covered themselves with their gray blankets less vigilant watchers on the peaks around might espy them thus do the malhoots of the kunkies or trained female elephants employed in hunting and snaring wild tuskers concealed themselves during the chase but darkness shielded them effectively when the herd swept at length through a rocky pass on the frontier line between india and bhutan and with cries of fear and dismay armed men seated around watch fires fled in panic before the earth-shaking host the screen was penetrated daylight found them on the banks of a broad swift-flowing river in a valley between the range of mountains through which they had passed and a line of still more formidable and snow-clad peaks the elephants swam the wide and rushing water for all land animals their kind are the best swimmers the tiniest babies were supported by the trunks of their mothers on to whose backs older calves climbed and were thus carried across without stopping the herd plunged into the awful passes of the next range of which they were not clear until the evening of the following day then they halted in dense forest next morning dermot took from the pockets of badshaw's pad the dresses and other things that they needed for their disguises and instead of replacing the pad concealed it carefully then he said we'll leave our escort here wargrave and carry on by ourselves for we are not far from inhabited and cultivated country and indeed fairly near the jong castle of our enemy penelope of tuna the wild elephants were feeding all around paying no heed to them the colonel turned to badshaw and pointing to the ground said one word raho remain then he continued to wargrave we'll find them or they'll find us whenever we return an hour later two elderly lamas in soiled yellow robes and horn-rimmed spectacles followed by a lame coolie carrying their scanty possessions emerged rosary and praying wheel in hand from the forest into the cultivated country for some weeks they wandered unsuspected through the tuna panalp's dominions even penetrated into his own jong where they were entertained and their prayers solicited by his cutthroat retainers they learned enough to realize that the amban was endeavoring by the free supply of arms and military instructors to form here the nucleus of a trained force to be employed eventually against india backed up by reinforcements of chinese troops and contingents from other parts of bhutan their investigations completed they returned safely to the forest in which they had left the herd and much to wargrave's relief they had not been many hours camped on the spot where they had parted with them when badshaw and his wild companions appeared the spies returned to india as they had come unseen and unsuspected this excursion was but 
the first of many that wargrave made with the colonel and the herd he soon began to know almost every member of it and make friends not only with the solemn but friendly little calves but even with their less trusting mothers he was now thoroughly at home in the jungle and no longer needed a tutor in sport his one room in the mess began to be overcrowded with trophies of his skill with the rifle other tiger skins had joined the first and although he had not secured a second bison several good heads of sambar kakur and chetul or spotted deer hung on his whitewashed stone walls thus with sport and work more fascinating than sport wargrave found the months slipping by from raymond he learned that violet had returned to rohar before she wrote herself when she did she seemed to be in a brighter and more affectionate as well as calmer mood than she had been before her visit to puna but gradually her letters became less and less frequent and frank began to wonder with a little sense of guilty shamed hope if she were beginning to forget him christmas came and with it coming rango Dwar woke again to life besides the bensons and carter who now brought his wife mrs dermot's brother a subaltern in an indian cavalry regiment and five planters old friends of his from the district in which he had once been a planter himself came to spend christmas in the small station major hunt's bungalow and the mess took in the overflow from the political officer's house brian and eileen had the gayest happiest time of their little lives presents were heaped on them muriel and frank initiated them into all the delights of their first christmas tree and burke introduced them to a real punch and judy show on christmas day badshaw his neck encircled with a garland of flowers procured from the plains was led up solemnly by his seldom seen mahout to present colonel dermot with a gilded lime and receive in return a present of silver rupees which passed into the possession of the said mahout then he was fed with dainties by the children and aline insisted on being tossed aloft by the curved trunk to the detriment of her starched party frock the weather was appropriate to the season cold and bright and although no snow fell so low down it froze at night so that the europeans could indulge in the luxury in india of gathering around blazing wood fires after dinner all young and old thoroughly enjoyed this almost english like christmas all but one burke's attentions to muriel became more marked and more full of meaning than they had ever been before and it was patent that he intended to put his fate to the touch during this visit of hers he did so without success it seemed for before she left there was an evident sense of constraint between them and they tried to avoid sitting beside each other or being left alone together even for a moment shortly after the departure of the visitors burke contrived to effect an exchange to another station to the regret of all in the little outpost and he was replaced by a young scots surgeon named macdonald his opposite in every way end of chapter ten chapter eleven of the jungle girl by gordon casserly 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tragedy. The annual Durber for the reception of the Bhutan envoy and the payment of the subsidy had come and gone again. The Deb Zimpan, who had not been accompanied by the Chinese Amban on this occasion, had departed. And of the few European visitors, only Muriel Benson remained. Colonel Dermot had been called away to Simba to confer with officials of the Foreign Department on matters of frontier policy. Major Hunt was ill with fever, leaving Wargrave, who was still nominally attached to the military police in command of the detachment. It was delicious torture to Frank to be in the same place again with Muriel, to see her from the parade ground or the mess veranda, playing in the garden with the children, to meet her every day and talk to her, and yet be obliged to school his lips and keep them from uttering the words that trembled on them. A few nights after the Durber, he dined with Mrs. Dermot and Muriel, and was sitting on the veranda of the political officer's house with them after dinner. He was wearing white mess uniform. The evening was warm and very still, and whenever the conversation died away, no sound save the monotonous note of the night jars or the sudden cry of a barking deer broke the silence since the echoes of the lights-out bugle call had died away among the hills. Wargrave looked at his watch. It's past eleven o'clock, he said. I'd no idea it was so late. I ought to get up and say good night, but I'm so comfortable here, Mrs. Dermot. His hostess smiled lazily at him, but made no reply. Again a peaceful hush fell on them. With startling suddenness it was broken. From the fort four hundred yards away, a rifle shot rang out, rending the silence of the night and reverberating among the hills around. Wargrave sprang to his feet as shouts followed and a bugle shrilled out the sound-gripping alarm the call that sends a thrill through every soldier's frame, for always it tells of disaster. Heard thus at night in barracks, swift following on a shot, it spoke of crime, of murder, the black murder of a comrade. The two women had risen anxiously. What is it? Oh, what is it? they asked. The subaltern spoke lightly to reassure them. Nothing much, I expect. Some man on guard fooling with his rifle let it off by accident, he said quietly. Excuse me, I'd better stroll across to the fort and see. But Mrs. Dermot stopped him. Wait a moment, please, Mr. Wargrave, she said, running into the house. She returned immediately with her husband's big automatic pistol and handed it to him. In her left hand, she held a smaller one. Take this with you. It's loaded, she said. Frank thanked her, said good night to both calmly, and walked down the garden path. But the anxious women heard him running swiftly across the parade ground. What is it, Noreen? What does it mean? asked the girl nervously. A sepoy running amok, I'm afraid, replied her friend. He shot someone. She swung round, pistol raised. Cohen, hi. Who's that? she called out. A man had come noiselessly to on to the shadowed end of the veranda. It is I, Mem Sahib, answered Sher her Punjabi Mohammedan butler. He had been in her service for five years and was devoted to her and hers. 
he was carrying a rifle for his master at his request had long ago given him arms to protect his mem sahib before her marriage he had once fought almost to the death to defend her when her brother's bungalow had been attacked by rebels during a rising it would be well to go into the house and put out the lights maham sabib he said quietly in hindustani there is danger tonight as he spoke he extinguished the lamp on the veranda and closed the doors of the house a second armed servant came quietly on to the veranda and the butler melted into the darkness of the garden but they heard him go to the gate as if to guard it you had better go inside muriel said mrs dermot but made no move to do it herself the girl did not appear to hear her she was listening intently for any sound from the fort but silence had fallen on it muriel won't you go into the house repeated her hostess eh what no i couldn't i must stay here replied miss benson impatiently in the black darkness the other women could not see her but she felt the girl's every sense was alert and strained to the utmost she moved to her and put her arm about her against it she could feel muriel's heart beating violently suddenly from the fort came the noise of heavy blows and a crash instantly followed by a shot and then fierce cries oh my god what is happening murmured the girl her hand on her heart presently there came the sound of running feet and heavy boots clattered up the rocky road towards the mess past the gate then the butler's voice rang out in challenge kon jatha who goes there a panting voice answered wargrave sahib murga dr sahib ko blana ko jaka wargrave sahib is killed i go to call the doctor sahib and the sepoy ran on in the darkness oh god oh god cried the girl and tried to break from her friend's clasp let me go let me go where to asked noreen holding the frenzied girl with all her strength to him he's dead didn't you hear he's dead i must go to him she struggled madly and beat fiercely at the hands that held her let me go let me go oh he's dead she wailed dead and i loved him so oh be merciful let me go to him and suddenly her strength gave way and she clasped into noreen's arms weeping bitterly they heard the clattering steps meet others coming down the hill and a hurried conversation ensued noreen recognized one of the voices then both men came running down it's the doctor said mrs dermot come to the gate and we'll ask him what has happened mr macdonald mr macdonald she cried as the hurrying footsteps grew near who's that mrs dermot for god's sake get into the house there's a man running amuck wargrave's killed i'm wanted and the doctor taking no thought of danger to himself when there was need of his skill ran on into the darkness i must i will go cried muriel very well perhaps it's not true we must know we may be able to help replied her friend and with a word to share a soul to guard her babies from danger she seized muriel's hand and the two girls ran towards the fort in the track that wargrave had followed to his death it seemed pistol in hand wargrave had raced across the parade ground 
at the gate of the fort he was challenged and when he answered an indian officer came out of the darkness to him sahib he said hurriedly how the dar mohammed ashraf khan has been shot in his bed in barracks the sentry over the magazine is missing with his rifle wargrave entered the fort opposite the guard room the detachment was falling in rapidly the men carrying their rifles and running up from their barrack rooms in various stages of undress by the flickering light of a lantern held up for him a non-commissioned officer was calling the roll and his voice rumbled along in monotonous tones the guard was standing under arms put out that lamp cried the subaltern sharply it would only serve to light up other marks for the invisible assassin if like most men who run amok he meant to keep on killing until slain himself no take it into the guard room and shut the door in the darkness the silence was intense broken only by the heavy breathing of the unseen men and the clattering of the feet of some late comer suddenly there rang out through the night the most appalling sound that had ever assailed wargrave's ears it was as the cry of a lost soul in all the agony of the damned an eerie unearthly wail that froze the blood in the listener's veins in the invisible ranks men shuddered and clutched at their neighbors kuda ki nam nen kia he in the name of god what is that gasped the subaltern the indian officer at his side answered in a low voice it is ashraf khan crying out in pain sahib he is not yet dead subheader sahib come with me said wargrave let your jemdar lieutenant take the men one by one into the guard room and examine the rifles to see if any have been fired we don't know yet if the missing sentry did the deed the subheader company commander gave the order to his subordinate and followed wargrave to the barrack room in which the crime had been committed the sight that met the subaltern's eyes was one that he was not easily to forget the high roof chamber was in darkness save at one end where a small lamp cast weird shadows on the walls and vaulted ceiling at this end under the flickering light a group of figures stood round a bed on which a man was writhing in agony he was struggling in delirious frenzy to hurl himself to the stone floor and was only held down by the united efforts of three men from a bullet wound in his bare chest the life-blood welled with every movement of his tortured body he had been shot in the back as he lay asleep the lips covered with a bloody froth were drawn back tightly over the white teeth clenched in agony and red foam lay on the black beard out of the sweat-bathed ghastly face the eyes glared in frenzy the features were contorted with pain again and again the wild shrieks like the howl of a mad thing rang through the long room and out into the night with tear-filled eyes and heart torn with pity wargrave looked down at him in silence ashraf khan was one of his best men but where is the doctor sahib he asked the native officer suddenly the subheader stared and shook his head in the excitement no one had thought of sending for the medical officer wargrave turned to one of the men around the bed 
Mahabhan. Run hard to the mess and call the doctor Sahib. Here, stop. He remembered that MacDonald did not possess a revolver. For all one knew, he might encounter the murderer on his way. Wardray thrust Mrs. Dermot's pistol into the sepoy's hand, saying, Give the sahib that. The man, who was barefoot, ran out of the chamber and went to his own barrack room for his shoes for the road was rocky and covered with sharp stones. The subaltern turned away with a sigh from the bedside of his poor comrade. He could do nothing now but avenge him. As he walked away from the group, he trod on an empty cartridge case and picked it up. It had recently been fired. It told its tale for it showed that the assassin had reloaded over his victim and intended that the killing should not end there. If he were the missing sentry, then he had nine more cartridges left, nine human lives in the blood-stained hand, and as the subaltern crossed the veranda outside the barrack room, the Jamander met him and reported that all the rifles of the detachment had been examined and found clean except the missing weapon of the sentry, a young Pathan sepoy called Gul Muhammad. It was remembered that the dying Havadar sergeant had reprimanded him hotly on the previous day for appearing on parade with accoutrements dirty so little a cause was needed to send a man to his death. The first thing to be done now was to hunt for the murderer. While he went free, no one's life was safe. Wargrave shuddered at the thought of danger coming to Muriel or her friend, and he hoped that they were safely shut in their house. It was a difficult problem to know where to begin the search. The fort was full of hiding places, especially at night, and already the assassin might have escaped over the low wall surrounding it. As Wargrave stood perplexed, another Indian officer ran up, accompanied by two men with rifles. Sahib, Sahib, he whispered excitedly, the murderer is in my room, the one next that in which Ashra Khan was shot. I left the door wide open when I ran out. It is now shut and bolted from the inside, and someone is moving about in it. The subaltern went along the veranda to the door and tried it. It was firmly fastened. Here, Sahib, cried a sepoy, who ran up with a comrade carrying a heavy log. Shabash! Well done! Break in the door, said Wargrave. Other men, who had come up, seized the long log and dashed it violently against the door. The bolt held, but the frail hinges gave way, and the door fell in. Stand back! cried Wargrave. It seemed certain death to enter the room in which a murderer lurked in darkness, armed with a rifle and fixed bayonet, and resolved to sell his life dearly. But the subaltern did not hesitate. He was the only sahib there, and of course it was his duty to go in. He could not ask his men to risk a danger that he shirked himself. That is not the officer's way, whose motto must ever be follow where I lead. Wargrave sprang into the room unarmed. He was outlined against the faint light outside. A spurt of flame lit the darkness, and the subaltern, as he tripped over the raised threshold, felt that he was shot. He staggered on, 
a rifle lunged forward and the bayonet stabbed him in the side but with a desperate effort he closed with his unseen assailant and grappled fiercely with him struggling to overpower the assassin before his ebbing strength left him he fought madly the indian officers and sepoys blocking up the doorway could see nothing but they could hear the choking gas the panting breaths the muttered curses and the stamping feet of the combatants locked in the death grapple they could not interfere they dared not fire in impotent fury they shouted bring lamps bring lamps then groaning in their powerlessness to aid their beloved officer they listened as a light danced over the stones from a lantern in the hand of a running sepoy the moment it came and lit up the scene they rushed on the murderer wrestling fiercely with wardrave and dragged him off as the subaltern collapsed and fell to the ground the glare of the lantern shone on his white face the sahabib is dead cried a sepoy and sprang at the murderer who was struggling in the grip of the two powerfully built indian officers others followed him and his captors had to fight hard and use all their authority to keep the prisoner from being killed by their bare hands of his maddened comrades only the arrival of the armed men of the guard saved him frenzied with grief the sepoys bent over their officer lying motionless and apparently dead on the stone floor they loved him many of them wept openly and unashamed the subheader knelt beside him and opened his shirt the blood had soaked through the white mess jacket that wargrave wore the native officer looked up into the ring of brown faces bent over him suddenly he cried angrily ma bub can why hast thou not gone for the doctor sahib as thou wert told o son of an owl the face staring in horror between the heads of the sepoys was hurriedly withdrawn and mahabub khan who had lingered to see the end of the tragedy turned and pushed his way out of the crowd macdonald found the subaltern lying to all appearances dead on the broken door out in the open where they had gently carried him hold a light here he cried as he knelt down beside the body by now a dozen lanterns or more lit up the scene the doctor laid his ear against wargrave's chest and held a polished cigarette case to his lips then he pulled back the shirt to examine his injuries oh is he dead is he dead cried a trembling voice the doctor looking up angrily found miss benson and mrs dermot standing over him the sepoys had silently made way for them you shouldn't be here ladies he said with justifiable annoyance this is no place for you no he's not dead and i hope and think that he won't die oh thank god cried the two women the sepoys crowding round and hanging on the doctor's verdict could not understand the words but saw the look of joyous relief on their faces and guessed the truth a wild confused cheer went up to the stars mr macdonald said mrs dermot bending over him again will you bring him to my house there is no accommodation for him in your little hospital you know and he'd have no one to look after him in the mess i can nurse him the doctor straightened himself on his knee 
and looked down at the unconscious man yes mrs dermot it is a good idea he replied there is nowhere else where he'd get any tension my hands are full with major hunt he's taken a turn for the worse his temperature went up dangerously high tonight and he was almost delirious he stood up i can't examine wargrave properly here he seems to be wounded in two places but i hope it's not i mean i think he'll pull through his pulse is getting stronger i put a first dressing on and i think we can move him hi stretcher eat her low bring the stretcher here suddenly wargrave opened his eyes and looked up in the doctor's face is that you macdonald he asked dreamily never mind me i'm all right go to poor ashbrough can if he must die at least give him something to put out of his misery i can wait his voice trailed off and he relapsed into unconsciousness ordering him to be carried away the doctor after a word with the indian officers entered the barrack room it was useless ashraf khan had just died the crowd fell back in a wide circle to let the two hospital orderlies bring up the stretcher for ward grave and as they did left a group of men standing isolated in the center all of these were armed except one whose hands were pinioned behind his back his head was bare his face bruised and bleeding and his uniform nearly torn off his body it needed no telling that he was the murderer miss benson walked up to him with fierce eyes you dog she cried bitterly in your do the man who had smiled defiantly when the hands of his raging comrades were seeking to tear the life out of his body and had shouted out his crime in their faces cowered before the anger in the flaming eyes of this frail girl he shrank back between his guards the sepoys looking on howled like hungry wolves and as mrs dermot drew the girl back made a rush for the murderer the men of the guard faced them with leveled bayonets and ringed their prisoner round and the sepoys fell back sullenly suddenly a shrill voice cried in hindu standy make way make way there what has happened the circle of men gaped and through the opening came major hunt white-faced wasted shaking with fever and clad only in pajamas and a great coat and with bare feet thrust into unlaced shoes he staggered feebly in among them revolver in hand heaven and earth is wargrave dead he cried and tottered towards the stretcher suddenly the pistol dropped from his shaking hand and he fell forward on the stones before macdonald could catch him this is madness muttered the doctor it may kill him i hoped he wouldn't hear the alarm bring him to my house too said mrs dermot another stretcher was fetched the major lifted tenderly into it and the sad procession started the sepoys falling back silently to make way major hunt having been put to bed in one of the guest rooms of the political officer's house macdonald with the aid of the subaltern servant undressed wargrave and examined his injuries noreen holding a basin for him while muriel shuddering carried away the blood-tinged water and brought fresh 
the shot room though severe was not necessarily dangerous and the bullet had not lodged in him the doctor was relieved to find that the bayonet had not penetrated deeply but it only glanced along a rib tearing the intercostal muscles and inflicting a long jagged but superficial wound which bled freely indeed the most serious matter was the great loss of blood which had weakened the subaltern considerably wargrave did not recover consciousness until early morning when he opened his eyes they fell on muriel sitting by his bed he showed no surprise and the girl scarce daring to believe that he was awake and knew her did not venture to move but as he continued to look steadily at her she gently laid her hand on his where it lay on the coverlet then in a weak voice he said dearest i mustn't love you i mustn't i'm bound in honor bound to another woman and i must play the game it's hard sometimes but if i die i want you to know i loved you only you her heart seemed to stop suddenly then beat again with redoubled force was he conscious was he speaking to her did he know what his words meant she waited eagerly for him to continue but his hand closed on hers in a weak grip and shutting his eyes he seemed to sleep the girl sank on her knees beside the bed and stared at the pale face that in those few words recurred to her and a sharp pain pierced her heart there was another woman then one who held his promise who was she he could not be secretly married surely no it must be that he was engaged to some other girl but he loved her muriel he wanted to say so he had said so though he strove to hold back in honor bound he would play the game ah that he would do at any cost to himself for she knew his chivalrous nature but he loved her she was sure of it then the doubts came again did he know what he was saying was it perhaps only delirium that spoke the fever of his wounds the girl suffered an agony worse than death as she knelt beside the bed her forehead on his hand and noreen entering softly an hour later found her still crouched there weeping bitterly but silently shortly after sunrise macdonald entered the house wan and haggard for he had not been to bed at all besides the hours that he had spent with his patients he had been busy in the fort all night he had to make an autopsy of the dead man and as the only officer available investigate the crime examine the witnesses and the prisoner who calmly confessed his guilt and telegraph the news of the occurrence to regimental divisional and army headquarters he found major hunt sleeping peacefully but wargrave woke as he tiptoed into the room and looked up at him at first not seeing the woman he was fully conscious and asked eagerly for an account of what had happened noreen and muriel shuddered at the delight with which he heard the murderer's capture for they were too tender-hearted to understand his passionate desire to avenge the cruel slaying of one of his men when he turned away from macdonald he saw muriel his eyes shone 
eagerly for a moment then seemed to dull as memory returned to him he begged mrs dermot to forgive him for upsetting her domestic arrangements by his intrusion into the house later in the morning noreen was sitting alone with him having sent muriel to lie down for a couple of hours she had not been to bed herself but after a bath and a change of clothing had given her children their breakfast and bidden them to make no noise because their beloved Fwanky was lying ill in the house yet she could not forbear to smile when she saw the portentous gravity with which eileen tiptoed out into the garden to tell badshaw the news and order him to be very quiet now looking fresh and bright she sat beside wardgrave's bed since the doctor had left him he had lain thinking he felt that violet must be informed at once that he had been hurt but was in no danger lest she might learn of the occurrence through another source and believe him to be worse than he really was as he looked at mrs dermot the desire to ask her instead of macdonald if she would be the one to communicate with mrs norton drew overwhelming and he felt that he wanted to confide to her the whole story sure that she would understand and she would tell muriel for she had been quite conscious when she had spoken to the girl in the morning it was only right after that she should know the truth but he shrank from telling it to her himself so he opened his heart to noreen and the understanding little woman listened sympathizingly and made no comment and undertook to explain the situation to muriel so an hour or two later when macdonald was again with the subaltern she went to her friend's room and told her the whole story the girl's first feeling was anger at the thought of frank making love to a married woman seems to me it's a married woman who made it to him from what i can gather said noreen a little annoyed with muriel for her way of receiving the story he did not say so but it was easy to guess the truth now my dear don't be absurd men are not angels and if a pretty woman flings herself at the head of one of them it's hard for him to keep her at arm's length and you seen yourself in darjeeling how some of them the married ones especially do chase them her eyes grew hard as she continued i remember how kevin once was then she stopped but frank how could he how oh how could he and he loved her sobbed the girl don't be silly muriel i'll tell you i don't believe he ever did he loves you now oh do you think he does what am i to do nothing merely go along as you've been doing just be friendly and don't be hard on him he's had a bad time i've always felt that there was something troubling him now i know and i'm not going to let him ruin himself and throw away his happiness for a woman who's not worth it he's the nicest cleanest minded man i've known after kevin and my brother he saved my babies and for that i'd do anything for him i feel almost as if he were one of my children and i'll stand by him if you won't oh but i will i will cried the girl 
but how can i help him as i said by acting as if nothing had happened and just keep on being friends it oughtn't to be hard see how he's suffering and think how brave he's been remember he loves you and you do care for him don't you i've an idea that he hopes that this woman is tiring of him and may set him free of course he didn't say as much but she nodded sagely her intuition had told her more of his feelings in a minute than frank had dared to acknowledge to himself in many months anything i can do to help to bring that about i will the days went by and wargrave aided by his clean living the devoted nursing that he received and the cool healthy mountain air began to mend major hunt had recovered and returned to duty relieving the officer sent from headquarters to command during his illness colonel dermot had come back from simba with frank's appointment to the political department as his assistant in his pocket the murdered man had long ago been laid to rest by his comrades but his slayer still sat fettered in the one cell of the fort awaiting of the great court-martial for his trial and seeing from his barred window the even routine of the life that had been his for three years still going on but with no place in it for him the period of wargrave's convalescence was a very happy time for him muriel had remained a whole month after the eventful night for mrs dermot declared that with the care of her house and children she had no time to nurse the subaltern and the girl must stay to do it while he was in any danger so she lingered in the station to do him willing service wait on him chat or read to him give him her arm when he was first allowed to leave his room and did it all with the bright cheerful kindness of a friend no more she never alluded to his words to her but her patient somehow guessed that she had not been angered by the revelation of the state of his feelings toward her and from the tenderness of her manner to him the unconscious jealousy that she displayed if any one but she did any service for him he began to half hope half fear that she cared a little for him in return but even as he thought this he realized that he must not allow her to do so at last the time came when she had to return to her father down in the vast forest and bravely she said good-bye to everyone and most of all to frank the tears blinded her as she sat on the back of the elephant that bore her away and saw the hills close in and shut from her gaze the little station that held her heart wargrave however was not left to pine in loneliness after her departure all day long as they were allowed the children stayed with him eileen smothering him with her caresses at regular intervals they told him their doings confided their dearest secrets to him and demanded stories and Fwanky racked his brains to recall the fairy tales of his own childhood to repeat to the golden-haired mites perched on his bed and gazing at him in 
odd fascination the girl uttering little shrieks at the harrowing details of the wicked deed of giant blunder bore and the cruel deceit of the wolf that devoured red riding hood but the subaltern had a grimmer visitor one day the orders came at last for gul mohammed to be sent to calcutta to stand his trial without waiting for wargrave's recovery the latter's evidence being taken on commission the prisoner begged that he might be allowed to see the wounded officer before he left and frank having consented he was brought to the subaltern's bedroom when he was marched out of the fort on the first stage of his journey to the gallows it was a dramatic scene the stalwart young pathan in uniform with his wrist handcuffed stood with all the bold bearing of his race by the bedside of the man that he had tried to kill while two powerful sepoys armed with drawn bayonets hemmed him in their hands on his shoulders the prisoner looked for a moment at the pale face of the wounded man then his bold eyes suffused with tears as he said Huzor, the presence i am sorry had i known that night it was your honor i would not have lifted my rifle against you the sahib has always been good to me to all of us my enemy i slew as we of the putana must do to all who insult us that deed i do not regret wargrave looked up sorrowfully at the splendidly built young fellow barely twenty-one who had only done as he had been taught to do from his cradle among pathans blood only can wash away the stain of an insult the officer felt no anger against him for his own injuries and regretted that false notions of honor had led him to kill a comrade and were now sending him to a shameful death i am sorry gul mohammed very sorry he said you were always a good soldier and now you must die the pathan drew himself up with all the haughty pride of his race i do not fear death sahib they will give me the noose but my father can spare me he has five other sons to fight for him if only sahib would forgive wargrave much moved held out his hand to him the prisoner touched it with his manacled ones then raised his fingers to his forehead for your kindness sahib salam then he turned and walked proudly out of the room and wargrave heard the tramp of heavy feet on the rocky road outside as the prisoner was marched away on the long trail to the gallows two months later gul mohammed was hanged in the courtyard of alipur jail in Kakata before detachments of all the regiments garrisoning the city the subaltern had long shaft at the restraint of an invalid before macdonald took him off the sick list and he was free to wander again with colonel dermot in the forest and among the mountains before the hot weather ended raymond came to spend three weeks with him and be initiated into the delights of sport in the great jungle when the long imprisonment of the rains came wargrave began to suffer in health for his wounds had sapped his strength more than he knew and macdonald shook his head over him nor was he the only invalid for little brian grew pale and listless in the mists 
that enveloped the outpost constantly now until finally the doctor decreed that his mother much as she hated parting from her husband and her home must take the children to darjeeling and he ordered the subaltern to go too frank did not repine after mrs dermot had casually intimated that muriel benson was arranging to join her at the railway station and accompany her on a long visit to darjeeling it was wardgrave's first introduction to a hill station and everything was a delightful novelty to him from the quaint little train that brought them up the seven thousand feet to their destination in the pretty town of villas clubs and hotels in the mountains to the glorious panorama of the eternal snows and kitchkin junga's lofty crests that rise like fairyland into the sky at early dawn and under the brilliant indian moon as mrs dermot could not often leave her children it was muriel who knew darjeeling well who became his guide together every day they set out from their hotel together they scaled the heights of jalapar or rode down to watch the polo on the flat hilltop of Libong, a thousand feet below together they explored the fascinating bazaar and bought ghost daggers and turquoises in the quaint little shops together they went on picnics down into the deep valleys on the way to sikkim they played tennis ranked or danced together at the amusement club and the ladies at the tea tables in the great lounge smiled significantly and whispered to each other as the good-looking fair man and the pretty dark-haired girl came in together when the light was fading on the mountains frank forgot cares he ceased to brood unhappily for it had come to that on violet who as her rare letters told him had spent the hot weather in the bombay hill station of Mahabalehwar and was now enjoying life during the rains in gay Pune. she seldom wrote and then but scrappily and it seemed to him certain that she was forgetting him and he felt ashamed as the joy which filled him at the thought was he always destined to be only the friend of this girl he loved the lover of a woman to whom he wished to be a friend end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the jungle girl by gordon casserly this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c rooted in dishonor government house ganish kind outside Pune, the residence of the governor of bombay during the rains was blazing with light and gay with the sound of music for his excellency was giving a fancy dress ball motors and carriages were still rolling up in a long line to the entrance where the gorgeously clad indian cavalry soldiers of the governor's bodyguard tall and stately black bearded men in long scarlet tunics white breeches and high black boots their heads swathed in gaudy lungis turbans with tails streaming down their backs holding steel-headed bamboo lances with red and white pennons in their white gauntleted right hands lined the approach inside the splendid ballroom ablaze with electric lights 
was crowded with gaily dressed figures in costumes beautiful or bizarre the good-looking middle-aged baron who was the king's representative in the bombay presidency was standing dressed as charles the second beside his plain but pleasant featured wife in the garb of amy robsart receiving the last of their guests while already the dancing had begun later in the evening a group of officers in varied costumes stood near one of the entrances criticizing the dresses and the company by george that's a magnificent kit said a garrison gunner just arrived on short leave from bombay what's it supposed to be a polish hussar i think replied a subaltern in wellsey's rifles no he's murat napoleon's cavalry leader said an indian lancer captain the wearer of the costume alluded to was passing them in a waltz he was a young man in a splendid old-time hussar uniform a scarlet dolman thick laced with gold a fur trim slung pelisse tight scarlet breeches embroidered down the front of the thighs in gold and long red russian leather boots with gold tassels he was good-looking but not in an english way and the swarthiness of his complexion and a slight kink in his dark hair seemed to hint a trace of colored blood he was plainly israelite in appearance and the large nose with the unmistakable racial curved nostril would become bulbous with years the firm cheeks flabby and the plump chin double that dress costs some money i bet said the gunner cheaply attired as a perot just look at the gold lace i say he's got glass bottoms glass be hanged fergie they're diamonds real diamonds honor bright murat wore diamonds he was buckin about them in the club tonight said a captain in a british infantry regiment quartered in puna that's rothensall of the second hussars from bangladore son of the old rothensall of the south african multi-millionaire a sheeny of course who's the woman he's dancing with asked the gunner jolly good-looking she is that's mrs norton wife of a political somewhere in the presidency rosenthal's always in her pocket since he met her at mahabash four as the dance ended the many couples streamed out of the ballroom and made for the kala jugas the black places as the sitting out spots are appropriately termed in india from the carefully arranged lack of light in them mrs norton looking very lovely as mary queen of scots and her partner crossed the veranda and went out into the unlit garden in search of seats the first few they stumbled on were already occupied a fact that the darkness prevented them from realizing until they almost sat down on the occupants at last in a retired corner of the garden rosenthal found a bench in a recess in the wall as they seated themselves he blurted out roughly i'm sick of all this vi when do you mean to give me your answer i'm damned if i'm going to hang on waiting much longer i'm fed up with india and the army i mean to cut it all well harry what do you want asked his companion smiling in the darkness at his vehemence. what you and you know it i want to take you away from this rotten country what's all this he waved his hand toward the lighted ballroom compared to paris monte carlo cairo austin when the races are on let's go where life is worth living this is stagnation 
oh i find it amusing you forget we women have a better time in india than in europe there are too many of us there so you don't value us better time oh la what rot he laughed rudely you never lived yet dear look here vi my father's one of the three richest men in south africa and all he's got will come to me some day as it is he gives me an allowance bigger than those of all the other men in the regiment put together i hate the service and its idiotic discipline i want to be free to go where money counts damn india doesn't it count everywhere she asked fanning herself lazily his rough almost boorish manner amused her always she felt as if she were playing with a caged tiger doesn't it here no in the army they seem to think more of some damn pauper who comes of a county family as they call it than of a fellow like me who could buy up a dozen of them i hate them all and i mean to chuck it but i want you to come with me by and what's more i mean to have you but your father wishes you to stay in the service you told me so yourself will he like it if you leave and will he continue your allowance oh i'll get round him he's only got me he's no one else to leave his money to it'll be all right vi answer me i mean to get you he grasped her wrist and tried to drag her towards him she laughed and held him off take care my dear boy darkness has ears we're not alone in the garden please remember if you can't behave prettily i'm going back to the ballroom come there's the music beginning again he tried to seize her in his arms but she eluded his grasp with a dexterity that argued practice and rising moved across the grass he followed sulkily dominated by her cool and careless indifference when they reached the veranda one of the government house aides de camp rushed up to her oh mrs norton i've been hunting for you everywhere i've a message from his excellency he wants you to come to his table at supper and save him from the members of council's awful wives oh thanks captain gardner i'll come with pleasure she answered smiling prettily on him an a b c is always worth cultivating i say it is hopeless asking you for a dance now he said we poor devils of the staff don't get a chance at the beginning of the evening as we're so busy introducing people to their excellencies she looked at her program you can have this if you like it's only with some indian civilian in spectacles and i hate the heaven-born they're such bores she smiled and sailed off on the adc's arm to the disgust of rosenthal calmly abandoned but he could not help being amused when a round-faced young man dressed as an ancient greek with gig lamp spectacles rushed up to overtake mrs norton before she entered the ballroom and stopped in dismay to gaze after her open mouth and peer at his program but the hussar drove her back from government house to puna in his particularly luxurious rolls royce with an english chauffeur and would hardly let her go when the car drew up before the door of the munster hotel where she was staying laughing crushed and disheveled she broke from him and jumped out of the automobile ran up the veranda steps and turned to wave to him as the chauffeur started off 
to take him to his quarters in the club of western india still smiling violet stumbled up the unlighted stairs and reached her sitting room when she turned up the lamp a letter lying on the table caught her eyes she picked it up indifferently but when she saw that it bore the handwriting of one of her calcutta cousins and the darjeeling postmark she tore it open eagerly and ran her eye rapidly down the pages she came to the lines i have seen the man you asked me about he is always with a girl called benson rather a pretty little thing she is popular with all the men but mr wargrave seems to be the favorite they are staying at the same hotel and everyone says they are engaged then the writer went on to talk of family matters but violet read no more her eyes flamed with anger as she crumpled the paper flung it on the floor and stamped it underfoot she paced the room angrily tearing the lace handkerchief she held in her hand to shreds this then was frank's loyalty to her this was how he consoled himself for her absence with this chit of a girl with whom he probably laughed at her violet's readiness to give up reputation good fame home for him she almost sobbed with jealous rage at the idea she forgot her own infidelities and want of remembrance and felt herself to be a deceived and much abused woman but she would not bear such treatment meekly frank was hers no other woman had a right to him should ever have him she was resolved on that she stopped and picking up the letter smoothed it out and reread it then frowning she passed into her bedroom and tore off her costume not for an instant did she sleep during the remainder of the night but tossed on her bed revolving plans of vengeance next day she was seated in the train on her way to darjeeling a journey that would take days she had telegraphed fruitlessly for a room at the oriental hotel at which she knew from his letters that frank was staying but she had secured one at the larger eastern palace where her calcutta relatives were residing only on the second day of her journey did she wire to wargrave bidding him meet her on her arrival as the train carried her across india her heart was still filled with anger jealousy and almost hate of the man whom she had favored above all others and who spurned her dared to be faithless to her it seemed she did not know how much love she had left for him for his image had grown dim in the flight of time and among the distractions of gayer stations than rohar certainly she had flirted herself flirted recklessly but that was a different matter to his faithfulness she might do it but he must not did she want him she hardly knew but she was not going to be put aside for this tiger-killing young person this jungle girl who must be taught not to trespass on violet's property then her mind went back to rosenthal and in the solitude of the ladies compartment she laughed aloud at the thought of the shock that his self-sufficiency must have received when he learned of her sudden and mysterious disappearance from puna for she had left him no word it would do him good he needed a lesson for he was too sure of her she had never troubled to analyze her feelings for him and did not know whether she liked or hated him most she saw his faults clearly 
his blatant conceit his irritating belief in the supremacy of money his arrogance his bad manners she knew that men deemed him a blounder but his very boorishness his savage outbreaks against conventionality attracted her under the thin veneer of civilization he was simply an animal she knew it and it appealed to her baser nature the sensual strain in her that he was beast and wild beast at that did not affright her she felt that she could always dominate him when she would once or twice the beast had come out into the open but she had driven it back with a whip and she believed that she could always do it the wealth the life of luxury that he offered appealed to her strongly but she kept her head and remembered that he was dependent on his father's bounty and she had no intention of compromising herself irretrievably under such circumstances if he had the disposal of the old man's immense riches then the temptation might be overpowering but until he had she would wait and ever the memory of wargrave obtruded itself rather to her annoyance but angry as she was with him she could not pretend to herself that she was indifferent to him up in darjeeling on the very day that she left puna frank sat with miss benson under a massive orchid-clad tree in the lovely botanical gardens gazing moodily down into the depths of the valley far below them turning suddenly he found his companion looking at him something in her eyes moved him strongly and he forgot his caution muriel you know how it is with me he said impetuously i oughtn't to say anything but well all the men here run after you and i can't bear it i'm a fool i know but i can't help being jealous i'm always afraid that some one of them will take you from me the other woman seems to be forgetting me completely she hasn't written to me for weeks months surely she's tiring of me i don't suppose she ever really cared for me just was bored in that dull station if if she sets me free would you could you ever like me well enough to marry me the girl looked away over the valley and a little smile crept into her eyes then she turned to him and laid her hand on his dear boy if you were free i would she answered then they were all alone no one to see them and his arms went out to her but she drew back not yet dear you're another woman's property still she said he bit his lip yes you're right sweetheart but well even if i weren't i haven't much to offer you i'm still in debt and i'd only be condemning you to pass all your existence in the jungle there'd be no hardship in that dear i love the forest better than anywhere else in the world life in it is happiness to me but would you be content to live as mrs dermot does content i'd love it better than anything else if i were with you then he forgot her reproof and she her high-minded resolves as his arms went around her and he drew her to him until their lips met in a long passionate kiss afterwards they sat hand in hand and talked of what the future would hold for them if only fate were kind and mrs norton speeding across india to shatter their dream world smiled a little grimly as she pictured to herself 
her meeting with frank next day the blow fell wargrave was sitting at lunch with mrs dermot and muriel in the hotel dining-room when violet's telegram was handed to him his companions could see that he had received bad news but he pulled himself together and said nothing about it until he was alone with mrs dermot in her private sitting-room after tiffin then he exclaimed suddenly handing her the telegram she's on her way here noreen understood even before she looked at the paper when she read the message she asked what's she coming here for i don't know i haven't a letter from her for a long time he replied wearily what are you going to do about her what can i he said with a gesture of despair it's for her to decide if she wishes it i must keep my word but muriel what of her you know she cares for you has she no right to be considered demanded her friend impatiently are you going to ruin her life as well as yours this woman will only drag you down she can't really be fond of you or she wouldn't forget you as she has been doing you don't love her don't you see what it will all mean to you to be pilloried in the divorce court made to pay enormous costs perhaps heavy damages as well and even now you say you're in debt and then to be chained for life to a woman you don't care about while you're in love with another oh mr wargrave do be sensible tell her the truth tell her you can't go on with it i've given her my word he said simply she pleaded with him passionately but to no avail at last as muriel entered the room she rose saying tell her i'll not mention the subject again and she walked indignantly into her bedroom and shut the door almost with a bang for the little woman was furious with him for what she deemed his crass stupidity what's the matter with noreen asked the girl in surprise without a word he gave her the telegram oh frank she gasped and sank overwhelmed into a chair letting the fatal paper flutter to the floor he did not go to her but stood by the window the image of despair gazing out with unseeing eyes what am i to do he asked miserably you must keep your word if she wishes it answered the girl bravely but the next moment she broke down and burying her face in her hands wept bitterly he made no move to her and she rose and went quietly back to her own room in the interval that elapsed before violet's arrival mrs dermot did not abandon hope and in spite of her words she attacked wargrave persistently trying to shake his resolution but to her despair muriel sided with him and declared that he was right so finally noreen gave it up and vowed that she would wash her hands of the whole affair when violet reached darjeeling wargrave met her at the railway station face to face with him her anger died and something of the attraction he had had for her revived so she greeted him effusively and all but embraced him on the platform other men seeing the meeting wondered why he looked so miserable when such a lovely woman evinced her delight at seeing him so plainly she passed her arm through his with an air of possession and chatted volubly while he watched his servant help hers to collect her luggage when she took her seat in the dandy or chair carried on the shoulders of coolies and was being conveyed towards her hotel 
she behaved as though they had not been parted a week rattled on gaily about her doings in puna and malabeshwar and with all the glories of the himalayas about her declared that the bombay hill station was far lovelier than darjeeling wargrave was relieved that she showed no desire to be sentimental and gladly responded to her mood detailing the forthcoming gaieties and promising to take her to them all when they reached the eastern palace hotel and were shown up into her private sitting room she put her hands on his shoulders as soon as they were alone and said let me look at you frank you have improved you've grown handsomer i think aren't you going to kiss me he did it with so little fever that she made a grimace and thought it's quite time that i came to bring him to heel not much loving ardor about that i wonder if he kisses the jungle girl as coldly aloud she said now let's get down to tiffin i'm starving will you please secure a table and i'll follow you in a few minutes during the meal she chattered gaily criticized the dresses and appearance of the other women in the dining room and chafing him merrily on his want of appetite ate a substantial meal herself mrs dermot anxious to befriend him had thought that she could help him by inviting him to bring mrs norton to tea with her that afternoon when during tiffin he hesitatingly conveyed the invitation violet said oh i don't want to be bothered with women my dear boy take me out and show me the place and the shops and the gymkhana what do you call it here oh the amusement club no stop a minute mrs dermot is your dear friend from rangadwar isn't she so she's here and the other the jungle girl where is she frank flushed as he replied i suppose you mean miss benson she's with mrs dermot so you're all staying at the same hotel how very nice for you but my dear frank doesn't it strike you that it'll be rather dull for me staying by myself here you have to change to this hotel i asked about rooms here but they told me they're full up now i'll see if i can't get round the manager and make him find a corner for you well now for this tea party yes on second thoughts i'll go i'd like to see the ladies who've been consoling you for my absence oh nonsense violet they haven't they're just friends that's all he said irritably of course dear i know well tell me what these just friends are like she certainly derived little idea of them from wargrave's lame attempt at description and when later she and he were shown into mrs dermot's sitting-room at tea-time noreen and muriel found his picture of her as a meek long-suffering neglected wife very unlike the radiant condescending lady who patronized them from the start she showed a tendency to address most of the conversation to the girl despite the latter's evident disclination to talk or perhaps because of it for the older woman seemed to take an impish delight in teasing her about her friendship with wargrave and their relations as nurse and patient although it was apparent that her malicious humor made the others uncomfortable she paraded her authority over frank and treated him like a hen-pecked husband when finally she bore him away to escort her to the amusement club she left the two girls speechless behind her but not for the same reason noreen was furious what a hateful woman she exclaimed as soon as her visitor departed 
and i pitied her as a poor neglected wife what do you think of her muriel only shook her head as she sat looking despondent and thoroughly miserable mrs norton's malice affected her little but her undoubted loveliness had made her despair how could an insignificant little person like herself she thought hope to win affection from any man whom this radiant beauty deigned to favor frank could not help adoring so attractive a woman he must have loved her in rohar although he said that he had not muriel felt that she could have resigned herself more easily to his keeping his word to violet if the latter had been less good-looking mrs dermot broke in on her miserable thoughts come dear we'll take the children for their walk and then go on later to the amusement club i couldn't go to the club this evening noreen i really couldn't we'd only see that woman again with frank well what of it we're not going to let her think we're afraid to face her i've no patience with mr wargrave whatever he can see in her i can't think you're worth twenty of her darling shallow conceited she neglected she badly treated my sympathy is with her husband now what fools men are and noreen swept indignantly from the room every moment of the hour that they spent in the club that evening was a lifetime of torture to muriel she had faced a charging tiger with less dread than she did the crowd at the tea tables in the rink she fancied that every woman who looked at her was laughing in her sleeve at her that every man who bowed or spoke to her was pitying her suddenly her heart seemed to stop beating for she saw frank sitting with mrs norton and two other ladies her calcutta cousins as well as a couple of men in the british infantry regiment at le bong they were looking at her and she felt that violet was pointing her out as the deserted maiden she tried to smile bravely when her rival waved her hand and called out a cheery good evening to her and noreen who answered the greeting with an almost defiant air of unconcern for days afterward she saw practically nothing of wargrave who was obliged to be in constant attendance on mrs norton violet had induced the manager of the hotel to find a room for him and he was forced to transfer himself and his belongings to the eastern palace she monopolized him insisted on his taking her shopping in the mornings calling in the afternoons or to le bong to watch the polo or else playing tennis with her at the amusement club he dined with her every evening and escorted her to the dances concerts or theatricals that filled the nights during the season he hardly recognized her in the gay social butterfly with seemingly never a care in the world and she made him wonder every day if she had any love left for him or wanted him to have any for her for she showed no desire to be sentimental and treated him very much as she had in the early days of their acquaintance she never discussed their future he had not the moral courage to ask her outright if she still wanted to come to him she gave no indication of being happy only in his company for she soon began to release him from attendance on her occasions in favor of some one or another of the new men friends that she rapidly made he took advantage of this to see something of muriel again but this did not suit mrs norton even if she did not want frank herself 
that was no reason why the girl should have him she tried being jealous and insisted on his breaking off the friendship but although he hated the scenes that ensued he resolutely refused to do so then violet adopted another plan she pretended to be convinced by his assurances that it meant nothing and declared that she wished to be friends with muriel she went out of her way to be nice to the girl when they met in public and at last invited her to tea at the eastern palace hotel on an afternoon on which she knew mrs dermot to be engaged muriel accepted because she did not know very well how to refuse when she was shown into mrs norton's private sitting-room she found wargrave already there with her hostess who received her very amiably during tea the conversation flowed in safe channels at first but suddenly violet startled her guest by saying now miss benson that we three are alone i think it a good opportunity to speak very plainly about frank's relations with you i've just been giving him a serious talking to about the way he has behaved to you the girl drew herself up hotly what do you mean mrs norton she said the way mr wardrave has behaved i don't understand you oh yes you do it's best to speak plainly i'm afraid frank has been leading you to believe that he's in love with you violet broke in wargrave angrily please don't go on you've no right to say such things she smiled sweetly on him yes i have frank you know my dear boy that you've got pretty ways with women i fear he's rather a flirt miss benson that you are apt to make some of them think you mean more than you do what absurd nonsense he cried more angrily still please stop i beg of you no frank it is only right that i should warn miss benson she turned to the girl he hasn't told you i'm sure that he's not free to marry you or any other girl wargrave sprang up i've told her everything about us violet he protested i ask you as a favor to drop the subject the girl sat as if turned to stone while mrs norton went on you are young my dear and can't know much about men i suppose you lived in the jungle all your life now a little bird has told me that you've let yourself get too fond of frank oh he's very charming i know and this playing at nursing a poor wounded hero is a dangerous game but i'm going to tell you plainly that frank is pledged to me he has asked me to leave my husband for him and i consented so there's no use you're trying to catch him my dear you're too late the girl sprang indignantly to her feet i've done nothing of the sort mrs norton how dare you say so you've no right to speak to me as you're doing the older woman sat back coolly in her chair and laughed but her eyes grew hard oh yes i have my dear girl you too were the talk of darjeeling before i came of course you're angry naturally at failing to catch him but i'm going to put a stop to your trying here and now he has got to break with you you are a wicked woman began the girl and then indignation choked her mrs norton leant forward in her chair can you deny that you're in love with him she asked wargrave tried to interpose but the girl waved him aside and faced her rival i'll answer you i am i love him as you could never do i was willing to give him up to you for he loves me not you so that he should not be false to his word 
I didn't know what you were like then, but now I don't believe you've ever made him happy. You don't love him. You haven't got it in you. You wouldn't be content with any one man. I've watched you. You're absolutely heartless, and you'd only make Frank miserable. You're willing to disgrace him as well as yourself. You don't mind if you ruin him. Frank, she turned to Wargrave. You said you loved me. Is it true? He answered firmly. Yes, I do. Then will you marry me? This woman will only wreck your life. Choose between us. He turned in desperation to Mrs. Norton. Violet, you don't really want me, do you? You don't love me. I felt for a long time that you're forgetting me. I love Muriel and she loves me. If you ever cared for me, release me from my promise. Mrs. Norton lay back calmly in her chair and looked with a smile from one to the other. Then she said deliberately, This morning I wrote my husband and told him that I was never returning to him, that I was going to you, Frank. That is why I ask this girl here today to tell you before her that now I'm going to ask you to keep your promise, will you? The girl looked at him appealingly and stretched out her hands to him. Frank, for your own sake, if not for mine, don't listen to her. He stood irresolute, torn by conflicting emotions. Then, with an effort, he replied, Muriel, I must. I can't break my word. Mrs. Norton gave a mocking laugh. The girl shrank from him and hid her face in her hands for a moment. Then she looked up and said desperately calm, Very well, be it so. You've decided, and there's nothing more to be said. You've shamed me before this woman, and I never want to see you again. She turned and walked out of the room. End of chapter 12. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 13 of The Jungle Girl by Gordon Casserly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Course of True Love. As Muriel passed through the door, Wargrave started to follow her, but Violet cried peremptorily, Frank, stay here. Please realize that I come first now. Sit down. He obeyed mechanically. She went on petulantly. These emotional scenes are rather exhausting. Do you mind calling the hotel boy and ordering a cocktail for me? You ought to have one yourself, I suppose. Like all men, you hate scenes. Then you should be grateful to me for saving you from that spiteful little jungle cat. Going to the veranda outside the room, he called the hotel servant and gave him the order, then returned to his chair and sat down wearily. He stared at the floor in silence. He had sent the girl that he had loved away utterly humiliated, and he knew that, with her proud spirit, the shame of his rejection of her would cut her to the heart. He cursed himself for bringing this pain to her. It was all his fault. Not only had he no right to speak of love to her while he was bound to another woman, but he ought never to have sought her society as he had done never striven to gain her friendship for by doing so he had unconsciously won her love the harm was done long before he spoke to her of his feelings what a selfish brute he was to thus cause two women to suffer presently he remembered that his moodiness his silence were uncomplimentary cruel to violet 
she was right in saying that she came first indeed she was the only one to be considered now the other had passed out of his life it might be that they should meet again some day in their restricted world but while he could he must try to avoid her there was only violet left he looked up to find his companion's eyes fixed on him with an undefinable expression he roused himself with an effort that was not lost on the woman watching him so you have told your husband he said well now we must arrange what we are going to do we won't discuss our plans at this moment replied violet i'm not in the mood for it then after a pause she added bitterly i must give you time to recover from the shock of the abrupt ending to your little jungle romance before he could reply the servant appeared with a tray ah thank goodness here are the cocktails there's only one are you having one too it will do you good no she sipped her cocktail slowly when she had finished it she got up from her chair saying i'll get ready to go to the amusement club will you wait for me here you needn't change we won't play tennis today for we've got this dinner and dance on to-night and i don't want to tire myself i shan't be long as she passed his chair she tapped his cheek and said don't look so miserable my dear boy you'll soon get over the loss of your jungle girl there you may kiss my hand as a sign of your return to your allegiance but when she entered her bedroom she did not at once proceed to get ready to go out but unlocking her dressing case and taking out of it a letter sat down to read it for the tenth time since she had received it this morning yet it was short and concise it was from rosenthal and addressed from the mess of the second duke's own hussars in bangladore for as it told her he had returned to his regiment as his leave had expired it was the first that had come from him since she had left Pune, although as he said in it he had obtained her new address from the goni's clerk in the munster hotel office on the day of her flight thanks to the persuasive powers of a fifty rupee note he told her that although her abrupt departure had puzzled him and he could not understand why she had tried to conceal her whereabouts from him he wished her to realize that if it were an attempt to escape from him it was useless he could bid his time for sooner or later he would get her violet smiled as she read his confident words although they caused a little shiver of fear to run through her then she rose locked the letter away and put on her hat not until after lunch next day was wargrave able to find time to go to the oriental hotel not to see muriel he sternly told himself but to pay a visit to mrs dermot when he was shown up to her sitting-room he had to wait for some time before noreen entered and he was struck at once by the coldness of her greeting it was evident that she was very displeased with him she said no word about muriel and wargrave felt curiously adverse to mentioning her name at last he summed up courage to ask her with as near an approach to frigidity of manner as she could show to a man to whom she was so indebted noreen replied muriel has left darjeeling left darjeeling wherefore where has she gone he exclaimed in surprise to her father but why she wasn't to have left for weeks yet said wargrave 
Mrs. Dermot looked at him angrily. Why, need you ask? I should have thought common sense would have told you. I don't think we'll talk about it, please. As I said before, I've washed my hands of the whole affair. Further conversation on the subject was rendered impossible by the interruption of her children, who rushed at Wargrave and reproached him for not being to see them lately. During the next few days, Violet baffled every attempt that Frank made to discuss their future course of action. The constant succession of gaieties, the balls, theatricals, concerts, races, gymnasiums that filled every afternoon and evening of the Darjeeling season took up all her time. Whenever he tried to talk matters over with her, she invariably replied that there was no hurry. Even when he pointed out that Major Norton might arrive any day in consequence of her letter, that he had not already done so was inexplicable to Wargrave, and the subaltern could only believe her assurance that her husband accepted her loss with equanimity. It never occurred to Frank to doubt that she had written the letter. But one morning matters came to a crisis. When Violet and Wargrave returned to the hotel from their ride before breakfast, a telegram was handed to the latter. He found it to be an official message from Colonel Dermot, which ran, Please return forthwith to Rango Duar. I start for Europe on sick leave today. Frank stared at it in surprise. He had heard nothing of his superior officer being ill. It must be something very serious to necessitate his being sent to Europe. The news was an unpleasant shock to him, for he genuinely liked and respected the political officer. Then it occurred to him that this order to return brought everything to a head. Violet saw that he was perturbed. What is it, Frank? she asked. I'll tell you upstairs, dear, he said. In her sitting room, he handed her the telegram. I must leave today. Will you be ready to come with me? He asked. What? Today? My dear boy, it's impossible, she replied. But I must go. You see, it's imperative. The colonel's already gone. Yes, I see you must. But, well, I simply couldn't be ready, said Violet calmly. Besides, I'm singing at the concert tomorrow night, and there's the dance at Government House the night after. I must follow you later. But that means you're traveling alone, he argued. Wouldn't it be much pleasanter for you to come with me? Don't worry about me, for goodness sake, Frank. I'm not a helpless person. I came across India by myself to get here. And surely I'll be able to manage to do a 24 hours journey alone. Very well, dear, he replied with an inward, unacknowledged feeling of relief that the decisive step had not to be taken yet. I'll come down from Wangadwar with an elephant to meet you at the railway station when you arrive. Now, while you're changing for breakfast, I'll rush around to the Oriental and see if Mrs. Dermot has more news. When he reached the hotel, he found Noreen busily packing. She was pale and evidently deeply distressed, although outwardly calm and collected. You have heard? she asked as he entered her sitting room. Only that your husband is starting for England on sick leave and that I'm to return at once. What's the matter? I hope it's not serious. Mr. MacDonald wires that Kevin must go at once to England for an operation. He says I'm not to worry, as there is no immediate danger. But, of course, I can't help being alarmed. It's all so sudden. I didn't know that Kevin was ill. 
mr macdonald is traveling with him to the junction on the main line where the children and i are to meet them isn't it kind of him i'm so glad to know my husband will have someone with him until i come we'll meet at the railway station after lunch then said wargrave we'll be together as far as the junction mrs dermot hesitated are you traveling alone she asked frank flushed as he replied yes she violet is to follow later noreen made no comment and having learned all that he could he returned to his hotel he dreaded the ordeal of the parting with mrs norton but when the time came for it he found his fear of a distressing scene quite uncalled for she said good-bye to him in a pleasantly friendly though somewhat casual manner and did not offer to accompany him to the station as she had a previous engagement and long before the little train had zigzagged down the seven thousand feet to the foot of the himalayas she had dismissed him from her mind the truth was that the gay and admired mrs norton caught up in the whirlwind of social amusement in a lively hill station was not the woman who passed weary days of ennui in the company of a dull and unattractive husband in a small dead and alive station nor was the dejected man who so plainly showed that he was pining for someone else the good-looking whole-hearted subaltern who had fascinated her in the boredom of existence in rohar was he worth incurring social damnation for would his companionship for she knew that she had not his love make up for a life of loneliness debt and poverty in a frontier outpost if she were resolved on giving up her present assured position and violet felt that existence with norton would be more than ever unendurable after the exciting pleasures of puna and darjeeling would it not be wiser to do so for someone who could amply compensate her for the sacrifice love in a cottage or its indian equivalent a subaltern's comfortless bungalow did not appeal to her her statement that she had written to tell her husband that she was leaving for wardgrave was false it had served the purpose for which it was made and that was the defeat of her rival so now content with her victory she put all burdensome thought from her and dined danced and flirted to her heart's content in the gaieties of the darjeeling season when wargrave reached rangadwar the little outpost seemed strangely forlorn without the dermots and their children major hunt and macdonald welcomed him warmly the latter informed him that he had insisted on the colonel going to england for his operation because the political officer had not been out of india for seven years and needed the change and besides he would receive more care and attention in a london nursing home than in an indian hospital the trouble was intestinal but there was no immediate danger to his life another familiar finger was missing before departing dermot had released bagshaw and left him to wander in freedom in the jungle unwilling that his faithful companion of years should be servant to anyone else and confident that the elephant would come back to him when he returned to the terai major hunt placed one of the detachment elephants at wargrave's disposal whenever he required it to take him on his tours along the frontier and frank needed it constantly for as soon as 
the news of colonel dermot's departure spread the lawless spirits that for fear of him had not ventured for five years to disturb the peace of the border began to show signs of restlessness the political officer's strong personality and the reputation of divinity that he enjoyed had kept them in check but now that he was gone they thought that they could defy with impunity the young sahib who replaced him so the assistant had not long to wait for an opportunity to show his mettle dermot had not been gone a fortnight before one or two raids were attempted on british villages by lawless mountaineers from across the bhutan frontier wargrave soon proved that the mantle of colonel dermot had not fallen on unworthy shoulders single-handed he intercepted and faced a party of bhutanese swordsmen swooping down from the hills on a tea garden in search of loot shot the leader and two of his followers and put the rest to flight with a handful of sepoys of the military police he surprised a bhutia village in the no man's land along the border line and captured a notorious outlaw who had plundered the indian territory and had sent him a defiant challenge wargrave was glad of the excitement and the occupation for they kept him from brooding over his troubles and worrying about the future he had not time to puzzle over violet's silence she had not written to him since their parting as a matter of fact she seldom thought of him so engrossed was she in the pursuit of pleasure admittedly the prettiest woman in darjeeling that season she received enough attention and admiration to turn any woman's head and she enjoyed it all to the full although she had answered rosenthal's letter from bangladore he had not written again but she felt that he was not forgetting her she thought oftener of him than of wargrave for the vision of the great riches that she might one day share with him fascinated her it haunted her dreams sleeping and waking often she let her fancy stray to the existence that he had promised would be hers when he was the possessor of his father's fortune a life of luxury in the gayest cities of the world with all that immense wealth could bestow a life infinitely better worth living than her present one would she ever be given the chance of it the question was speedily and unexpectedly answered one morning after breakfast she received a telegram from rosenthal it said my father is dead i sail from bombay for south africa on friday to settle up his affairs will you come she stared at the paper almost uncomprehendingly for a few moments then the meaning of the message dawned on her she sat down at her writing table and thought hard she had little time in which to make up her mind for if she wished to reach bombay before rosenthal sailed she would have to leave darjeeling that afternoon what should she do should she go she found a pencil and a telegraph form and addressed the latter to the hussar then she hesitated but she was not long in coming to a decision with a firm hand she wrote the one word yes and signed her name then she rose from the table called a hotel servant dispatched the telegram and went to her bedroom to pack and the same train that took her away from darjeeling carried a letter from her to wargrave but the subaltern did not receive it until more than a week afterwards when he returned to drangadwar with tashi 
after chasing back across the border a mongrel pack of dacoit brigands who had been harrying butia villages in british territory the letter lay on the table in the room which he still occupied in the mess although he was no longer an officer of the detachment together with a pile of correspondence that had accumulated during his absence recognizing violet's writing on the envelope he tore it open anxiously he rapidly scanned the first page stared at it incredulously read it again carefully and then finished the letter it ran my dear frank i'm going to relieve your mind of a great weight and send you into the seventh heaven of delight by giving you the glad news that you are never likely to see me again before the week is ended i shall have left india for ever with someone who can give me all i want and not condemn me to a poverty-stricken existence in a wretched little jungle station which is all that you had to offer me i know it was not your fault and you are really a dear boy i was very fond of you but you did not love me and we would have been very miserable together for you would be always pining for your jungle girl and i would have hated you for it now we part good friends and she is welcome to you i ought to tell you that i did not really write to my husband as i said i did i wish you luck won't you wish me the same yours affectionately violet when he had thoroughly grasped the meaning of this extraordinary letter he forgave her everything in the joy of knowing that she had set him free he did not speculate as to the man with whom she was going his thoughts flew at once to muriel but his delight was tempered by the fear that his liberty had come too late to be of service to him with her would she ever forgive him his heart sank when he remembered her indignation her bitter words when they parted surely no woman who had been so humiliated could pardon the man who had brought such shame upon her yet how could he have acted otherwise it was natural that the girl should blame him but how could he have been false to his plighted word and desert the one who held his promise if only he could see muriel and plead with her perhaps in time she might bring herself to forgive him but how was he to meet her now that mrs dermot had gone to england the girl would not come again to rangodwar she was he knew accompanying her father in his tour of the forest of the district in his charge how could he go to their camp or lonely bungalow in the jungle and force his presence on her what was he to do longing for someone to confide in someone to advise him he went to major hunt and told him the whole story the older man rejoicing in learning of the subaltern's release from his entanglement but knowing miss benson well shook his head doubtfully over the chances of her forgiving wargrave nevertheless unwilling to kill the young man's hope he affected a confidence that he was far from feeling and bade him to take courage he advised him to arrange a few days shooting in the neighborhood of the bensons when he could spare the time from his duties the father would be sure to offer him hospitality and the daughter could not well avoid him in the meantime he might write and plead his cause on paper wardgrave sat up half the night composing a letter to muriel sheet after sheet was torn up in disgust before he was even tolerably satisfied but the labored result 
was never sent next morning after breakfast as he sat smoking in the mess with major hunt and the doctor his servant entered to tell him that a forest guard wanted to see him a wild hope flashed through his mind that perhaps muriel had sent him a message but on going out to the back veranda where the man awaited him he was handed an envelope on his majesty's service addressed in a strange handwriting he opened it and glanced carelessly at the letter but the first lines riveted his attention forest officers bungalow barwana section from the district superintendent of police bengal civil police to the assistant political officer rangadwar sir three days ago a party of chinamen attacked and severely injured the deputy conservator of forest mr benson in this bungalow and abducted his daughter they were ten or twelve in number and well armed and overawed the servants and forest employees they have been tracked towards the bhutan frontier and i fear have crossed it by this there was unfortunately much delay in the information reaching me while i was touring the district south of the forest and i have only just arrived here i hasten to acquaint you with the occurrence as i am powerless if the ruffians have crossed into bhutan please request the officer commanding military police detachment to send out parties to try to cut off the raiders from the passes through the mountains although i fear it is too late can you meet me here and confer with me please bring the medical officer of the detachment with you as mr benson is in a bad state and no civil surgeon is available for a great distance from here your obedient servant edward lawrence d s p horror-stricken wargrave questioned the forest guard the man had not been at the bungalow at the time of the outrage and could not greatly supplement the information contained in the letter the story that he had learned from the servants was to the effect that a party of chinamen had arrived at mr benson's bungalow and asked for employment as carpenters there was nothing unusual in this as chinese from the southern provinces frequently make their way on foot through tibet and bhutan over the mountains in search of work on the tea gardens or in calcutta apparently they had suddenly struck the old man down and surprised miss benson before she could offer any resistance producing firearms they had terrified the servants they had a mule hidden in the jungle and on this the girl was placed and led off long after they had departed some of the forest guards had timidly followed their track for some distance and found that it led towards the bhutan frontier when wargrave had extracted from the men all the information that he could he rushed into the mess and acquainted the two officers in it with the terrible news like him they were horrified at the outrage major hunt went at once to the fort to order out parties of the detachment in accordance with the district superintendent's request and macdonald got ready to proceed to the forest officer's bungalow forty miles away the assistant political officer dispatched a cipher telegram to the foreign department government of india at simla informing them of the occurrence and of his intention to investigate the affair personally and if possible rescue miss benson he knew that the heads of the department although they would not sanction or approve officially of his crossing the frontier in pursuit of the raiders as it would be contrary to the treaty with the bhutanese government would not inquire too closely into his movements 
but whether they liked it or not he intended to follow the abductors if necessary into the heart of bhutan treaty or no treaty his first step was to send for tashi and order him to prepare the disguise that he intended to use his rifle he left behind but armed himself with a brace of long-barreled automatic pistols to which their wooden holsters clipped on to form butts thus converting them into carbines accurate up to a range of a hundred and fifty or two hundred yards he found a third for tashi in colonel dermot's armory which was at his disposal night had fallen long before the detachment elephant that bore wargrave macdonald tashi and the forest guard as well as its own mahout reached the bungalow where the district superintendent of police awaited them the doctor found benson suffering from a wound in the head with concussion and fever frank interrogated the servants carefully and elicited from them one fresh fact about the outage that shed a flood of light on its motive and its author it was that the leader of the party was pock-marked and blind in the right eye and this at once confirmed frank's suspicion that the instigator of muriel's abduction was the chinese amban who parting threat to the girl had thus materialized at daybreak wargrave and tashi started on foot accompanied by a forest guard to put them on the track of the gang this led up towards the bhutan frontier which runs among the hills at an average elevation of six thousand feet above the sea as the assistant political officer anticipated the party had headed for the portion of the border under the control of the amban's friend the penop of tuna inquiries among the inhabitants of the mountain villages resulted in several of them coming forward with the information that they had seen a small body of armed chinese escorting a cloaked and shrouded figure on a mule and climbing up towards bhutan two of the government secret service agents among these butias had followed them cautiously to the frontier and seen them received there by a party of the tuna palopes armed retainers these men reported that the watch on all the passes into bhutan was stricter than ever and as one of them phrased it not even a rat could creep through unobserved this discouraging intelligence was further proof of amban's guilt but frank realized that it would not be sufficient to justify the government of india claiming redress from the republic of china and indeed diplomatic procedure was much too slow to be of any use in the rescue of the girl an appeal to the Maharajah of bhutan would be equally fruitless for his powerful vassal the tuna palope was practically in rebellion against him and defied his authority the sole hope of saving muriel lay in wargrave's prompt action yet try as the subaltern would he and tashi were unable at any point to pierce the cordon of guards along the frontier generally they got away unseen but on one occasion they were discovered and had to flee back into british territory under a shower of arrows fortunately firearms are scarce in bhutan and the tuna palope soldiers possessed only bows it was imperative that wargrave and his follower should be circumspect in their movements and by day they hid in caves or in the jungle clothing the slopes of the higher hills to escape observation by bhutanese spies when they had exhausted the food that they had brought with them 
and failed to procure any more from their secret service agents in the villages tashi gathered bananas dug up edible tubers like the charpedia or charlong and snared jungle fowl and mono peasants having obtained a bow and a sheaf of arrows from a village he sometimes succeeded in killing a goral the active little wild goat formed in the lower hills the flesh of which is excellent as day after day went by and found them no nearer success in crossing the frontier wargrave began to lose heart he was harassed by anxiety over muriel's fate and feared that he would never be able to rescue her at times he grew desperate and but for his companion's remonstrances would have tried to fight his way through the border guards although in his saner moments he knew that it would be sheer madness besides danger from human enemies the two men were menaced by peril from wild beasts as well panthers prowled among the hills great himalayan bears a blow from the paw of one of which would crack a man's skull wandered on the jungle-clad slopes and though not carnivorous were always ready to attack human beings herds of wild elephants which had scaled the mountains into bhutan at the beginning of the monsoon to reach the northern face of the himalayas and escape the heavy rains that deluge the southern slopes and also to avoid the insects that plague them in the jungle at that season were commencing to return to the terai often wargrave and tashi had to climb trees to let a herd go by and each time as they watched them the subaltern thought longingly of colonel dermot and badshaw if he had them to help how easily he could burst the barrier between him and the land that held the girl whom he loved and who needed him so late one afternoon as the two men were making their way through bamboo jungle at the foot of high cliffs close to a pass into Gutan, which they had not yet attempted they blundered into the middle of a herd of elephants feeding there was no tree in which they could take refuge and before they were able to make their escape they found themselves surrounded on every side a number of cow elephants which having young calves with them were very savage pressed threateningly towards the men who tried to force their way into the dense growths of the bamboos and so put a frail barrier between themselves and the menacing beasts they knew that their pistols would be useless and they had already given themselves up for lost when the huge animals which were apparently about to charge them suddenly stopped and drew aside to allow a monstrous bull elephant to pass through it was a single tusker and it advanced steadily towards the men frank stared at it incredulously could it be yes it was he was sure of it it was badshaw and the elephant knew him and came towards him in the sudden revulsion of feeling and his relief at knowing that they were safe frank almost lost his head a mad hope surged through him he stretched out his arms imploringly to the great beast and cried impulsively oh badshaw hum ko madad do help us to his amazement the animal seemed to understand it sank slowly to its knees and though inviting him to mount it sahib sahib he offers us his aid cried tashi excitedly and he scrambled up after wargrave who had climbed on to the broad shoulders the subaltern leaned forward and touching the huge forehead 
pointed in the direction of Bhutan. Badshaw turned and moved off towards the pass through the mountains, while the herd followed, and Frank thrilled with the hope that at last he was about to break through the barrier of foes between him and the girl he loved. End of chapter 13 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 14 of The Jungle Girl by Gordon Casserly This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Devil Dancers of Tuna flat-roofed arcaded buildings terraced one above the other with gaily painted walls from which covered wooden verandas and box-like lattice windows jutted out surrounded a paved courtyard its rough flagstones hidden by shifting many-coloured throngs of gorgeously vestimented priests mitred bishops hideous demons skeletons with grinning skulls and weird creatures with papier-mache heads of bears tigers dragons and even stranger beasts wild but not inharmonious music from shaven-head members of an orchestra of weird instruments gongs shawns cymbals long silver trumpets deafened the ears crowds of gaily clad spectators covered the flat roofs of the building and arcades thronged the verandas filled the windows and squatted around the courtyard these last kept in order by bullet-headed llamas with whips it was the annual ceremony of the devil dance of the great buddhist monastery of tuna one of the fantastic mystery plays the now almost meaningless functions into which the ideal faith preached by gautama the buddha the high-souled reformer has degenerated from all parts of bhutan west of the dividing line of the great black mountain range from tibet even from far distant ladakh the faithful had made pilgrimage to be present at the great festival in this most famous and sacred gompa of the land red lamas from western tibet and yellow from lhasa abbots and monks from little known monasteries lost among the rugged mountains nuns with close cropped hair from the covenants of thimbu pero and puaka robber chiefs of the hapa and graziers from sipchu townsfolk from the capital and peasants from the fever-laden himalayan valleys all had gathered there for all who attended the sacred festival could gain indulgences that would save them a century or two sojourn in the hot or cold hells of their religion in a gallery adorned with artistic wooden carvings and hung with brocaded silk and gold embroideries sat a fat bare-legged man with close-cropped hair and scanty beard wearing an ample red silk gown ornamented with chinese designs worked in gold thread he was the penlop of tuna the great feudal lord of the province whose high-walled jong or castle crowned the rocky hill on which the monastery and the town were built behind him stood his officers and attendants clad in silk or woolen kimono-like garments bound at the waist by gaily worked leather belts from which hung handsome swords with elaborately wrought silver hilts inlaid with coral and turquoises and with gold-washed silver scabbards the courtyard was gay with fluttering player flags the poles of which as well as the wooden pillars of the arcades 
were hung with the beautiful banners artistically worked with countless pieces of color silks and brocades and needlework pictures of buddhist gods and saints for which the monasteries of bhutan are justly famed from the blue sky the sun blazed on the riot of mingled hues of the decorations and the dresses of spectators and performers especially gorgeous were the robes of the high priests in the spectacle they strongly resembled catholic bishops in their gold embroidered mitres copes and vestments as carrying pastoral crooks or sprinkling holy water they moved around the courtyard in solemn procession behind acolytes carrying sacred banners swinging censers and intoning harmonious chants troops of baffled demons fled as their approach howling in diabolic despair shuddering wretches clad in scanty rags groping blindly as in the dark wailed miserably and utterly weird long-drawn whistling notes shrank aside from the fleeing devils and stretched out their hands in supplication to the saintly prelates they were intended to represent the spirits of dead men straying in the period of bardo the forty-nine days after death during which the soul released from the body is doomed to wander in search of its next incarnation in its journeyings it is assailed and terrified by demons who can only be defeated by the prayers of pious lamas to chenresi the great pitier the whole purpose of these representations is to familiarize during life the devout buddhists with the awful aspect of the many demons that will obstruct their souls after death and try to lead them astray when they are searching for the right path to the next world in which they are to begin a fresh existence on this strange bewildering spectacle an english girl looked down from a small balcony not twenty feet above the courtyard and the sight of her caused the attention of many of the spectators to wander from the mystery play the fat old penlop frequently looked across the quadrangle at her from his gallery and as often uttered some coarse jest about her to his grinning followers while he raised a chaste while he raised a chaste silver goblet filled with merwa the native liquor to his lips it was muriel benson for weeks she had been a prisoner in the lamissary cloistered in a suite of well-furnished rooms and waited on by a close-cropped nun she had been surprised in the bungalow and overpowered by three of the chinamen before she realized her danger or could seize a weapon with which to defend herself had she been able to snatch up a revolver she would have made a desperate fight for freedom but with fettered hands a helpless captive she had been carried away on a mule from the first she had recognized the pock-marked one-eyed leader of the gang as the amban's officer and so had known who was the author and cause of her abduction for days she had been borne along up the rough track over the mountains through narrow high-walled passes down deep valleys and across rushing torrents closely guarded but always treated with respect her captors used broken tibetan and butanese when they desired to communicate with her but they answered none of her questions she had dreaded reaching their destination where she expected to find one she hung awaiting her and once in fear of it she had tried to throw herself down a precipice along the brink of which the path ran 
after that she had been roped to a big powerful manchu on her arrival at the monastery she learned from her gargulous nun attendant that the amban had been summoned to pekin where a revolution had taken place and his friends there hoped to make him president which he regarded as a step towards the imperial throne the monks of the monastery were his faithful allies on account of his relationship to the powerful abbot of the yellow lama temple in the chinese capital they had agreed to guard his prisoner if his men succeeded in capturing her until he returned or sent for her at first the girl relieved of the dread of falling at once into his hands lived in the hope of a speedy rescue it was unfortunate she thought that colonel dermot with his extraordinary knowledge of an influence over the bhutanese had left india but even without him the power of the british empire would be set at once in motion to avenge this outrage on an englishwoman dermot's understudy the assistant political officer faithless lover though he was would do all he could to save her assuredly she would not have long to wait but as the days dragged by and she still remained a prisoner her heart sank she needed all her courage not to lose hope and give way to despair for she had always hanging over her the dread of wan shi hung's return but she had resolved to kill herself rather than fall into his hands for that purpose had bribed her cheery good nature attendant to procure a dagger for her she pretended that she wanted it as a protection in the lamissary for the door of her apartments was without a fastening even on the outside there was neither lock nor bolt for escape was considered impossible for her if she got out of the monastery she would be captured at once in the town she was not interfered with and saw no one but her nun once or twice she ventured to creep down to the great temple of the monastery drawn by curiosity and the sound of harmonious buddhist chants intoned by the lamic choir but for her anxiety about her father and her dread of the amban's return her worst trial would have been the monotony of her captivity were it not for the memory of wargrave and her unhappy love caused her many a sleepless night with nothing to occupy her mind she hailed the festival of the devil dance as a welcome distraction not even the impertinent curiosity of the spectators could drive her from her balcony she followed the many phases with interest although she could not understand the meaning of them for the performance was a curious mixture of religion and blasphemous mockery of horseplay and coarse humour as well as a strange impressiveness a comic interlude would follow the most solemn act troops of devils burlesque the sacred rites of the faith and bands of comic masks filled the arena at times and delighted the audience by playing practical jokes on the spectators and each other the solitary white woman attracted their clownish humor and they danced in front of her balcony shouting out rude witticisms that caused much amusement to the lookers-on fortunately the girl's command of the language fairly good though it was was insufficient to enable her to understand their coarse jests but their intention to insult her became obvious the leaping howling mob of strangely apparelled performers threatened to storm her balcony 
some climbed on each other's shoulders to get nearer her others even began to swarm up the pillars supporting her balcony to the delight of the audience the noisy mob eventually clambered up to the railing of the balcony and jesting laughing uttering wild cries perched on it and shouted and jeered at her her face flaming the girl drew back and was about to retire into her room when suddenly she stopped rigid with surprise for above the shouts of the maskers the roars of the spectators and the din of the clashing cymbals and braying trumpets she heard her name spoken distinctly incredulous she stood rooted to the ground and stared at the yelling clowns perched on the railing the uproar redoubled but again she distinguished one word above all muriel a wild hope flashed into her heart pretending to be amused at the antics of the performers she advanced laughingly towards them they gesticulated and shouted more furiously than ever but in the medley of strange sounds she distinctly heard the words it's i frank don't be afraid they seemed to come from the paper mache head of a grotesque serpent worn by a man who was foremost among her tormentors and wildest in his frenzied gestures smiling the girl stood her ground even when some of the maskers encouraged by her attitude climbed down from the rail and surrounded her dancing hallooing leaping the snake-headed one was the wildest in his antics and shrieked and shouted loudest of them all but mixed up with the incoherent cries and sounds she caught the words are you guarded a wild yell followed can you get out then he yelled like a mad jackal with wildly beating heart the girl pretended to repulse the advances of the maskers good-humouredly and spoke to all in english telling them to leave her balcony and cease to molest her but with her laughing remonstrances she mingled the words i am not guarded i can leave my room i will go down to the temple and wait behind the statue of buddha then the serpent-headed one aided by another with dragon mask both uttering fiendish yells pushed his companions back to the railing just as the penlope spoke to one of his officials who shouted across to them an angry command to leave the white woman alone the scared maskers tumbled over each other in their hurry to quit the balcony thrilled with the light the girl watched them go and then when the entry of a fresh body of murmurs into the courtyard distracted the attention of the spectators from her she withdrew quietly to her room she was alone the nun having gone long ago to witness the devil dance from among the crowd muriel opened the door leading to a broad stone staircase and peered cautiously out there was no one to be seen all the inhabitants of the monastery were gathered in the courtyard she stole carefully down to a side door of the lamasary chapel this temple was a large and lofty building richly ornamented with fine wood carvings rich brocades and elaborately embroidered banners and hangings the pillars supporting the roof were covered with copper plates beaten into beautiful patterns and the altars were of silver the chief one as in all butanes chapels being adorned by a splendid pair of elephants tusks idols abounded there was a central seated figure of buddha thirty feet high heavily gilt and studded with turquoises and precious stones with a canopy and background of golden lotus leaves on either side were attendant female figures and images of buddhist gods 
larger than life size stood in double rows muriel concealed herself behind the colossal statue of buddha and had not long to wait before from her hiding place she saw two maskers the snake and the dragon enter the temple cautiously the latter remained on guard at the door while his companion who carried a bundle advanced furtively towards the great idol as he drew near he opened the jaws of the mask and said in a low tone muriel muriel are you here at the sound of the well-remembered voice the girl trembled violently her heart beat quickly as she came out from behind the statue when he beheld her the masker lifted the snake's head off and muriel saw that the face revealed disguised and stained a dull yellow was that of her lover at the sight of it she forgot the painful past forgot her grievance against him forgot the other woman the sorrow that he had caused her and he sprang towards her with outstretched arms she cried oh thank god you've come dear frank caught her in his eager embrace then under the image of the great dreamer who taught that love is illusion that affection is error that desire but binds closer to the revolving wheel they kissed fondly passionately like two faithful lovers met again after a lifetime of parting and the grotesque devil gods around glared fiercely at them but the lord buddha looked mildly down on his sculptured face the ineffable calm of nirvana the peace of freedom from all desire attained at last but heedless of gods or devils the man strained the woman to his heart and rained kisses on her lips her eyes her hair there was little time for dalliance danger encompassed them wargrave produced from the bundle that he carried a mask and a costume with a pair of high felt-soled boots which effectively disguised muriel then they joined tashi and the three passed out into the vestibule only just in time for here they found a group of lamas and peasants from a distant part of the country stopping for a moment to look at the great pictured cycle of existence painted on the wall before they entered the temple the vestibule opened on to a courtyard lined with the cells of the monks of the monastery and as this led to the great quadrangle in which the miracle play was being performed a stream of mummers lamas and laymen was passing through it mostly going to the spectacle though a few were coming away from it with muriel clinging closely to him wargrave followed tashi as he pushed his way through the crowd exchanging jokes and careless banter as he went the rabbit warren of steep lanes flights of steps and bridges over ravines through the town built on the precipitous slopes of the hill was almost deserted for most of the inhabitants had flocked to the devil dance so unmolested and unnoticed they reached the caravan sarai in which the two men had lodged for several days before the festival here they hurriedly changed their costumes when they emerged from it muriel her hair cropped almost to the scalp and her face stained a yellowish tint was garbed as a boy novice of the lamasary in the priestly dress with a great rosary round her neck in one hand she held a begging bowl while with the other she guided the feeble steps of the aged lama whose disciple she was supposed to be behind them limped a lame lay brother of their monastery 
in this disguise the fugitives met with no hindrance as they quitted the town for the open country heading towards the south only when well clear of the houses did frank and muriel venture to converse in their own language wargrave narrated all that had happened to him since they had parted any one watching them beyond earshot would have wondered at the joy that shone in the face of the young chela disciple clasping the hand of the old priest and gazing affectionately at him as they went along for frank was telling the girl of violet's letter which had set him free he described many fruitless attempts to cross the frontier his fortunate meeting with badshaw and the marvellous way in which the wonderful animal had helped him safely inside bhutan he and tashi had parted with the elephants in which appeared to be the same forest as the one in which colonel dermot and they had left the herd on their previous entry into the country frank had tried to imitate his chief in ordering badshaw to meet him there again but he was very doubtful of the result they had not found it difficult to follow the trail left by muriel's abductors for once inside the border the chinamen had not tried to hide themselves at every village along the rough road tashi had learned of their passing with their captive so the two had followed them without difficulty to tuna where they soon discovered where the girl was imprisoned the festival had offered them an unhoped-for opportunity of reaching her tashi once a star performer in similar devil dances in his own monastery procured costumes and taught his companion what to do as the number of those taking part in the performances ran to hundreds it was easy to slip in unobserved among them then muriel told of her adventures but far more interesting to both than the details of these mere happenings each revealed to the other the longings the love the hopes and fears that had filled his and her heart during the unhappy period of their estrangement now began a wonderful odyssey that but for the dread of pursuit and capture would have seemed a journey in fairyland to the reunited lovers indeed as they travelled on day after day and danger seemed left behind they forgot everything in the joy of being together once more their vows exchanged their faith pledged the future a long vista of golden days of delight it was well that tashi was with them to be on the watch for the lovers walked with their heads in the clouds and certainly theirs was an interesting pilgrimage bhutan is perhaps the least known country in asia the last that has kept its cherished seclusion since anglo-indian troops burst the barrier of tibet and flaunted the union jack in the streets of the fabled city of lhasa but bhutan is still a secret a mysterious land only a few british envoys from bogle in the latter half of the eighteenth century to claude white and bell in the beginning of this and their companions had intruded on its privacy before colonel dermot so that for the lovers it had all the fascination of the unknown sometimes among the ice-clad peaks of the giant ranges of the himalayas they crossed snowy passes fourteen thousand feet above the sea and did not neglect to throw a stone upon the oboes the cairns that pious and superstitious travellers erect to propitiate the spirits of the passes sometimes a path led under beautiful cliffs of pure white crystalline limestone that in the brilliant sunlight shone like the finest marble 
often they journey through a lovely land of gently sloping hills of grassy uplands of deep valleys giving delightful vistas of snow-clad mountains far away they walk through pine woods through forests of maple silver fir and larch and miles of huge bushes of flowering rhododendrons they toiled up a rough and stony track over bare and desolate land that was an old moraine and under moraine terraces one above another forming giant spurs of the rugged hills there were dark and fearsome ravines so deep that they could scarcely hear the roar of the foaming torrents rushing among the great boulders below as they crossed on swaying suspension bridges of iron chains these had been built hundreds of years before by long-forgotten chinese engineers three chains on one level supported the bamboo or plank footway while one on either side served as a handrail and a bamboo or grass lattice work between them and the road bears hid from sight the deep gorge below often these bridges were only of ropes of twisted withes or grass and swung and swayed in terrifying fashion with the motion of the traveller there were broad rivers over the eddying swirling waters of which strong cantilever bridges of stout wooden beams were pushed out from the steep banks truly a beautiful land bhutan at its loveliest perhaps in spring when the hills and upland meadows where the yaks graze ten thousand feet above the sea blaze with the mingled colors of anemones blue and white of yellow pansies and mauve and white irises of large and white roses and small yellow ones of giant yellow primulas with six tiers of flowers when the oaks and the chestnuts are clothed in young green and the apricot pear and orange trees are in bloom where large and lovely blossoms cover that little known tree that the butanese call chap when the bright green of the young grass runs up to the white snowfields the woods are full of a pretty ground orchid beautiful trailing blossoms of others droop from the boughs of the great trees and on the magnesium limestone hills one of the rarest orchids grows in profusion but to the two pilgrims of love the land seemed beautiful even now that the winter was not far distant in the silent woods hidden from prying eyes they sat hand in hand and whispered to each other over and over again the oldest sweetest story that the earth has known strange to hear words of love from the lips of such a weird-looking couple yet muriel in her quaint disguise with her silky hair cropped to the scalp was as beautiful in her lover's eyes as when he had seen her in her prettiest frocks and she thought the yellow-skinned wrinkled old lama indefinitely more attractive than the gay young subaltern of rangadwar for he was her own now such is lover's glamour muriel had forgiven royally bhutan is a buddhist ruled land therefore slaying for sport and fishing in the rivers is prohibited nay more the maharajah sometimes forbids the killing of even domestic animals for food so wildlife abounds the fugitives often saw flocks of burhel called now in bhutan feeding on the precipitous slopes of the higher hills once frank and muriel excitedly watched a snow leopard stalking one of these big horned sheep sixteen thousand feet above the sea level 
and in these heights they even saw an occasional lynx or wolf generally only to be found in the highest elevations bordering on tibet silver-haired langur apes the white fringes around their black faces giving them a comic resemblance to aged negroes awoke the echoes of the mountains with their deep booming cry while in the lower valleys little brown monkeys mopped and mowed from the trees at the fugitives as they passed on one occasion muriel exhilarated by the keen life-giving air ran gaily on ahead of the others in a wood and came on a tiger enjoying its midday siesta but the striped butte only uttered a startled woo woo like a big dog and dashed away through the undergrowth another time they disturbed a red bear feeding on the carcass of a strange beast that seemed a mixture of goat donkey and deer tashi called it a saro and at a lower elevation they blundered on two black bears not flesh eaters these yet more dangerous grubbing for roots and on another occasion saw one climbing a tree in search of wild bees nests in a dense jungle early one morning a beautiful black panther with a skin like watered silk glided stealthily by them showing its white fangs and red mouth in an angry snarl as it went and deep down in a valley they espied a rhinoceros feeding a thousand feet below them but they came across no elephants and frank noted the fact despairingly as rendering even less probable a meeting with badshaw and his herd bird life abounded from the snow partridges that flew in the hills eighteen thousand feet high to pigeons of every kind birds of all sizes from great eagles to the little quails that hid in the cornfields lamingers that were fed on human bodies the dead of families of high degree exposed on a flat rock of slate with head and shoulders tied to a wooden axle that stretched the corpse like a rack in bhutan ordinary folk are cremated on their journey the fugitives met with wayfarers of every rank and class on a steep mountain track they stood aside to let a high official go by he was sitting pick a back in a cloth on a powerfully built servant the ends of the cloth knotted on the man's forehead behind trudged an escort of bare-legged swordsmen with leather shields and shining steel helmets coolies male and female followed carrying the great man's baggage in baskets placed in the crutch of forked sticks tied on their backs sometimes they passed a rival lama glaring with jealous eye at them often they met groups of ryats sturdy peasants thick-limbed barefooted bareheaded the women clear-eyed deep-bosomed but uglier than the males these did reverence to the holy men and put their modest offerings of copper coins or food into muriel's begging bowl another time it was a family group at food eating by the wayside the group consisted of a stout ruddy-faced woman with close-cropped hair hung with many necklaces of coral and turquoise and waited on by her three meek and submissive husbands all brothers for this is a land of polyandry she invited the fugitives to share their meal and bade her dutiful spouses serve the supposed lamas they proffered cooked rice colored with saffron and other food in the excellent Bhutanese baskets woven with very finely split cane these are made in two circular parts with rounded top and bottom pieces 
fitting so well that water can actually be carried in them from sealed wicker covered bamboos the hosts filled chungas bamboo mugs with merwa the beer of the country and chang the native spirit frank and muriel refused the liquor but tashi drank their share as well as his to give the pious peasants an opportunity of acquiring merit and wife and husbands thought themselves amply rewarded by a muttered blessing a very different figure was that of a man lame of the right leg and limping painfully down a steep hill in front of the fugitives muriel full of pity whispered to her lover after they had passed him oh the poor wretch did you see dear he had lost the right hand as well but she shuddered when she learned that the cripple was a murderer punished by the severing of the tendons of the leg and the loss of the hand that struck the fatal blow in the cultivated valleys where barley buckwheat and mustard grew there were everywhere evidences of the religious feeling of the western butanees every hill was crowned with a gompa or chapel chortons and praying wheels stood beside the road and mendongs or praying walls a mile long their stones engraved with sacred words were built near habitations in the villages the disguised fugitives were well treated food and lodging were offered them freely in the cabins as in the great houses of officials and rich folks where they spent hours watching the skilled artisans among the feudal retainers of their hosts weaving silk making woolen and cotton garments brocade and embroideries or hammering artistic designs on silver or copper plates backed with lac none suspected the three of being other than they seemed the buddhism of bhutan and tibet to-day has but one article of faith acquire merit by feeding and paying the lamas and they will win salvation for you so rich and poor vied in giving their best to the holy wayfarers and sought not to intrude on the meditations or privacy of lama and chila and welcomed the cheery company of the more worldly lay brother who could crack a joke or empty a mug with any man and pitch the stone quoits or shoot an arrow in the archery contest better than the village champion thus contentedly and free from care the three fugitives wandered on towards the south where on the frontier they expected their troubles to begin one day when passing a hamlet by the roadside they tarried to look on at a wedding at which a buxom country maid was being married to a family of six brothers the village headman performed the simple ceremony which consisted of offering a bowl of murwa to the gods then presenting a cupful to the bride and eldest bridegroom blessing them and expressing a hope that the union might be a fruitful one the rest after the usual presents had been given to the bride's relatives was simply a matter of feasting every one the stranger lamas were invited to join but frank refused and dragged away the convivial tashi who was anxious to accept the invitation wargrave with difficulty led him aside and was so occupied in arguing with his discontented guide that he did not notice that muriel had not followed a sudden cry from her and his name shrieked out wildly made him turn in alarm to his horror he saw the girl struggling in the grasp of a chinaman while another on a mule and holding the bridle of a second animal was calling on the villagers in the penlop's name to assist his comrade End of chapter 
fourteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter number fifteen of the jungle girl by gordon casserly this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c a strange rescue neither muriel absorbed in watching the wedding nor the two men engrossed in their dispute had noticed the chinese come riding along the road and pulling up when they saw the peasants gathered together one of them had been about to question the villagers from his saddle when his eyes fell on the disguised girl standing apart from the crowd he stared at her for a few moments then he spoke hurriedly to his companions and springing from the mule's back seized muriel in a rough grasp at her cry frank ran back forgetting his disguise he recognized in her assailant the pock-marked officer of the amban the man seeing him coming drew a revolver but wargrave whipped out his pistol quicker and without hesitation shot him through the heart the chinaman collapsed to the ground and in his fall dragged the girl down his comrade fired at his slayer and missing him wheeled his mule around and galloped off tashi returned the shot while frank ran to muriel he fired several times and the rider was apparently hit for he fell forward on the neck of his animal but he recovered himself and crouching low was still in the saddle when a turn in the road hid him from sight the startled villager scattered and fled in terror at the tragedy suddenly enacted in their midst the six cowardly husbands deserting their new-made wife and leaving her to follow as they ran away which she did at her utmost speed frank freed muriel from the stiffened grasp of the dead man and helped her to her feet then the three hurried from the fatal spot so lately filled by a cheerful crowd of merrymakers and now tenanted only by the corpse that lay with sightless eyes staring up at the blue sky they made for the shelter of jungle-clad hills that rose a couple of miles away from now onwards for two or three weeks the fugitives led the lives of hunted rats they traveled generally only by night avoiding villages and farms and keeping away from the road as much as possible they were in the southern zone of bhutan lying nearest the indian frontier a region of precipitous hills ten or twelve thousand feet high their sides clothed with dense vegetation of deep fever-laden valleys of awe-inspiring gorges of rivers liable to sudden floods and rising in a few hours thirty or forty feet tashi in various disguises occasionally visited villages in search of food and information while the lovers awaited his return in some hidden spot frank holding the anxious girl in his arms and trying to calm her fears in one excursion the ex lama got the first definitive news of the pursuit he learnt that the amban had returned unexpectedly to tuna the plot in his favour in pekin having failed he was not satisfied by the tales told by the monks of the lamasery to account for muriel's mysterious disappearance which was that she had been carried off by the devils he insisted on a search being made for her along the road to the indian border and sent his own chinese guards to direct the pursuit the companion of the pock-marked man had got back to tuna and told of their recognition of her young she hung 
furious at the death of his officer but overjoyed at the discovery of the girl set out at once with his personal followers and a body of the penops soldiers to take up the chase the fugitives hotly pursued had several hairbreadth escapes once they almost blundered into a bivouac of their enemies at night they succeeded at last in reaching the great forest in which wargrave and the ex lama had parted from the elephants the forest which ran along the foot and clothed the northern slopes of the second last range of mountains between them and the frontier but alas there was no trace of badshaw's herd yet this was not surprising for they found themselves in a part unknown to them through this vast jungle they travelled by day until one evening they reached a deep gorge that pierced the range and seemed to promise a passage through the mountains they camped for the night by its mouth intending to enter it at sunrise dawn found them breaking their fast on a scanty meal of dried mutton and bananas suddenly tashi stopped eating and held up a warning hand his companions drew their pistols frank having given his second weapon to muriel presently they heard the faint sounds of an animal's approach on their track just as they had risen silently to their feet three gigantic dogs appeared scenting their trail they were tibetan mastiffs such as are to be chained in the courtyards of lamasseries at sight of them the huge brutes stopped crouched for an instant showing their fangs in a fierce snarl and then rushed at them without hesitation the three fired one of the dogs dropped dead but the others the wounded came on one bounded at muriel frank threw himself in front of her firing rapidly at it several bullets struck it but the savage brute sprang at his throat he grappled with it striving by main strength to hold it off muriel rushed to his aid and putting her pistol to the mastiff's head shot it dead tashi meantime had killed the third knowing that their pursuers must be close behind the dogs they fled into the gorge on either hand stupendous cliffs towered up two thousand feet above them scarcely a hundred yards apart seeming to meet overhead and shut off the sky here and there the giant walls were split from top to bottom in slits opening off the main passage as the fugitives ran on the gorge narrowed until it was scarcely fifty yards wide and they began to fear that it might prove only a cul-de-sac in which they would be hopelessly trapped they heard cries behind them strangely echoed by the rocky walls breathless panting their tired limbs giving way under them they staggered blindly on the pass turned sharply to the right as they approached the bend they became aware of a dull rumbling and the ground which suddenly began to slope steeply down shook violently under their feet wondering what new danger what fresh horror awaited them they stumbled on turned the corner and stopped short in dismayed despair from side to side the gorge was filled with a tumultuous racing flood of foam-flecked water a rushing river that poured out of a natural tunnel in the steeply sloping rocky bottom of the pass as from a sluice it surged against the precipitous cliffs leaping up against the walls that hemmed it in sweeping in mad onset of white-topped waves and eddying whirlpools flinging spray high in air the stoutest swimmer would be tossed about hopelessly in it rolled over and over choked suffocated sucked under the life beaten out of him 
for one wild moment frank thought of seizing muriel in his arms and springing into the raging flood but the sheer hopelessness of escape that way checked him it was certain death better to turn and face their pursuers there was more chance of life in battling with a score or two of butanese swordsmen than with the tumbling tossing waters so pistol in hand the three retraced their steps looking everywhere for a suitable spot to make a stand but on either hand the cliffs rose sheer their faces seemed here and there with cracks but with never a crevice big enough to shelter them they passed the bend and a few hundred yards beyond it some large rocks fallen from the cliff on one side lay close against its base frank resolved to take their stand here it was the only cover visible they fitted the holster stocks to their pistols converting them into carbines which could be fired from the shoulder enabling them to aim more accurately at a longer range then while tashi crept cautiously along the pass to scout the subaltern and the girl examined the position for defence thus occupied they were startled by shots ringing out echoing down the vast canyon taking cover they saw their companion running back followed by a body of men a few mounted the majority on foot some had firearms others bows the rest swords wargrave and muriel opened on the pursuers with their automatic weapons and checked them tashi was about a hundred yards from shelter when a shot struck him he stumbled and fell while a howl of delight rose from his foes as he tried to struggle up bullets kicked up the dust round him and several arrows dropped near muriel lose off as many cartridges as you can to cover me said wargrave laying his pistol beside her before the girl realized his meaning he had sprung out from the rocks and was running towards tashi for a moment the pursuers were puzzled by his action and then fired their rifles and matchlocks and shot arrows at him but unscathed he reached the wounded man who had been so faithful a comrade to him raising him on his back he staggered towards the rocks while muriel pumped lead at the enemy and succeeded in keeping down their fire somewhat as wargrave laid the ex lama on the ground in shelter tashi seized his hand and touched it with his lips and forehead in silent gratitude frank hurriedly examined and bandaged the wound made by a large caliber bullet which had passed through the leg below the knee lacerating the muscles but not injuring the bone then he took up his post again while tashi dragged himself up behind a rock and opened fire on their foes these were for the most part Bhutanese, but there were several chinese among them look look frank there's the amban cried muriel excitedly pointing to a man who rode into sight along the pass on a white mule she fired at him the bullet missed him but apparently went unpleasantly close for yun shi hung galloped back into shelter behind a projecting buttress of the cliffs the attackers numbered sixty or eighty they were apparently staggered by the rapid fire poured into them which killed or wounded several of them some tried to find shelter by huddling against the side of the pass and others flung themselves on the ground behind boulders but the leaders urged them on there could be little doubt as to the issue of the fight the bullets from the chinamen's rifles and the bhutanese matchlocks spattered the rocks or the face of the cliff but the archers began to shoot almost vertically into the air from their strong bamboo bows and several iron-tipped 
four feathered arrows dropped behind the cover one missing wargrave by a hand's breadth fearing for muriel he tried to shield her with his body what's the use dearest she said if you are killed i don't want to live indeed we must both die now i shall not be taken alive kiss me and tell me once more that you love me he held her to his heart in a passionate embrace and kissed her fondly they are coming now sahib said tashi and i have only a few cartridges left the lovers paid no heed good-bye my dear dear love whispered muriel i'm happier dying with you than living without you frank kissed her solemnly now for the last time then they turned to face the enemy the swordsmen were massing for a charge crouching low they held their shields before them and waved their long bladed daws above their head uttering fierce yells suddenly the amban and other mounted men who had been sheltering out of sight dashed into view and rode madly into the rear ranks knocking down and trampling on any one in their way the men on foot looked behind and broke into a run coming on in a disordered mob but it was not a charge it was more like a panic for with wild cries of frantic terror they fled past the defenders who fearing a trick fired their last cartridges into them dropping several some of whom tried to rise and drag themselves on in dread of something terrible behind then into sight came a vast herd of wild elephants filling the gorge from cliff to cliff and moving at a slow trot a huge bull led them lines of other tuskers behind them crowds of females and calves bringing up the rear the onset of the mass of great monsters was terrifying it was appalling irresistible muriel cried out it's badshaw frank it's badshaw look at the leader don't you see tashi stared at the oncoming herd then he quietly unfixed his pistol and put it away in the holster we are saved sahib he said with the calm fatalism of the east the god of the elephants has sent them and he limped out from behind the rocks the two europeans followed him their foes had disappeared all but the dead and wounded badshaw for it was he swerved out of his course and came to them while the herd went on opening out to pass him as he sank to his knees before the humans tashi despite his wound climbed up to his neck while wargrave mounted behind him and muriel took her seat on the broad back clinging to her lover then the tusker rose and moved swiftly after the herd as he rounded the bend a strange sight met the eyes of those he carried their enemies were huddled together in terror near the brink of the tunnel from which the surging water rushed out some endeavored to pluck up courage to throw themselves into the river while the majority had turned to face the elephants but they were paralyzed with fright a few tried to discharge their firearms or loose their arrows with trembling hands as the elephants quickening their pace rushed on in an irresistible mass some of the men crazed with fright ran to meet them others flung themselves to the ground where they were but over both the great monsters passed treading them to pulp under their ponderous feet the animals of the mounted men as terrified as their riders swung about and sprang headlong into the river many of the men on foot did the same 
the heads of animals and men appeared and disappeared bobbing up and down then their bodies were rolled over and over tossed up on the waves and sucked under one by one they disappeared a few of the panic-stricken mob had tried to climb the precipitous cliffs in vain one however getting his hands into a narrow slanting crack dragged himself up a few feet it was the amban frank drew his pistol but muriel clung to his arm and cried oh spare the poor wretch tashi had no scruples but his magazine was empty and he searched in vain for a cartridge but yan shi hung's time had come badshaw's trunk shot out and caught the climber's ankle the chinaman was plucked from the face of the cliff and hurled to the ground a frenzied shriek burst from him as the tusk was driven into the shuddering body which in an instant was trodden to a bloody pulp muriel hid her face against her lover but the agony of the wretch's dying yell rang in her ears not one of their enemies was left alive then the elephants one by one slid and slithered down into the rushing water which was very little below the brink the mothers supported the youngest calves with their trunks the less immature climbing on to their backs tashi checked badshaw as he was about to follow the herd into the river and lame as he was slid down to the ground he searched the crushed and mangled corpses of his fellow countrymen and collected their girdles until he had enough to knot and plait into two ropes one to go about badshaw's neck the other around the great body more girdles sufficed to join these together and supply cords by which the men and the woman on his back could tie themselves on to the ropes and to each other securely when this was done badshaw slid into the river as elephants do he sank in the water until only the upper part of his head and the tip of his upright trunk were above it without the precaution that tashi had taken his riders would have been instantly swept away only elephants could have battled successfully with that raging torrent the upflung spray and leaping waves hid the herd from the fugitives as they clung desperately to the ropes and to each other eighteen months had gone by in the garden of the political agent's bungalow in ranga dwar colonel dermot completely restored to health and his wife stood with his assistant major hunt and macdonald they were watching mrs wargrave who with brian and eileen clinging to her was holding out her two months old baby to a great elephant with a single tusk the animal raised its trunk as though in salute then lowering it gently touched with its sensitive tip the laughing infant whose tiny hand instinctively clutched it and held it fast with a smile muriel turned her head and looked at her husband badshaw has accepted him your son is free of the herd said colonel dermot end of chapter fifteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c end of the jungle girl by gordon casserly